here. Here. started broadcasting the web on YouTube. Here. Commissioner Mondor here. Commissioner O'Neill. Corey Lane here. Bates. Welcome again, everyone. This is the briefing session for the Planning Commission. are heard as a preliminary public presentation. Questions from the Commission. Public testimony is not taken on these applications. Um, a reminder to our presenters, please clearly describe which slide you are presenting to in order to assist those who are participating via audio. So today for briefing, we have, uh, let me just make sure here, we have four items up for briefing. I'll read through all four. Uh, item A is DCP ZDR 2021-02021, address 429 4th Avenue. Item B is DCP ZDR 2021-13554, address 3420 5th Avenue. Item C is DCP MPZC 2021-00368, Banksville Road. And item D is DCP MPZC 2019-00470, Institutional Master Plan and Zone Change Petition for Duquesne University. We begin today with item A, DCP ZDR 2021-02021, address 429 4th Avenue, Mr. Gregory. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> this is an application for uh, 429 4th Avenue in the downtown neighborhood. The scope of work is just to replace uh, second floor windows. Um, this project is before the Planning Commission's project development plan as the total cost of those exterior renovations exceed $50,000, which requires Planning Commission review and approval in the Golden Triangle. Uh, the applicants held a development activities meeting or DAM with the Downtown Neighborhoods Registered Community Organization, the Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership, or PDP, on April 8, 2021. A copy of that DAM staff report is attached to your to the staff report. Um, there were no requests for the zoning board of adjustment, no environmental reviews, and uh, the project was reviewed by design staff, and there are no outstanding concerns. So that's all, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to uh, Jeff Davis uh, to walk us through the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, he, as was Will described, I've already disappeared for a while. I assume he described the project. Uh, so the, the work of this project is replacement of existing aluminum windows for a single floor, which is the second floor of the Law and Finance Building uh, with new and fixed uh, single hung thermally broken aluminum windows. Uh, and these new windows are intended to as closely as possible match the proportions and finish color of the existing windows. I will note that they are not the uh, original windows that were uh, installed in the building when it was constructed uh, over a century ago, or pretty much about a century ago. Uh, next slide, please. Just for orientation purposes, the, the, the Law and Finance Building uh, is located at the corner of Fourth Avenue and Cherry Way, which is between Grant and Smithfield, uh, directly across the street, uh, Fourth Avenue from Oxford Center. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the building. Uh, it's in the center. It does have the the second floor highlighted in that in that photograph, and you can see Fourth Avenue between the Law and Finance Building and Oxford Center. City County Building is up uh, at the top of the page. Uh, and Grant Street is there as well. Next slide. So these next, uh, I think there's probably four slides that essentially show the elevation of the second floor of the building from all four sides of the building or three sides of the building. The fourth side is adjacent to the parking lot on Grant Street and there are no windows at that location. Uh, so here's the Fourth Avenue elevation showing the windows that are bracketed in red that are being replaced. Next slide. Is the, is the corner of Fourth and Cherry Way. Uh, the purpose for a replacement of these windows is that a new tenant is moving in. Uh, the existing windows are a bit drafty and because of the proximity to the street level, uh, there's quite a bit of dirt and dust coming in. So uh, Law and Finance LP uh, is replacing the windows to get a little bit better performance from an energy perspective and keep, uh, keep the dust and, and noise out of the space. Next slide, please. 
And this now shows Cherry Way. Sorry for the distortion, but we had to fit it in. It's a narrow street. One more slide shows Cherry Way and uh, Lemon Way, which is the, the, the alley paper street uh, on the uh, north side of the building. I believe there should, there may be one more slide after that. Which shows the entire Lemon Way elevation. And then the last slide is looking from the other side, and that is uh, that shows Lemon Way, and obviously adjacent to the parking lot. There is there are no windows at that location because it's on the property line. Uh, the next two slides, if we can jump to the next one, uh, is an elevation. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that. The the development activities meeting was held on April eighth. Uh, uh, Law and Finance was present. Frank Ewing was there. I was there. Also, Yoko Palmisiano from from our office. Uh, we did present the same uh, images that we're showing you today. Uh, there were no questions or comments raised during the presentation, uh, so that process was completed uh, about a month ago. Next slide shows an elevation of the window. Uh, this is the from the fabrication drawings for the windows. Uh, essentially showing the the, uh, the the window frame construction. Uh, again, it's as closely matching the existing windows uh, as can be uh, achieved with the product that we're installing and they're fairly identical. And again, the finish is a dark bronze, which is also the same. The next slide is just some for, uh, product information on the Quaker windows. Uh, there are both fixed windows and operable windows uh, that are single hung windows on the sides, uh, but a majority of the windows are actually just fixed. Uh, so there's some product information on those windows. Um, that's uh, that's the presentation. If there are any questions, uh, Frank Ewing is also here. will be willing to answer them as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. At this time, we take no public testimony. Uh, are there questions or comments from the commission? Oh, okay, hearing none. Uh, sounds good. And we will see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, that takes us to item B, which is DCP ZDR 2020-13554, address 3425th Avenue, Mr. Kunek. Hello, good afternoon, commissioners. This is application number DCP ZDR 2020-13554 for exterior renovations, roof replacement, and off-street surface parking um, resurfacing. Uh, a new exterior concrete ramp and railing, which is not viewable from the public realm, is also included in project scope. Uh, this project is located in the Oakland public realm, subdistrict C, 5th, and Forbes zoning district, and includes um, exterior alterations above $50,000, is why it's before the Planning Commission. Um, a, de a development activities meeting was held with the Oakland Planning and Development Corporation on February 23rd, 2021. A copy of the DAM report is attached to the briefing report. Uh, design staff reviewed the project and did not uh, recommend the project for CDAP review. A copy of the design review summary is attached to the briefing report. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to the applicants for um, a sound check. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I was expecting my colleague, Bill Simchuk, to be here. And he was uh, slated to actually do the presentation. So in his absence, uh, I'll take the initiative. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we do have a bill in the attendees um, list, listed as bill. I'm not sure if that is... Um, the that same may, as the applicant may, or not. I believe that is, I'm not mistaken. And if it would be possible to. Okay, yeah. I'm here, I'm, I'm here. It was, a, I don't, it must've been something going on with my thing. I could hear, but I couldn't couldn't see and I wasn't being visible. Uh, the, the project is, uh, we're working, uh, we're with MCF Architects and working with UPMC to, to do the exterior renovations, roof replacement, and upgrades of the elevator. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, it's sort of <clears throat> the 
the overall uh, project is the, the we'll, we'll be renovating the ex exterior facade. There's a stone facade, there's brick, and there's some ethos that needs to be repaired and, re and just uh, recoded. Uh, we'll be replacing the entire roof on both buildings. And in relation to that, there's, there's mechanical units up there that are gonna stay in, in uh, place, but they will be upgrading them and adding some UV filters and some, uh, some higher grade uh, heap of filters on the, on the units themselves. But the overall uh, units will be just like they are. Uh, on the plaza, we'll be doing, there's some drainage issues on the plaza that we'll be correct, create or you know, correcting. And also on the parking lot, we're redoing the parking lot to, to make it function a little better so that the circulation of the cars is a little uh, clearer and easier to, to maneuver within, within the small parking lot that's on the side of the building. And in both buildings, we'll be doing the elevator upgrades. The only change to the exterior is on the four-story children's uh, office building we're, we'll be creating a small elevator equipment room right beside the elevator tower itself, just on the, the lower level itself. So it won't be visible from, from the Fifth Avenue side at all and really barely visible from the, from the Euler, Euler Way side. Uh, this will allow the elevator to, to uh, downtime to be a little bit min, minimal in the, the Elevator change in the in the uh, the two story medical office building. Both floors are accessible from grade, so so the the shutdown time over on that elevator isn't as critical. You want to go to the next slide? Uh, this is just an overall view of the existing conditions that shows the the roofing, the plaza, and the parking lot side and where the existing entry is into the uh, facility on Mueller Way. If you want to go to the next slide. And these are, these are uh, views from Mueller Way side that shows the entrance. If you look at on, on the slide on the right, the 3420, that's the main entrance into the facility that the patients use typically. And it shows the condition back there of the, uh, the existing conditions. You want to go to the next slide? Uh, this, this is the overall site plan that shows the two buildings, the, the, re, the redoing of the parking lot. We've included the, the uh, parking and the, the uh, count and the, the code thing. So we're all, we should be okay there. And if you, if you look, we shifted the entrance into the parking lot to the left just a bit to allow for the, the cars to circulate within the parking lot better. And it puts some handicap, additional handicap spaces closer to the building. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide. <clears throat> These are the existing elevations as the building sits now. The, uh, the north elevation, which is the Fifth Avenue elevation, is shows the uh, the masonry, the stone facade of the medical building and the brick facade of the uh, children's uh, office building. Uh, generally, these, these elevations are the condition of the, the elevation isn't, isn't as bad. The stone will be repointing in entirety. And on the, uh, the three-story brick, there's some repointing that needs to be done. But basically, that, this facade is in pretty, pretty good shape and we'll be just doing some brick pointing and cleaning of the facade. On the east elevation and the south elevation is where the most of the work will be required. There'll be some, uh, the EFIS on the, on the, uh, the, two, the two sides of the, of the uh, Children's Hospital office building, that's the four story section. The EFIS is in, in relatively, the, Backup is in good shape, but the surface has some repairs that are required and there'll be some replacement required. So we'll be doing that repairs and then just recoding the entire facade to, to get it sort of better in better condition. The brick on the, the two-story building has been uh, 
patched and retrofitted a number of times. There's some, uh, some, some jacking of the uh, window uh, lintels that we need to rebuild above those. So we'll be sort of taking those down and, re and reinstalling the brick and then repointing in a bunch of areas in the brick and then overall just recoding that building to try to make it more uh, cohesive. If you wanna to go to the next slide, that'll show the, uh, the new work. So generally we're, we'll be changing the, the facade of the, the EFIS and recoding it to a, uh, if you look at it, it's a cream brulee color. And also on the the two-story building will be re, we're going to add a mineral coating of the brick to sort of make it more uniform in, in color and you know just in, enhance the, the, the appearance of the building in its entirety so that sort of the, the patching and all that is should will be uh, sort of minimized and be able to it'll, it'll look more cohesive altogether. You want to go to the next slide? This is a, a rendering of the, uh, of the facade as it would look after it was repaired with the, the, the uh, EFIS and the recoding of the brick. If you want to go to the next slide. Uh, this shows a sort of an evening view, the, the recoding of the stone or the repointing of the stone of the two-story two building and just the cleaning and resurfacing of the EFIS at night. We'll be adding some, some sort of, just some light on the facade to, to enhance that and just doing some minor repairs on the, the gates and, and that type of thing. If you wanna to go to the next slide, that's, the, that's a view of the rear portion of the building of the Euler Wayside that sort of shows just how the, the uh, facility will look. If you look to the left of the elevator tire on the tall building, that's where the elevator equipment room is. So you can see it has, it's really uh, not very visible at all. And the, the next side shows the material and the, the colors that we've selected and UPMC has approved for the, for the uh, brick, the EFIS, and the uh, metal coping. And the next slide. And that's just the metal coping colors. The silver metallic is what we selected. And if you go to the next slide, I think that's, that sort of opens it up for questions if anybody has any questions. Great, thank you. At this time, we take no public uh, testimony. Are there questions or comments from the commission? I have some questions that maybe are better answered even in the next um, meeting. Maybe they're worth sort of thinking about and, and presenting to us next, but they mostly deal with how customers enter and exit this um, building, um, having been both from the Forbes side and from the parking lot side on a number of occasions. It's a it's a pretty unfriendly um, to non-employee um, entry sequence. So I'm glad that you're doing the parking lot, um, but having tried to ride there with my child on a bicycle, I can tell you this is not um, a, a great adventure. So I'm curious about how bike arrival and entry on the alley in the back parking lot works for customers as well as employees. I'm curious about I'm glad that you're doing lighting on the outside of the facade on Forbes Avenue because it's not, um, it doesn't add a lot to that experience of walking down Forbes Avenue. And I'm wondering if there's any more improvements that you might consider making to that sidewalk to make it a little less foreboding um, and uninviting and perhaps to the uh, entry itself, the doors itself um, on the Forbes Avenue side. Uh, I think that's the end of my sort of overall question. Thanks. Okay, I guess on the, the Fifth Avenue side, the, we're we're just we were just doing the, the sort of the repairs of the masonry to make it to get it uh, repaired 
and not doing so much. We'll, we'll be doing some work on the sidewalks where there's uh, issues. We had an alternate to look at the, the, uh, the, the guard on the side to, to sort of, because so, some of that is in, in fairly bad shape. Uh, on the on the Euler Way side, going from the parking lot to the to the uh, I guess the entrance, there's it, it's just we have some at where we're doing the work. We have uh, guards and that that people as as you walk toward the building, you're you're at least behind those. But once you get in front of the the main building itself, it's it's sort of just open. In the entrance, we're, we haven't been tasked to change the entrance at all. So it, it is sort of, as it is, we'll have to, we can investigate that further, but at this point, I'm not sure we what all we can do. I think, Bill, uh, that we're adding some uh, bollards along Euler Way. Uh, we're providing a second bike rack uh, towards Euler Way in the parking lot which I think would contribute to uh, a clearer pathway um, to, to the main entrance on Euler Way. Um, Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Um, Beck, uh, Commissioner Mingo, do you, would you like more information on that for the next meeting then? I, I think some more explanation that drawing that you gave us for this presentation in this format is super, super tiny. And I am lucky because I have downloaded it and I can you know, make it full of explanation, but I think some visual representation of that would be helpful for the people, especially who are watching this um, and who may have comments themselves. You, you're talking about the site plan itself? The, the, the pedestrian passageway okay. through the parking lot in a larger scale so that it's easily understood okay. what improvements you're making and how yep. that is more friendly. Um, so sure, we you. can add, we'll add, we'll add additional information to that. Thanks, that'd be helpful. Great, thank you. Are there other questions or comments? I have a question about materiality. So I understand that there's going to be the restoration and the kind of recovering of the ethos. Is the new ethos only going to be placed over existing ethos? Is it being added to? The, and, go ahead. For the most part, the uh, the ethos is is solid. So the the base ethos will, will remain. And where, where we have, there are some sections that have to be replaced where there's been some damage and, and you know, repairs are required. And then the entire thing will just have a, a new uh, sort of top coat board protection. So it's not being expanded over the masonry? No. Okay. And what's, so the fact that you're kind of here and we, we appreciate that you're refurbishing the exterior, I understand the masonry needs work in addition to the EFAS. What's the the time frame for that ethos, what's its life? Are we the, gonna see you back here really quickly? No, the, the ethos coding should last 20 years, I would think. And we're revising the window details. Right now, at the edges of the window jams, there's dark stains that are occurring. And we are have gone and we're introducing some diverters that will eliminate having the dark stains at the corners of the windows. And that's where some of the damage has occurred as well. We'll be resealing all the way around each window. And the, uh, the coating that we're proposing to apply to the, the lower building at the rear and on the east side of it is a, a high uh, performance mineral coating that actually bonds molecularly to the masonry. It's not a paint. And uh, it's, it's made with mineral granules and it uh, is very tenacious and it, it has a, it's, it's not something that's going to peel off. It's a, it's a lifetime product. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you for your question, Commissioner. Are there any other questions or comments? 
Okay, great. We'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks with that additional information. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that takes us to item C. Item C is DCP MPZC 2021-00368 Banksville Road. Ms. Kramer. Afternoon, and before I give my presentation, I just want to check in to see um, who is representing the applicant today. I was expecting Ryan Wojcic, but perhaps Jonathan from GKG is here in his stead. That's correct. Good. Good afternoon, commissioners. Okay. Let me give my presentation, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, Thank you. This is. DCP MPZ 2021-00368. And this is an application for a zone change petition for a property, this is parcel 36S24. And it's at the intersection of Banksville Road and Carnahan Drive. This property is currently split zoned. So part is in the NDI, that's neighborhood industrial. And part of it is in parks. The application is to change the whole thing, the parks part into NDI so that the whole thing will be NDI. Um, the subject parcel, parcel has a billboard and advertising sign on it. And as part of the plan of right of way improvements along Banksville Road here, the billboard needs to be relocated. And so therefore the zone change petition is one of many steps in order to uh, facilitate this right of way improvement. So there will be many steps after this and this is just one of many. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn the, the presentation over to, uh, to Jonathan here and he can give us a, a, cap, a recap. So good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and thank you for your time today. Um, as, as Ann said, uh, our story on this site started actually almost five years ago when we were first approached about road improvements that had to be done for Banksville Road. Um, the site is uh, used to be owned by Lamar and was sold to the, at the time, the Parent and Child Guidance Center so that they could go ahead and develop parking on it. Um, easements were retained for uh, various signage that existed on the property. And um, what happened is really starting in 2016 and then coming up in 2017, there were some road improvements that were made at the intersection of Banksville and Wenzel. We worked out an arrangement with the city that would allow for the billboard to be relocated. Um, and now that the improvements are done, we were able to do that, except when we went to get our state permit, from the state, they, they wanted us to come back and get the piece, the little small piece that we're talking about rezoned from park to NDI so that they could essentially green light the permit. So let me just start out. This is an overview of the site. Again, it's 2644 Banksville Road. Um, this is the parent and child guidance center. Uh, and this is the intersection that we're talking about down here, which is Wenzel Road um, and Banksville. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as you can see, the, the parcel is essentially zoned NDI with the exception of this small piece that is zoned park. Um, we believe that the park zoning was just sort of a carryover from the hillside that was up above. And as you'll see in the following pictures, what we're talking about here is essentially a ravine. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, please? Um, this slide just shows that we're looking to complete the NDI and then it would be NDI at the intersection and again, NDI on the lower part. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is what we're looking at. It's essentially a uh, ravine that exists on the bottom of Wenzel Street at the intersection of Banksville. Um, this is essentially the piece that we're talking about rezoning. And again, we worked out an arrangement with the city through a settlement where instead of the taking of the board, we were paid for the relocation of the board. Um, and this is necessary, this rezoning is necessary to effectuate the relocation. Do you wanna to go to the next slide, please? Uh, this is a, an intersection, a better shot of the intersection essentially facing west. Um, the board would be uh, essentially right above uh, the creek in, in, uh, on, on the ground there, but uh, facing towards Banksville, which was similar to the way that it existed before. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, this is just a long, a long view of the intersection facing east. We can go to the next slide. Um, in this slide, we just wanted to point out that um, if you take a look at where the NDI district is actually located, it is located in essentially the lower areas of, of elevation that exist along Banksville and, and run essentially parallel with Banksville on both sides of the street. Uh, the P district, as we said, uh, was previously more or less reserved for the hillside, the slopes, and, and the areas that had a much more significant topography. Next slide, please. So, and again, our rationale for the rezoning is that it cures the existing split zone condition. Um, it also allows for uniformity within the Banksville commercial corridor. Uh, from a topographical standpoint, the rezoning is more appropriate because it's consistent with the existing topography. Uh, and most importantly, the NDI will permit us to reconstruct the board um, now that the project is complete and allow us to go ahead and to basically finalize the settlement that we have reached with the city several years ago uh, with result, as a result of the completion of the project. I would note that we did seek and previously get uh, approval from the ZBA for this um, and that we've been sitting patiently for the project to be completed. Uh, and now that's completed, we're ready to go. So um, with that, uh, that ends our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, anybody may have. Okay, thank you. At this time, we take no public testimony. Are there questions or comments from the commission? I just have a question about orientation. It took me a little bit to kind of figure out where the zone change was and you know what is the surrounding area. I do appreciate the context photos, but if we could go kind of back a few slides to, I think it is labeled Banksville Road facing north. So it's a photograph. Uh, slide four of eight. Yes, thank you. So just so I'm clear, the portion with that building, that's not part of the rezone. That is not part of the rezone. That's not part of our property, correct? Okay. And so mostly, like you said, it is that ravine. I think my only question, and I don't know that it, just for orientation purposes, has the, could you show us next time where the billboard is and kind of where it will be? Sure, well, right. So we took it down in order to facilitate the project happening, the road improvements. Um, and it was uh, within the, the take area, so to speak. So we took it down. Um, and so it doesn't exist right now, but as part of our settlement with the city at the time, uh, we went through the process of being paid to relocate it. So we're now at the point where we're able to do that. So, but I will be able to show you on the next presentation, uh, a slide with a digitally reimposed. So you can see yeah, where it would be that once that happens. That would be excellent. You know, I'm just cross-referencing with Google Maps, which still show where your sign is. And I know that looking at Google Maps aerial view, there's kind of two sets of signs. So it'd just be helpful to know which one is being relocated. No problem. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree, Rachel. I, I it would help us to see a on the map where where you're proposing. Um, this might be more question for staff, but um, that's right in the middle of the stream. Is that, I mean, what are the MS4, what are the stream requirements for sawmill run in that circumstance? So, so I can answer that. So it, it's, it's not going to be, the, the structure is not going to be located in the middle of the stream. Um, the structure itself is located outside of the stream. So from that standpoint, there's, there's going, no change in flow or no change in any of the hydrology associated with it. Okay, thank you. Is it close to going to where the previous billboards were? We can still- it, Yes, it's, it's on the same property. It's actually just slid down a little bit in order to make way for those road, essentially that bridge to come across the creek. 
So it it was already on a park property previously. That's correct. It was it was on the property that was zoned park. Um, when when it was condemned, um, we went ahead and and opted for the relocation as opposed to them paying us for the um, you know you know complete take of the structure. Um, and now that the improvements are done and that bridge is in, we're able to go ahead and put it back again. We actually had um, uh, city approvals for it. Uh, but then when we went to the state to go ahead and get the final approval, they wanted us to come back for the rezoning, which is why this process was why we're in front of you. Ordinarily, we wouldn't need to be here at all because it was part of a settlement. And just as a follow-up, I'm looking at the flood plain map um, and I know staff can confirm this. I know it's not going, the billboard won't be located in the stream, but I think to your point, Chair Mondor, it doesn't look like the floodplain extends to this portion. Um, so what is currently being rezoned? Not that, not that it would necessarily matter with a billboard. Um, I'm assuming that um, I think there's less concern for that reason. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Kamen. No, I think you're correct. Okay. I think you're correct. And, and it, we've had other issues um, actually outside of the city recently where the, the size of the post that we're talking about putting in to support the billboard is de minimis and doesn't affect the floodplain or hydrology. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, commissioners? Okay, thank you. Please come back with uh, those additional drawings and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Okay, commissioners, that takes us to item D, which is DCP MPZC 2019-00470, Institutional Master Plan and Zone Change, Mr. Or petition for Duquesne University, Mr. Gregory. Good afternoon again, commissioners. Uh, this is application number DCP MP. ZC 2019-0047. This is an application for a 10-year institutional master plan and zone change petition for Duquesne University in the Uptown neighborhood. An institutional master plan guides development for large-scale institutions for the plan's 10-year lifespan. IMPs and rezoning applications require review by both plan commission and then city council. Overall, uh, Duquesne's IMP site is bounded by Shinga Street, uh, to the east, Boulevard of the Allies to the south, McGee Street to the west, and Watson Street to the north. Uh, project, match, a pro a project map is attached to the briefing report. Uh, one parcel, 2L42, which is bounded by Forbes Avenue, Stevenson, Watson, and McGee Streets, is proposed for to be rezoned from Uptown Public Realm Sub District A to the ed Educational Medical Institutional uh, Zoning District, or EMI. Uh, project two in the IMP's 10-year development envelope is proposed on the rezone site. The remainder of the IMP site is already in the EMI zone. Uh, a hearing is before the Planning Commission is scheduled for June 1st, 2021. Public notice, including mailed notice, will be posted at least 21 days before the hearing and action meeting. There are 10 projects in the 10-year development envelope and no projects proposed in the 25-year envelope. Project one, the UPMC Cooper Fields House edition has already been completed. The project was approved without an amendment to the previous IMP under uh, ZBA case 301 of 2018, which to approve the project with the condition that the project be included in the 2021-2031 IMP 10-year development envelope. Uh, Duquesne University voluntarily participated in the Department of City Planning's Performance uh, Targets Program with staff. Uh, this process was designed to go hand in hand with the IMP Best, Best Practices Guide adopted by Planning Commission in 2018. Uh, Duquesne University held a, de a development activities meeting on August 24, 2020 with Uptown Neighborhood's two registered community organizations, the Hill CDC and Uptown Partners. Uh, the DAM report is attached to the briefing report. Uh, Adobe staff have reviewed and approved the transportation impact study uh, submitted as part of the IMP. And uh, at this time, I will turn the podium over to Duquesne's team to take us through the uh, IMP presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, um, I'm Rod Dobish. I'm the head of facilities here at Duquesne. Uh, this is my second institutional master plan. 
Uh, the previous one that uh, we let expired for a good reason. Our president was leaving and we're bringing a new president on. So uh, we left it to him to come up with the plan. So uh, if you can skip to the next slide. Um, we organize our institutional master plan uh, along with the best practices guide. Uh, just so the commissioners know, I had my hand in reviewing it. Um, I will tell you, this is a very helpful document. And I do want to thank everybody for city planning. Those performance target meetings, um, they were extremely helpful to us uh, formulating this uh, institutional master plan. Go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> Duquesne uh, is in its 143rd year. Um, just so everybody knows, we believe here at Duquesne that we serve God by serving students. And we've added a twist to this uh, saying on our campus so they can in turn serve others. Um, and they have proven that during this, this whole COVID uh, um, uh, thing. So we are the only spirit in um, university uh, in the world. It's a very small order. Uh, you can skip the, go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, we do have 47 buildings, just to give you a little bit about Duquesne, 50 acres, uh, nine schools with the 10th uh, coming soon. Um, we have 216 uh, different academic programs, a um, little over 2,600 employees, 8,800 students. Uh, just so commissioners know, our high mark was 10,400 about 10 years ago. We can house about 3,800 students, and we have a variety of men's and women's um, varsity sports. Go to the next slide. Uh, Duquesne resides in the heart of Uptown, um, uh, along with the other anchor institutions, uh, PPG and UPMC uh, Mercy, and we're very proud to be part of that community. Um, go to the next slide. Um, we have done a lot of engagement. We have partnered with um, a number of people, um, none of which should be a surprise. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a very helpful process to, to go through this. Uh, we actually learned a lot about what the community needed and they learned a, a lot about what, what we needed and some of the challenges we have. You can go to the next slide. We have been a very active member of the Eco Innovation District. Uh, I got to know uh, Derek Doplin very well. We, uh, Duquesne University was a willing partner to help shape this. And we are still uh, involved in uh, the implementation process of this plan. So we're very proud and all of our projects uh, take this into account as we're planning them and implementing those projects. And go to the next slide. Um, these are a lot of internal and external meetings. There are more in our final document, but we have actively went out. Anybody who wanted to meet with us, we met with them. Um, you, the commissioners may be wondering why our application is 2019 and it took us a while to get here. Um, it, this is one thing that's not COVID related. Uh, we were uh, acquiring a property, which I'll explain um, uh, later. You can go to the next slide. As William mentioned, uh, part of this, we are looking to, uh, uh, at the same time as our IMP, do a uh, zone change. Uh, this was one of the reasons why um, our, when we submitted this and we delayed it is because we were in the process of acquiring Life's Works uh, property, the whole block. Um, the reason we purchased this is we wanted the land, not the building. Um, and you will see as I go through the projects, 
that's where we're happy to, to be putting our College of Osteopathic Medicine on that lot. And um, you know, that building is, is a very imposing structure on Forbes Avenue. So, uh, it, and just for a matter of record, we are working with Domi on a, um, a right away vacation that's part of this lot. Um, but that's why we're, we're, uh, we want it to be EMI. Go to the next slide. This is a campus map that you know shows the projects that we envision doing in, in 10 years. Um, we, we think this is an executable institutional master plan. Uh, for those who work in higher ed, it's, it's a rapidly changing industry and we opted not to put anything in a 25 year development uh, plan just because um, things have changed so dramatically, but we think this is an executable institutional master plan. Go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna go through the projects, uh, the UPMC Cooper Fieldhouse. Um, you know, um, William mentioned what's, it's finished, why we have to put it in our institutional master plan. It's named after Chuck Cooper, if you don't know that, he was the first African-American player drafted in the NBA and he's a proud Duquesne uh, uh, alum. His son is, uh, was named after his father. Um, the second project is something that we are extremely excited about at Duquesne. It's a College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, this is the largest development in Duquesne University's history. Um, we have taken into account all the things that are gonna be happening in Uptown with the footprint of this, including the BRT. And we have done substantial setbacks and we are doing our part to try to um, make this area instead of a concrete corridor to kind of make it uh, more eye appealing and park-like as well as taking into account all the uh, stormwater management features that we need to take care of. Right, go to the next slide. Um, this may be a little confusing, but it's the, it's the building on the corner with the, the glass in the middle. It's a mis mixed use academic building. Um, more than likely, this would probably be uh, part of a, a a medical operation for us, but it's it hasn't even been in the design stage. We're just putting that there as a as a footprint. Um, number four, it's some enhancements on our athletic field. Internally, just so everybody's aware, these all have to be externally uh, fundraised. This is not using university dollars to do these. Uh, this is a visiting lock a visitors locker room. Um, our visiting football teams have to change on our pool deck. We, we tend to look at that as home field advantage, but um, it's, it's been a project that we've had on the books for a while. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, this is a replacement for our existing uh, press box. Um, it's showing its age. Um, on the academic walk side of our, our football field, we were, we were contemplating putting in some additional seating for fans. And then um, seven is a, is a real small little project, but we said we might as well put it in. It's some new athletic offices uh, attached to one of our buildings. Go to the next slide. Uh, number eight is an, uh, uh, an alumni house. Uh, it's one of the things that we wanted to re-engage our alums in a different way. It's uh, gonna reside in, a, in, a, in an area on our upper campus. And then number nine, it's not um, us developing this, but we thought it would be appropriate because of the impact of the BRT to put this in our institutional master plan. Uh, we are actively engaged with the Port Authority to kind of make this uh, somewhat unique to fit in our campus. And we're hoping to get this named as the Duquesne Station. Uh, we have been on board with the BRT 
I went back to prepare for this. Seven years ago, we started discussions of the BRT. So we're, we're, we actively support that project. And then we go to the next slide. Um, number 10 is a, it's the building that sits in the middle. Uh, looks like a U uh, that we're looking at building a resident hall on, on Forbes Avenue. That was in our previous institutional master plan. And then number 11, um, with the completion of the Cooper Field House, uh, some of our athletic coaches were in a building that sit on this corner. In the early stages of uh, BRT, we know that part of that, they have to close off one little section of Boyd Street. We're contemplating um, tearing that building down and building a, a parklet there to break up the concrete corridor on Forbes. Um, we have, we're gonna be engaging with people to actively design this and to get the community on board, but uh, this is something that we're pretty excited about, not just for us, but for the community. And with that, I can turn it over to Lisa, who's gonna handle the urban design guidelines. Next slide, please. Thank you, Rod. Uh, so in this next section, we're going to uh, review the urban design guidelines um, in addition to the open space guidelines uh, for the campus. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the open spaces of Duquesne University are really shaped by the urban context and also the, the significant topographic uh, grade change that um, really extends over the breadth of campus. Um, the open spaces of the campus really need to reflect those Catholic Spiritan um, mission and vision and values of Duquesne University. So as such, in addition to the, um, the general recommendations and urban design guidelines that uh, Maria is going to review shortly, uh, we really felt that it was important to really carve out those open space guidelines um, and outline the general recommendations uh, for campus so that we're making sure we're creating these high quality, um, high performance campus landscapes at Duquesne University. Um, these uh, seven key areas that we've outlined on the screen there um, also tie to section 7.2, which is the sustainable landscape uh, design guidelines and principles. So all of those are kind of threaded through uh, the seven key areas here, which are citing new projects, and that can be building projects. It can also be landscape projects. The campus spaces, making sure we're creating uh, cohesive, uh, connected campus environments, connectivity, prioritizing um, pedestrian um, circulation and amenities, streetscapes, uh, as Rod was touching on, really making sure we're engaging our streetscapes and activating them, uh, landscape planting, again, um, reinforcing in, uh, the campus planting um, aesthetic and design, landscape materials, looking at uh, durability, um, aesthetics, sustainability, and resilience uh, in addition to maintenance, and then sustainability, again, tying into as I mentioned, that's section 7.2, but really making sure that our landscapes and our building projects are um, designed with sustainability in mind. Next slide, please. Uh, furthermore, so we, we really looked at, um, you know, the open spaces of Duquesne's campus and um, really those, there are six um, primary types of open space that we've identified in terms of landscape character. And these open spaces provide everything from, you know, quiet places for reflection to socialization and gathering um, and, and active uh, programming, which is essential for the university's um, function. So you can see we have everything from areas of respite to wooded hillsides, which are an essential part of the campus um, and, and that tree framework that we'll kind of touch on later. Um, the green areas being um, 
those hillsides uh, programmable open spaces, which are in purple. So those are really great for not only flexible um, activities and socialization, but also in terms of campus functions where they can set up tents and additional programming. Um, and then also obviously, um, you know, field spaces and active recreation places. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Maria next to touch on the urban design guidelines. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, um, Maria Karakopoulos, WTW. Um, talking about the urban design guidelines, anybody who has walked through the Duquesne campus has been able to experience a very rich background of uh, architectural styles and materials. Uh, another piece that the university prides itself is on the rich uh, collection of murals and other public art uh, that you will experience throughout the campus. The IMP collects all this information and enhances it. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, some of the guidelines uh, that we have included uh, have to do with new structures on campus shall be sympathetic and reflective of the university standards, their immediate context and their unique functional use through architectural means. It is very important that all new developments, especially along Fourth Avenue, maintain a, a healthy public sidewalk, um, at least a 10 feet uh, transparency on that ground level to indicate the activity and the connection with the community, maintaining at least the 60% target um, throughout building entrances to be well-defined and articulated in order to achieve prominence and assist with wayfinding. Uh, universal design to accommodate all users, uh, ground floor, floor new facilities and renovations with public frontage, uh, shall enrich that public realm and activate the pedestrian connectivity with complementary architectural designs. Um, next slide, please. Here are some examples of what is envisioned and how we have incorporated the projects that are currently um, under development or have been under development in the last few years have incorporated a lot of these um, important design guidelines. It has to do also with heights, maintaining the heights, the bulk and massing um, that have been included in our IMP, the materiality and the language that is already prevalent in the space. Uh, minimizing uh, materials such as IFAS and vinyl siding in areas um, where they're not visible, but maintaining the, um, the use of the materials are uh, predominant in the campus. Uh, the next slide, uh, Cindy will, Cindy Jampol will be talking about uh, the next following slides. Good afternoon, I'm Cindy Jampol from Trans Associates. Uh, we worked on the uh, mobility portion of the IMP and TDM strategies, which uh, is shorthand for transportation demand management. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we began by establishing transportation demand goals and everything is outlined in detail in the IMP and in excruciating detail in our transportation impact study report. Uh, the approach used was to promote multimodalism and this campus is well situated for use by uh, bicycles, pedestrians, and of course, public transit. And there's already been a lot of mention of uh, the BRT system that's coming and the public transit system that exists presently. Uh, we did set goals for reduction in single occupant vehicles for employees and for students, uh, as shown on the slide here. Uh, these goals, uh, include enhancing community health for members of the campus through in increased use of active transportation and decreasing parking demand by encouraging people to make other choices for transportation. Uh, we worked extensively with DOMI and with uh, the Port Authority to develop an extensive program of TDM strategies for the project. Next slide, please. 
In addition, uh, there will be additions to the bicycle infrastructure on the campus, including six new bicycle repair stations, bicycle racks along Forbes Avenue, and also a signage place to help guide people to where those facilities can be found uh, around the campus. And with that, I will turn it over to David. Uh, uh, next slide. I'll be addressing our energy goals and our sustainability planning uh, here at Duquesne, uh, both in terms of our LEED certifications and the other initiatives we've taken. Uh, so next slide. So uh, we are committed to energy conservation and sustainable building and operating practices. Uh, two major buildings uh, that we've undertaken a LEED certification with are Depla Residence Hall, which is located near Mercy Hospital, and then the Power Center Recreational Facility, which is the image there on the left. Um, I'm sure many of you have driven on Forbes Avenue and passed under our bridge. Um, these facilities have achieved uh, LEED Gold and Silver certifications. And then an interior renovation in the Duquesne Union, our main student center, uh, achieved a silver certification. Next slide. So some of our long-term environmental and sustainability goals include uh, participating in the city of Pittsburgh and Uptown Eco Innovation District environmental and sustainability initiatives to reduce energy use, water use, and greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Pittsburgh 2030 district, enhancing the neighborhood character and protecting long-term residents, improving our open green space and other community amenities, and pursuing district energy with our partner Clearway. Uh, we're reducing the university's impact on the environment through green building practices in new construction and renovation, energy planning initiatives to reduce our energy use, and employing green cleaning, recycling, other operational initiatives to dec decrease our water use and improve our stormwater management. Enhancing the sustainability of the university operations through our resiliency plan that addresses the city's and university stresses and shocks, and working towards receiving sustainable restaurant certifications for remaining dining facilities, which include the Red Ring along Ford Avenue, Business Leaders Bistro, in Rockwell Hall and Hogan Dining in our Towers Residence Hall. And with that, we'll pass it over to Tree Canopy and Open Spaces. Thank you, David. I'm Ryan Burner from Gateway Engineers. I'm here to discuss the uh, the tree canopy assets for the university and um, how that was documented within the uh, IMP. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, you can see here we have an exhibit that we put into the IMP that shows all of the um, tree locations that we inventoried across campus for a uh, comprehensive inventory. Um, we collected information along with the help of a certified arborist to collect uh, attributes for each tree associated with uh, species name, trunk diameter, uh, canopy spread, things like that. And then um, we utilize this information to determine future growth based on the current size of the tree as well as the species. And then we were able to anticipate growth over the next 10 years from that information. Uh, using this data, we were also able to uh, compare this to the projects uh, over the next 10 years within the IMP and determine the impacts on the tree canopies based on the locations of those projects. So um, on the left side of the slide there, you can see that the projected tree canopy um, increase or, or the, the total canopy is expected to be about 15.2% of the IMP boundary, 7.5 acres. That does show significant um, progress towards the, the city canopy goals over the next 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, in addition to understanding the, the existing assets of the trees on campus, uh, there was also some uh, um, uh, future tree plantings um, uh, considered as well, which are showing here uh, potential new plantings being about 0.19 acres, 0.38% of the IMP boundary. So that takes the, uh, the future tree canopy up to 7.7 .7 acres um, for, the, uh, for the tree canopy goal. So, um, at this point, I will turn it over to Lisa Dugan to discuss more of the additional plantings. 
Thank you, Ryan. So, oh, can you please go back to the prior slide? Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to expand a little bit on the proposed tree canopy enhancements. So it was really building on the foundation that uh, Ryan had mentioned and looking at um, the preservation and the growth of existing trees and then also prioritizing the strategic placement and planting of new trees throughout the campus. Uh, this map that you're seeing uh, on the screen, all those magenta areas are um, actual feasible locations of um, that that we walked the campus with Duquesne University and identified, you know, these would be good locations for future tree plantings. And actually some of these spaces are already being utilized um, with the, the other projects. If there was additional tree requirements, I believe it was the uh, Cooper Fieldhouse project, that some of those trees are already um, being planted uh, in these spaces that we've identified. So we're, again, um, keeping that campus framework, maintaining those open spaces and the function of those spaces, but, it, but identifying how we can further, by the use of trees and new plantings, enhance this urban tree canopy, but also continue to shape the campus environment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then these are just some of the examples of the open spaces uh, that you'll find throughout Duquesne's campus. Um, the top image uh, is, is of Assumption Commons. Again, great programmable open space flanked on all the sides by um, residence halls. We have um, on the right hand side of your screen, um, areas of quiet reflection um, throughout campus. And then Bertier Commons um, on that bottom left hand corner of your screen, another great um, open space, um, really well utilized by students. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it off to Mike Albright at Gateway to uh, walk through some stormwater. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, good afternoon. I'm Mike Albright with Gateway Engineers. Um, so as you're aware, the campus is an urban campus with uh, limited open space and existing stormwater management facilities. Um, as we show here, uh, the existing pervious area currently is approximately 11.8 acres. Um, the current impervious area, about 38.1 acres. Uh, so in the proposed conditions, um, just through future developments alone, um, the planning to reduce the impervious area by about 0.23 acres. So essentially a quarter acre reduction in impervious area just through the current proposed developments um, and added open space areas. Uh, on top of that, so green infrastructure BMPs will be considered to manage stormwater for all of the individual developments as they come along. Um, so we've also outlined that throughout the IMP document as well. So um, essentially those two items alone will be the uh, basis for meeting the long-term goals of reducing the impervious area on campus by about half percent. Um, as well as meeting the current and future stormwater regulations for the city um, as each project is developed. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it along to, uh, for neighborhood enhancement strategy. Go to the next slide. Um, Duquesne is uh, very active in the community. Our current president, uh, as part of the strategic plan, wanted us to make this a focal point. And we've hired a, a vice president of community engagement. Um, it's, and it's part of our, uh, our spirit and uh, mission and values to be involved in the community as we have been since 1878. And go to the next slide. Commissioners, I did it as quickly as I could. Could talk uh, for a long time about this. I did it as quickly as we could. Thank you, uh, that was great. Um, Okay, at this time we take no public testimony. Are there questions or comments from the commission? All the Zoom webinar audio now unmuted. Okay, yeah, I have one question. Yeah, Holly, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, specifically what kinds of uh, changes are you making to increase the accessibility of the, the entire campus, um, all the buildings um, within this plan? Uh, to people with all types of disabilities? Uh, I can tell you uh, on our staff, we have um, an architect who's a project manager who has a real focus on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, the university does commit, um, commit uh, money to take care of our existing buildings, the, the mm -hmm. proposed buildings. 
will all be accessible buildings. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that we have on our campus is the terrain and all yeah. some of the buildings. Yeah. Uh, but we, we do take care of those. We have a very engaged Office of Disability Services that's not just for students, it's for faculty and staff. We collaborate with them to resolve those issues. Um, so we're, we're very active in that. I'd like to sort of piggyback on the, the um, comment that Commissioner Dick made about ex access accessibility. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I am not that familiar with your campus and clearly before our next meeting, I need to spend some time walking around, but, you know, knowing it a little bit, I'm, I'm very curious too about what the sort of pedestrian circulation experience is for people who are arriving on Forbes Avenue. And you have some lovely maps um, that maybe just at the next presentation, you could just share how those how that process works. Um, if you're arriving and you're using wheels or you're with someone who has wheels or someone who has other or multiple things that are happening, somebody with wheels and somebody who's, you know, <laughs> how, do you, mm -hmm. how do you progress from arrival on Forbes Avenue, it's sort of easy to understand parking garage to building. And then how does that happen? I think that would be super useful for the next um, meeting, including, you know, when we were looking at the University of Pittsburgh's IMP recently, they have put in um, a lot on super steep sidewalks, little areas where people can take a pause, you know, where there's a little bench or something. So if there are things like that, that also happen in your plan, I'd love to sort of hear about that. Then we can do that next time. But thank you. Okay, so much. thank you. That, that those are all good points. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I the only my last thing is that I thank you for thinking about the trees, because you know, the trees will make the campus and and our, you know, I'm a big fan of more trees. So thanks so much. Our look of our campus is the number one reason students come to our, our university. Commissioner Mingo, I, I had the same questions, especially around the Forbes Avenue uh, properties, being that you all are, you know, stepping out of the um, zone that you've been in for so long on the hilltop. I think it's great that you, the improvements to the public realm on Fifth Avenue will be will be strong. Um, just, uh, you know, I'm just interested in knowing a little more about how that feels welcoming to people. I know you talked about the green spaces and the setbacks, that's all helpful, but signage orientation, you know, making sure that people know that there are public right of ways going through your campus, even though the campus is, is private, private yet welcoming, making sure that people feel like it's okay to go to go up and to, to be welcome in, in there, I think will go a long way, so. Okay, thank you. All the audio now on I would add one thing to, uh, her, her statement right now. Uh, you please consider the accessibility of signage uh, to make it as in many as, as many formats as possible for people who are visually impaired, or that it be at the the height that someone use, utilizing a wheelchair can see more easily, and so on. I think it's really important to consider that uh, with any signage you put in. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, other questions or comments. I just had a quick question. This is Commissioner Blackwell regarding community engagement and what that looks like and referencing and connecting to um, the comment about public connectivity from Fifth Avenue. Um, what does your community engagement look like? Is it with downtown or is it with the Lower Hill District, local residents? Um, I'd just be interested to know and see the meetings that you have and who they're with um, before you come before the actual hearing. And we have people lined up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We will do that. Yeah, Commissioner Blackwell, there um, is a list in there, uh, or there is a list in the um, PowerPoint presentation, but I, it, maybe you can point us to if in the document you have any description on what their concerns were and kind of what kind of feedback. It's always helpful for us to know what you heard along the way so that we can 
understand what some of the concerns might have been and that they were addressed, so. Yes, thank you. I'd like to talk a little bit about the development on Forbes Avenue. Um, and before I get into that, I do have to disclose that my firm does have a relationship. My firm, Reed Smith, does have a relationship with the university, but not on this project and won't be impacting my review. Um, you know, we're looking at the 10 years and there's a lot of exciting development on a campus that's planned. It does seem like some of the smaller projects have already been planned out. And, you know, we're kind of seeing those in the schematics. Where I would like a little bit more information are the projects along Forbes Avenue, specifically the College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Mixed Use Academic Building, and the Mixed Use Res Life Building. Um, specifically, you know, we, we have these schematics, they're not designed yet. And then when the parameters are provided, they're kind of a really wide range. And so I think it is difficult for some of the commissioners to envision me, I can't speak for them. It's difficult for me to envision how Forbes Avenue go is going to look. So for example, you know, if we're looking at the mixed use res life building, we see a picture that shows some setbacks, but it says that, you know, the first zero to 50 feet is zero setback. It also says it could be anywhere in a floor area from 25,000 to 400,000. And so we see one picture, it's not three dimensional, it, it's three dimensional, but I don't know how that fits in. Um, some of the schematics, I don't know exactly what building is being planned. Um, so I'd like a little bit more of a targeted drawing or other schematic that shows this is the maximum density that could be built based on the setbacks being clearly shown, the maximum height and possibly the floor area. Any, any thoughts or? <laughs> uh, regarding the Forbes, the, we could give you all the details for the comm because that's fully designed. Um, the, the mixed use building, you know, we, we want to have a, a, as much setback as possible. Um, we just dropped that in and then that we dropped it there because when we engaged our internal uh, constituents, it was actually going to be in um, one of our green spaces. And we, we got a lot of internal pressure to, to move that. Um, I will tell you that originally we took the resident hall out of our institutional master plan on Forbes and because of community engagement, they asked us to put that back in. Um, you know, I've been in that corridor, um, I actually work right down the street from that corridor. It, these two buildings are going to really activate that corridor. And um, you know, we want to maintain like the widest si uh, uh, sidewalks um, and it's all part of the BRT project. We have to maintain the 10 foot wide sidewalks. We can work with, we're working with the third party developer on the resident hall and they have you know, done some preliminary designs but they're, they're gonna have to go back and take a look at it post COVID on what they're, they're gonna be doing. The mixed use building, it's just a placeholder for us for something that may happen after we get the calm up and uh, up and running. And I appreciate all that. I This wasn't a criticism of the, yeah. Yeah. the density, but what we need to see, and I understand there's placeholders and things aren't designed and that's the purpose of this document yeah. is to kind right. of set parameters, but I'm not gonna be on the commission where probably not all gonna be here, you know, five years later. And someone may come back and say, well, I can build 12 feet, 400,000 square feet. We just need to know what that looks like. Uh, and it certainly can be thoughtfully done with wide sidewalks, 
we just need to see what that would look like. Um, and we're not asking for full design drawings either. Yep. Anything okay. Like that. Okay. I got you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, I, 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 I think I have um, a similar kind of question or comment is that sometimes the IMP guidelines are really great. Um, sometimes we get focused on the buildings as discrete projects and we have very general urban design guidelines, but we don't really have a sense since that, since Forbes becomes your new front door, I guess I would really like to have a sense of what, how you're going to manage your new front door and what it is other than a bunch of discrete projects. So if that's a little more articulation through the urban design guidelines or some sort of um, a comprehensive description of how you're going to manage these discrete projects to be one streetscape would be just great. Okay. Okay. That, that's very helpful. I just wanted to make a quick correction in my question and comment. I stated the connectivity with Fifth Avenue and I meant to say Forbes Avenue. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Any other questions or comments, commissioners? Oh, I okay. So we do appreciate your feedback. I do yeah. Appreciate Thank you for working with staff, and uh, and you know we appreciate the 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 uh, work you brought forward today. Um, I know we don't see you for another four weeks, I believe. Right. Okay. Right. And so um, I think that uh, you can work with staff and. Um, that time is useful for us, for you to think about the things that are requested and to um, feel free to forward anything in advance of that um, okay. if you think it needs to be seen and we need to under time to digest it in the meantime, so. Okay, thank you, this is very helpful. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll see you in four weeks and yep. um, commissioners that, uh, takes us to the end of our briefing agenda. Um, we will, it is now 2.22, let's come back at uh, 2.35 and we'll begin the hearing portion of our meeting. Thank you. How's my audio? Super. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, sounds thanks. Good.
Okay, commissioners, as you come back in, go ahead and turn your cameras on. Okay, I uh, will do a 10 second countdown again. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us for the hearing portion of the Planning Commission meeting for the 4th of May, 2021. Uh, hearing means that the cases are presented for action by the Planning Commission. Um, during the hearing portion of this meeting, we will take public testimony with instructions to be given after each item is heard. Um, welcome to our applicant presenters. A reminder to clearly describe which slide you are presenting to in order to assist those participating via audio. Um, I'll start today with a roll call attendance. Commissioners, oh, please no, unmute no, yourself. Are, no, no one it is known when your name is called. Uh, Commissioner Askey. Here. Commissioner Blackwell. Here. Commissioner Brown. Present. Commissioner Burton Falk. Here. Here. Commissioner Dick. Here. Commissioner Mingo. Here. Commissioner Mondor here, Commissioner O'Neill. Here. Great, thank you. Okay, so on our agenda today are five items. I'll read through all five. Item A is approval of commission minutes. Item B is correspondence. Item C is hearing in action. Item D is plan of lots. And item E is director's report. We begin with approval of commission minutes, commissioners where in receipt of two sets of uh, commission minutes, one from April 6th and one from April 20th, we'll take two uh, separate votes. Um, commissioners, assuming that you have read the minutes from April 6th and have forwarded any changes, do I have a motion to approve those minutes as uh, stated in our reports? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Blackwell, second. All the audio now on second. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Dick. Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Askey? Aye. Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk? Aye. Commissioner Dietrich? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Abstain. Okay, thank you. So, commissioners, uh, same, similarly, uh, assuming that you have read the minutes from April 20th and have forwarded any changes, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from April 20th as stated in our report? Oh, uh, audio now unmuted. So moved. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Dick. Commi uh, do I have a second? Second, Burton Falk. Thank you. Uh, okay, Commissioner Askey. Abstain. Commissioner Blackwell. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Commissioner Dietrich. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Commissioner Mondor. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Abstain. Okay, thank you. That takes us to items of correspondence. Give me a minute to do some window management and I will read through all the items for correspondence. Okay, the commission is in receipt of the following items of correspondence. Regarding the University of Pittsburgh IMP, Melissa McSwiggin, Director Emeritus, and Brittany Riley, Board of Directors, Preservation Pittsburgh. Regarding DCP ZDR 2021-00265, FLDP, Lower Hill FLDP. Uh, in receipt of correspondence from Bomani House, VP of Development, BPG Real Estate Services, Phyllis Lavelle, President, Shenley Heights Collaborative, Mary Frances Cooper, President and Director, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, Robert Lawson, Founder, Owner, President, Six Degrees Consulting, 
Roman Lizarraga, President, Tungsten Enterprises, Paul Ellis Jr., Founder, August Wilson House, Darrell Porter, Executive Director, Ozanam Inc., uh, Solomon Knox, CEO, Credit Power LLC, Derek Tillman, CEO, and Darnell Dinkins, COO, TD Construction Group, Lisa Dugan, Principal, Up Studio Landscapes, DeWitt Walton, Program Director, PAPRI, Curtis Moorhead, Superintendent, Emerald Electrical Services, LLC, Rob Chambers III, Owner, RWIV Construction, Roy Butler Jr., Owner, Butler Landscaping, Adrian Boyd, Operations Manager, Boyd Roloff Services, James Cooper, President, Sterling Contracting, LLC, Richard Witherspoon, CEO, Hill District Federal Credit Union, Thomas Melker, Business Manager, Pittsburgh Regional Building Trades Council, Jeff Nobers, Executive Director, Builders Guild of Western Pennsylvania, Howard Graves, Principal, Graves Design, Juan Garrett, Executive Director, Riverside Center for Innovation, Janae Smith, Managing Director, E Holdings, Thomas Boyer, Tonya Ford, Tiffany Kinney, Tammy DeBruce, Catherine Colwell, Marimba Malines, President and CEO, Hill District Community Development Corporation, Phyllis Gaffor, Kimberly Ellis, PBG and Clay, Clo Clay Cove Capital, uh, Open Lettered Historic Hill District Community, PBG and Clay Cove Capital, Letter to CSIP Executive Management Committee, and I believe that is it. Okay, uh, next on the agenda. Uh, next on the agenda is hearing in action. We have one item under hearing in action. That is DCP ZDR 2021-00265 FLDP Specially Planned District number 11 Lower Hill, Ms. Rakis. And before Ms. Rakis starts, I will be recusing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, commission members. If I can just do a quick check, at least with Bill Siddig, you and your team, make sure we can, we've got audio on you. I know you have a number of participants, but we'll just start there. Lost the hmm? Please lost the I'm sorry, is the... Is... Okay, Bill, we can hear you. That's okay. great. That's all I needed. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. We're having trouble with our architect, so we're trying to get him logged in. So. Okay, and we were we there was another room that we let in as a presenter. They were named boardroom because we didn't see everyone that you had provided as presenter. So, um, if we're missing somebody or we've promoted someone wrong, just let us know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commission members. This is DCP ZDR 2021-00265. Uh, it's an application for new construction of a mixed use 26 story office tower uh, in the SP11, the Lower Hill Specially Planned District. So stormwater was submitted for this application and under review by staff. Uh, and you'll see that as a condition that that final stormwater approval be approved uh, uh, prior to the ROSA issuance. A TIS, a transportation study impact for the entire SP11 and for this, the scope of this work was submitted and is under review by the Department of Mobility to Infrastructure. Uh, and you will also see that as a condition of approval that those be approved by the time of the ROSA issuance. Uh, so to meet the maximum setback in the zoning code text for SB11 and the frontage requirements in the PLDP, the applicant is proposing to dedicate a portion of the site as right of way. The Department of Mobility and Infrastructure has provided an initial okay to staff on the dedication. Uh, and then final dedication will be required prior to the final certificate of occupancy. And again, you'll see that as part of the conditions. Urban open space is not required on this parcel as, as per the current preliminary land development plan. However, the proposed urban open space on block F is required to be commenced within two years of the date of an approval for an FLDP, FLDP on this block. The product was reviewed in staff design review and then by the contextual design advisory panel. And you have that memo summarizing that process and the applicant's response as part of your report. Uh, the development activities meeting for this project was held on March 15th, 2021, uh, and you have an attached memo as part of your report summarizing that the meeting and the discussion. Uh, so staff is recommending approval of this final land development application with five conditions. Uh, the first two just relate to, again to the final stormwater management plan and the final transportation studies 
The third is our standard condition, that final construction plans, including site plans, landscape plans, and elevations be reviewed and approved prior to issuance of the final record of zoning approval. The fourth relates to the right-of-way dedication that the it's required, um, again, prior to the final certificate of occupancy. And the fifth uh, condition is that an amendment to the preliminary land development plan that addresses the removal of Wiley and any other proposed changes to the master plan shall be approved prior to or at the same time as the next final land development plan for SP11 or is required within two years for commencement of the open space on block F. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the applicants to make their presentation. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you, board. I, this is Bill Siddig. I represent the applicant in connection with this FLDP presentation. Uh, just to introduce the board and the attendees to um, our presenters today, we're gonna start with Dr. Kimberly Ellis. Dr. Ellis is a BPG Director of Community Arts and Culture, uh, a Hill District resident. Uh, Bomani Howes, uh, who is in the room with us today, he is BPG's Vice President of Development for the Greater Pittsburgh area, also a longtime Hill District resident. Uh, Chris Buccini is Principal and Co-Founder of the Buccini Pollen Group, who here is BPG. Uh, Amichi Aka is the co-founder and managing partner of Clay Cove Capital uh, Equity Partners um, in this project. Boris Kaplan is uh, a BPG senior VP and, and has led up the effort, particularly the community effort on behalf of the developer. Uh, the architect for the project, uh, principal and design director with Gensler is Peter Stubb. And Peter, Peter um, we're told, isn't in the room. I'm hoping he's on and can join us. But he's uh, he's not been recognized, so I don't. We're, we definitely want to hear from Peter if we can. Uh, Lisa Dugan, who the board just heard from in connection with the master plan presentation, Lisa's the landscape architect with our Studio Landscapes, uh, and Lakeisha Bird, architectural design consultant for the project, uh, founder of Communion LLC, and also a Hill District resident. Uh, the framework for this uh, FLDP is the 2014 PLDP. And it's I'll been a long time coming. It was a long time getting to that PLDP. Uh, so we're talking about many years of, of planning effort, a collaborative effort with the Greater Hill District community. And we believe, and it, it, we believe staff has found that the FLDP complies in every respect with the PLDP, which is the best indicator of the success of that planning project. And while there wasn't any look as to what project would come out of the ground first. Uh, there have been various projects that have been here. This is uh, by far the furthest anyone's got, and it's, it's ready to fund and to get built. Uh, we took into account some of the comments and directives made at the briefing. Uh, particularly, we're going to provide some detail on direct benefits to Hill District residents and, and businesses and, and provide some a specific and personal flavor to that. We're also going to try to improve and uh, take into account the presence of the project and understanding uh, that the fact that it's a tower, but, and that it's a catalyst, but that it's part of a connection. And we think we'll be able to better demonstrate that today. As Kate mentioned, there was a request to clarify the open space requirement. Uh, there is an open, this FLDP, if it's approved, uh, will we'll trigger that in two years. That language has been further clarified by staff and, and we're fine. And in connection with that, we'll, we'll show you a, a little next iteration, a little progress in the design to give an idea of what that transition is going to look like if in fact it's built and not uh, transition right into that block F urban open space. Uh, want to mention the, the CSA, which is really the framework. It's, it was a framework that was developed with the community and the PLDP requires that we have a statement of affirmation and, and we, we have that statement of affirmation from the developer. Uh, what you also hear though, are some details on that. We expect the community will talk in detail about those goals uh, and how far we've come and our plans for proceeding with future phases of development. We believe you'll hear uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, EMC, executive management committee uh, also uh, separately about their position. So there will be a little bit more flavor, although we're just limited to a statement of affirmation. This is obviously uh, as much as in my, my 
recollection and, and career. Um, by far and away the most community impactful land and project. So we're going to spend a lot of time on that. And we're also going to spend some time on the history of the site and the history of the community. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We also uh, submitted over 450 pages of background documents related to the community efforts. They're extensive. They've been summarized in the BLDP, but they only scratch the surface. Uh, that gives you a better feel for the extent of the engagement. And again, that's just the beginning. And the support letters were mentioned, and we, we'd ask those to, to be admitted. Uh, with, with that, I'd like to turn to the package itself, uh, the presentation. You know, th this is the site, the corner of Washington and Bedford, looking up, uh, up into the site across G4, which is in the foreground. Next slide, please. This is our development owner and consultant team many of whom I mentioned, and the other folks are here and available to speak today um, as, as, as consultants and advisors. Uh, next slide, please. This is the a broader scope of the project team, obviously many sub layers of these, but it's an extensive development team with, with many arms connected with the community. And as you can see by the highlighted, uh, it's heavily Hill District based. Next slide, please. So to the site itself, uh, the highlighted portion that's outlined in red, that's the G1, G4 block. It uh, basically borders, it's at the corner of Bedford and Washington, but there's this segment that goes um, all the way up to Logan. And it's most importantly, as we'll see, it's really the, the connection with the cap. It's the extension of this park and the connect, reconnection of Wiley Although as we'll see in, in the cap is not necessarily as a, as a public street for vehicles, but it's that it's that Wiley connection uh, with the Hill District. Next slide, please. And just to clarify, we wanted to look ahead in a planning sense, and I think we we and I, I'll take personal blame for it. Probably added to the confusion by not showing that Wiley Avenue right away, right away as clearly as it is. It is still, and we've tried to be consistent now in showing it as an existing right of way. We, we, we think very, very strongly, uh, I think there's unanimity on it really. I haven't heard anybody that's, that's opposed to it believe that that should be vacated and become part of the urban open space, but we're trying to consistently show what it is now and, and our plans will show that we're designing to it as a public right of way with a, uh, a constructible G4 transition to that right of way. Um, next slide, please. And this gives you a little bit of detail, which the later speakers will, will uh, be able to provide um, all of the intricate aspects of the overall G1, G4 plan. But that gives you an idea of how G1, G4 fits into the greater G block and how it relates to FM Wiley. Um, next slide, slide, please. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kimberly Ellis, um, who, as I mentioned, is uh, with, G, uh, with um, BPG, but uh, most importantly, has served for all of us as our, our, our historian for the project. Thank you so much, Bill. And good afternoon to all of the Planning Commission and each commissioner. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this history. Uh, our National Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman says in her poem, The Hill We Climb, quote, it's the past we step into and how we repair it. So how do we honor and help repair the historic Hill District? <clears throat> well, in many different ways. And in this particular section, I wanna talk about how it's time to tell a new story about Pittsburgh. And it actually starts with our history. Um, <clears throat> in 1829, a small set of black families settled upon the hill, the lower hill. At the time, it was known as Prospect Hill, Little Haiti, and Arthursburg. An attractive settlement with a good view, they had found a sweet spot. Some years later, white families began to settle in the area as they also found it desirable. In 1840 is when William Penn bought the farmland in the middle and upper hill. And I stress that so we understand who was there first. These sets of families were free and many of them were abolitionists. They hosted Martin Delaney, 
who arrived in 1831 and was su supported by this free community and served as the basis for him studying and becoming a doctor, an abolitionist, an entrepreneur, a freedom fighter, and a US military soldier. Next slide. <clears throat> This is a picture of the Colored Convention in Pennsylvania in 1841. Colored Conventions, as they were called, were held all across the United States during the period, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, yes, during the period of enslavement as activists and organizers sorted out how to end slavery, try to decide where they wanted to live and how to make this country a quote, more perfect union. In Pittsburgh, the Anti-Slavery Society welcomed persons such as William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. And Pittsburgh's African-American community hosted its own colored convention in 1843 at Bethel AME Church. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Act is the reason why so many black people departed Pittsburgh en masse, but free blacks stayed and they left a community here. I can't stress the importance of this. Next slide. During the 19th century, immigrants began flowing into what we now know to be the Lower Hill. Upon exiting the train station, they came, the Irish, the Italian, the Jewish, the Russian, the African-Americans. They all came and settled upon a new life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and in the Lower Hill. The Irene Kaufman Settlement House, later to be known as the Hill House, became a necessary local focal point. It's important to note <clears throat> um, that the African-Americans coming up from the South were meeting the older Black community that had been there. Soon the Lower Hill seams were bursting and there was urban decay, but there were still many hopeful people making the best of the area. After World War II, there were many discussions by the federal government to renew American cities and engage in what we now know to be urban renewal and urban redevelopment. Pittsburgh, was the first to be chosen and created the Urban Redevelopment Authority in order to create the program and receive the federal funds. Unfortunately, the plans that were made only partially came into fruition. This is a picture of one of the original designs of the Lower Hill Arena site. I want you to pay very close attention to what was promised versus what was delivered. Next slide. The Civic Arena was built, but only one apartment building was created from the 20 or so that you saw on that previous slide. Black people were hired to demolish the lower hill and then not hired to build the innovative Civic Arena. Eminent domain could have been handled much, much better. Many of the persons who lived in the Lower Hill found the process to be dissatisfactory and African-Americans were the last ones left and moved up into the rest of the hill. Intention and in development matters and everything begins with design. What did it mean to have city councilman and URA member George Evans at the time say that quote, there would be no social loss if it were all destroyed. Pittsburgh's first redevelopment plan did not just fail the African-American community, it failed the entire city of Pittsburgh, but it did so in our neighborhood. And so it matters even more that we now have city councilman Daniel Lavelle, a present historic Hill District resident and someone such as Diamante Walker as deputy director of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, who is also a present historic Hill resident. It matters to have a responsible and informed URA board and planning commission. Next slide. I wanna draw your attention to these protests outside of the civic arena, which you can see in the upper right corner of that picture. It was after it was already built. They're holding signs, where are the jobs we pay taxes to? We would want to work too. We are taxpayers, we contribute. 
um, Frankie Pace of the Citizens Committee for Hilditch Renewal, which is in, she's standing there right in front of this. It, it was actually a record store. <laughs> And it's also did double duty as the Citizens Committee for Hill District Renewal. She, along with other Hill and national organizations, staged a boycott, um, which included Martin Luther King Jr.'s last campaign, the Poor People's Campaign, and made it known with a billboard which read, attention, City Hall and URA, no more redevelopment beyond this point. We demand low income housing for the Lower Hill. Well, the city did build low income housing. In fact, we were overrepresented with public housing, but not much more. And after this point, the city did not move above Crawford Street and with the Crosstown Parkway engaged in a sort of benign neglect of the area. We call it disinvestment today until Crawford Square was built in 1990 and completed in 1999. Let me talk about Frankie Pace and her colleagues just for a little bit, <clears throat> just so we don't get her history confused. Frankie Pace, the NAACP model cities and the poor people campaign, they were not a part of the development team. They had no input on the demolition of the lower hill or the development of the civic arena. They were not members of the URA or a planning commission. They were not on city council and had no ability to make legislation other than to try to influence it. They were trusted by their neighbors. Indeed, the protest billboard they organized was the first time they actually said no to development. Initially, they welcomed the redevelopment. They welcomed it. <clears throat> but the billboard went up because they were being done wrong. And she saw how her community was being affected negatively. Frankie Pace and her colleagues were also at the center of Hill District hiring and housing options. So she knew who was not being hired and who the jobs were not going to. Frankie Pace and her colleagues did not have a development team build her new office for the first source center. Frankie Pace and her colleagues did not have a development team's commitment to send employers her way. Frankie Pace and, and her team had no development funds from tax abatements to help her community out in any way. And the list can go on and on and on. I hope the lesson is not lost here. Next slide. And so let's take a real look around the civic arena, around the 28 acres and what it means to people. This is a fictional character <clears throat> named Sterling Johnson. Sterling Johnson comes from August Wilson's Radio Golf, which is all about the redevelopment of the historic Hill District um, located in the office, the Bedford Redevelopment Office. <clears throat> when there are real jobs available, especially after a global pandemic, what responsibility do we have to people like Sterling Johnson? Um, he's not a member of the union in this play and he is his own business. Our team has been criticized for having great marketing, which is more than a bit unfair because as you can see, we have real plans. And before we get into activation, we have to pass through the URA and planning commission with our plans. We passed the EROCRC unanimously because we are not just about buildings, we are about people. We are about people like Sterling Johnson. We establish relationships between the individual contractors and businesses and institutions. This is what builds community. Reviewing the history of this community the sets of communities and this project are extremely important. So next up, we have the Vice President of Development for Pittsburgh, Bomani M. House. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Ellis, thank you for that, that journey into history. To now take us forward, I want to welcome you all to the Hill District 10 years from now in the year 2031, a fully realized Lower Hill redevelopment with a vision before us that we may have seen many times before over the past two decades, but unrealized. Over the last 15 years, Dr. Ellis and I have been a part of many planning sessions, uh, the Hill District Master Plan, the Green Print Plan, the Center Avenue Plan, 
the Choice Neighborhoods Plan, the Community Collaborative Implementation Plan, and the list goes on. However, this one is backed by experienced development firm, Buccini Poland Group, brought on by the Pittsburgh Pens, capitalized by the equity investment firm, Clay Cove Capital, and committed anchor tenant, First National Bank. This aerial view shows us hovering over Crawford Square to hey, the left. We could go to uh, screen 13, please. Let's keep rolling. So this aerial allows us to hover over Crawford Square. To the left is Freedom Corner. <laughs> Behind us are the days of deep and persistent. Please go back. Behind us are the days of uh, deep, persistent economic pain um, related to lost opportunities, nowhere in sight for business opportunities. I want you all to stroll down Wiley Avenue at the middle, to the left and right, is mixed income residential housing that complements the Crawford Square community. Our elders to the right at Kaylee where our Irvis Towers now live in an overlook of neighborhood vibrancy. To the left below the housing possibly could be a grocery store so that our neighborhood is no longer a food desert. To the right, a live entertainment venue and maybe the Savoy, Hurricane, Crawford Grill or possibly even the relocation of the Shadow Lounge. This week's lineups perhaps could be bringing in Roger Humphrey's band, the Selector on, one, Selector on one and twos, maybe the Bill Henry band, closing out the week with maybe a Jill Scott or Buju Bantan live concert. Outside, down the Wiley Avenue strip, you might see entrepreneurs getting their first shot in a retail kiosk. And this too was criticized by some, a small select few. This on-ramp, opportunity might possibly connect merchants to expand from a lower, another uh, Hill District site, maybe a satellite operation. Maybe they have been, maybe they've come out of their home and into a small kiosk retail to share their products. Maybe somebody from a brick and mortar location during the economic caps of, of the COVID pandemic is now finding a spot to start again. It all begins with this approval here. It all begins at the foot of the first national bank financial center. So the vision before us, we've seen many of them before, but we'd like to dive deeper into the planning. I want to introduce to you Chris Buccini, co-president of Buccini Poland Group to talk about the deep levels of reinvestment capital in the term sheet, and then later bring on Amicia Ka from Clay Cove Capital. Chris? Thank you, Bomani. If we could go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, I've said, as I've said since day one, we'll have succeeded when you do not know where our project starts and where it ends, aesthetically and economically. For us to succeed, the middle and upper hill must also succeed. This is the shared prosperity that has been discussed in this community for years. The foundation of our, uh, uh, the foundation of our economic plan is twofold. Number one, BPG has always made it a priority to partner with our communities, assessing their needs and seeing how they can best be dressed. The second uh, part of our foundation is the community, community collaborative impact plan, the CSEP, that was approved by the URA and the SCA last May during the preliminary takedown review and the approvals. Um, as the president of the Buccini Poland Group, I personally drafted the summary to our community, community engagement plan um, and the term sheet, which you can see here on the screen today. Uh, this right here on the screen is just a, it's a, it's a shot, shot of what can be found. Um, we've submitted it, it can be found on the website and it's been shared often. I wanted the, these documents to be very clear as day, um, very detailed by phase, CSIP focus area, and projected dollar amount, um, and what was, a, what was ethically and commercially feasible for us to do. I wanted to create a document that I knew we could stand behind to under-promise and over-deliver. Deliver. At BPG, we have a strong reputation for doing what we say we are going to do. Um, we have presented this plan that you see here today many times to the community, 
the CSIP EMC, the DRP, the Lower Hill Economic Impact Roundtable, and yesterday in an open letter, and have posted on a website for all to see, and I have repeatedly said we will countersign. The project has become considerably better due to our engagement with the community. The OZ fund for the middle and upper hill is one of the many positive outcomes that, have cut, that has come from this process. We have not been able to commit to do all the requests from the Hill CDC, but we have made a very big impact, one that we're very proud to be a part of. Phase one of our community benefits package is now in excess of $50 million. And that is before you take into account the tens of millions of dollars in job creation for black and women, black and women owned businesses that will occur. The magnitude of this plan is like any development project in the history of Pittsburgh, the state of Pennsylvania, and we have not found anything of comparison in the United States. I find it even more compelling that this site was the first was first chosen in the nation to create urban redevelopment. And now we are back 70 years later to do it again and on the same spot. It is my desire to get, rid, to get it right for myself and my family, my partners, the Hill community, and the city of Pittsburgh. Okay, so I'm often asked, how will this project help people in the neighborhood? If we could please go to the next, next slide. Um, I have summarized the, the prior page, in, uh, which is much more detailed, here above. Um, I've summarized on the screen and broken out between day one funding to the community and the ongoing funding. So on day one, most importantly, uh, the thing I'm most proud of in this plan is our, our team here in Pittsburgh is now led by two residents of the Hill who are helping day to day shape this plan. So the community is truly at the table at the table 24 seven uh, working on this plan. And those are the hours we've been working on this. Um, secondly, seven and a half million dollars is going to the Greater Hill Reinvestment Fund day one. This is not controlled by the developer. We have nothing to do with this money once we give it to, to, to once we uh, grant it to the Greater Hill Reinvestment Fund. And it will solely focus on develops in the developments, the middle and upper hill, something that has sorely been missed for a generation there. Um, next, the Hill minority business owners will now have access to two million dollars from FMB Bank from micro lines and lines of credit. These are, these are, these are fulcrum investments to the Hill business owners. Um, next, to date, we have already invested $2.1 million on the hiring minority and women-owned businesses, but there are tens of millions uh, pending upon breaking ground. And the first source center will be opening this month, and it will be a hub of job creation and training. The first source center will be supported for a minimum of 10 years. Okay, so that's day one. Let's talk about what happens on, on an ongoing basis, because that has been something that we've listened to and has been a big thing from the community. So as of last week, FMB once again increased its financial commitment, and they are now up to $25 million of investments in the middle and upper, upper hill. These funds are going, uh, will go towards loans, grants, equity, but most importantly, they will be going to non-traditional and harder to finance projects. Again, these are with these are with fundamentally changed investments from happening and not happening, happening in places like the Middle and Upper Hill. We are also going to put eight million dollars into the Greater Hill Housing Stabilization Fund. This money will go into the Middle and Upper Hill to revitalize and rehabilitate residents' homes. Um, my partner uh, uh, Amicia Ka from Clay Cove Capital will lead our Opportunity Zone Fund to invest $5 million in new development projects in the middle and upper hill that are, and these are, these are projects that are struggling to find capital to make their dreams come true. Um, and, and two and a half million dollars will go to develop the phase one of our um, community urban space. Oh, I'm sorry. And we also have committed to both repair and maintain the Freedom Quarter. It was really important for me to outline what I've just said so residents understand what we are doing and what we'll continue to do. We want them to see what, what is happening. Our community investment plan is the result of a broad-based engagement process, unlike anything I've never ever been a part of, but that got us here to today. This plan is an opportunity for generational change. A series of loans and investments made in the middle and upper hill will create new growth and projects in the community that will provide generational wealth. 
we, we, we based this plan on the very high bar goal set in the CSEP, which was created before we were even develop, uh, identified as developers. We have met along the way over the last three years with local business owners, community groups, longtime residents of the Hill. We have over 20 letters of recommendation, video testimonials, and there will be persons who will be speaking here today live on our behalf. The breadth of this commitment is the result of the diversity of our ownership team. It is an alignment of the stars that has brought together such an impactful team. Today, as I mentioned, our team is led and is being built by, and the project is being built by two Hill District residents, Bomani Howes and Dr. Kimberly Ellis, who are, who are now both BPG employees. They join a team of 11 Hill District residents who are now members of our team. 11 members of the Hill District are members of our team. But it didn't start this way. It happened organically the way the CSIP would have, have always hoped for it to happen. And yes, we are a fully collaborative team. BPG and Clayco Capital are proud to lead the team with a focus on job creation, inclusive procurement, opportunity zone investing, wealth building, and complementary development along Center Avenue, Wiley Avenue, and Huron Avenue corridors. F and B, the second largest bank in the state of Delaware, our state of, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania, wants to be a member of this community. Um, they, um, they have a long history of investing in the Hill with $7 million of new um, commitments just this past week, and will be doing much more in the coming years. It should be noted that FNB has chosen to make a very long-term commitment to be a member of this community. And then, of course, the Penguins, they are the drivers of the, over of the overall 28-acre development, and they are the ones that negotiated the learning parking tax diversion monetizations which will be the two sort, biggest sources of capital for the neighborhood. In conclusion, BPG and Clay Cove aren't just making promises. We have a very long track record of tangible success and community reinvestment. And BPG and Clay Cove have made a long-term commitment themselves for a minimum of 11 years to this investment. I am also personally guaranteeing um, the construction loan, um, the, yeah, the guarantee of the construction loan, and we are also guaranteeing the monetization of the alert and the parking tax diversion. So the community will receive this money day one instead of waiting for 20 years as it comes in. We have created a world-class team to work on a world-class project with BPG, one of the largest mixed-use developers in the US, but locally led by residents of the Hill. Clay Cove Capital, one of the largest black owned real estate investment firms in the US. And then f and and the Pittsburgh Penguins, two companies that have more hometown pride and commitment than I've ever seen. This team can deliver what I believe to be the best community reinvestment plan in America and building project that Pittsburgh and the Hill District will be very proud of. Unfortunately, any delay will negatively impact and in fact put an end to this project because of anger tenant complications and interest rate exposure. We humbly request that you see this as a viable project that invest in humans and people even more than, than buildings, and that you pass on our project today. I am very, very grateful for your consideration. April month. Next. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, the next slide, please. Um, and then let's just keep going to the next slide. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you've heard our introduction. And so now I'd like to, you, you've heard our introduction. Now I'd like to dive into where we are in our pre-development. Our MWEB plan, our MWBE plan, pardon me, started out rough and it perfected itself or worked moved to move towards perfection along the way. Um, there was a scoring system by the development review panel that, in 2020 of last year, set us just 12 points shy of the CSIP and two points shy of the Hill District Master Plan. And so we rolled up our sleeves and got to work. As Chris mentioned earlier, in our pre-development plan, we've already invested $2.1 million in MWBE uh, contracting. 42% of our contracting went to MWBEs, and we took our plan to the Equal Opportunity Review Commission. When they received our plan, heard our presentation, 
They unanimously approved our plan so that we could go forward. We were very proud of that. And some of those commissioners are on the call uh, this afternoon. We have, through e-holdings, with the work of Janae Smith and Herb Williams, been able to gather and collect a database of 495 MWBE firms that are interested in, part in participating on the Lower Hill site. We have a method that if we cannot find the contractors in the uh, Hill District community, we search outside and go towards the larger greater Pittsburgh community, the state of Pennsylvania, and we will even go with national firms to make sure that we have huge MWBE participation. And so we're very proud of that, working with organizations like the uh, EMSDC, the Eastern Minority uh, Supplier Development Council. <laughs> so I wanna go to the next, uh, next page. Um, before we dive into this, I wanna uh, cue up a video that really shows how our architect and uh, Howard Graves and other business owners in the Hill District community are in support of the plan going forward without delay. I'm Howard Graves. I'm the founding principal of Graves Design Group of Architects. We're locally headquartered in downtown city of Pittsburgh. Uh, we're, the we're the oldest and largest African-American firm in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we had an opportunity to engage with, uh, with the Buccini Polling Group, uh, who essentially invited us to, uh, to the team, along with Gensler. We are working directly in concert with Gensler on the f and Tower. Uh, which has very, very aspects, various aspects to it. Uh, one of which is to create a community space uh, along the historical corridor of Wiley Avenue. Uh, it's the opportunity to bring a vibrant community back uh, that had been there previously. It will encourage uh, entertainment and growth, economic prosperity. Uh, we think it's a way that people will find their find an opportunity to engage with others, uh, discover both themselves and the greater Pittsburgh community. We think that uh, the, the, the outreach that occurred uh, by the PP, BPG group uh, with the local community has been stellar. I think a lot of partners are, are very grateful for the level of output, the level of minority participation on the project, which, which is unprecedented in the city of Pittsburgh. Hi, I'm Carmen Pace. I'm a lifelong resident of the Hill District homeowner, and I want to say historic Hill District, but I also wanted to say that I totally support the FNB uh, project in the Lower Hill, and I wanted to move forward so that we as a community can enjoy and benefit. So thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Baker. I am the supervisor and president of the Samuel J. Jones Funeral Home, which is located in the Hill District on Wiley Avenue. I am in support of the um, lower uh, Hill District development, and I think it should proceed without further delay. My name is Gil Lowe. I'm a business owner in the Hill District. My company is Prince Hill Capital, and I'm in support of the FMB development. My name is Jerry Hughes. So I'm proud of Jerry's Pizzeria in the Hill District. I'm asking everybody who lives in the Hill, who owns and operates a business in the Hill, to please stand behind and support the construction, the finances going on with the FBB building downtown, down on the lower side of Bedford, in which strengthening our, our community is very, very, very important. 
part of why I opened up a business here. That's how we live in. My name is Lorraine Nutten. Hill District, longtime Hill District resident, and I'm full support of the Lower Hill Project going forward. Now, hello, I'm Marcia Scott. I'm a lifetime Hill District resident. I am in support of the FMB project moving forward without delay. Hey, how you guys doing? I'm Steve Rucker, owner and operator of Rucker's Electric. Hey, I'm in full support of FMB Towers moving forward in the Hill District. I've been a long time resident of the Hill District myself for some years, since I was born actually, but definitely in full support of FMB Towers moving forward in the Hill District. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tony Ford, a lifelong resident of the Hill District. I am in full support of the FNB project, and we are ready to move forward. Tiffany Kenny, I'm a homeowner in the Hill District, and I am in support of the FNB project, and we want the Lower Hill to move forward. Hi, I'm Gail Felton from Everett Dwellings, Tenant Council Affordable Housing, and I'm definitely for the FNB to move forward. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pamela, and I'm a Hill District resident, and right now I'm living in a family property, and I'm in full uh, support of the FMB project going forward immediately. I am Phyllis Daniel Lavelle. This testimonial is for the City Planning Commission. I am an Upper Hill District resident. I am a Hill District business owner. I also serve as the volunteer president of the Shinley Heights Collaborative. The Shelley Heights Collaborative is the recognized community organization for the Upper Hill District of Pittsburgh, also called Shelley Heights. I am speaking to the FNB Financial Center. I would encourage all who have anything to do with making this project go forward to do so and to send it forward immediately. I say this because I believe the area deserves redevelopment. I say this because the benefits that are to come to residents in terms of jobs, housing development, business development, all of these are urgently needed by our community. Take us to the, if we can now go to the page that touches on workforce development. I want to thank all of those uh, persons who took a minute out of their time. Uh, I walked into business owners while they were in operation, and I just want to thank them again for uh, lending their voice to support this, this, uh, this effort. And so for all those residents and business owners, I, uh, thank you. At the bedrock of our plan, workforce is extremely important. We know that we are in a community that has a median household income of that range of 18,000K. And of that, many of them are living off of $7,900 a year, forcing people to work two and three jobs, partnering with other people working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. And so we feel that pain, we understand that pain, and we under we bring those stories into our workforce planning to make sure that we're hitting the mark right. So when you hear these large dollar amounts, 50 million or more, um, understand that it's getting into the deep impact of our community. But it has to have a home and it starts with these type of partnerships with between Bacini Poland Group, Partners for Work, PJ Dick, and the Urban Redevelopment Authority. And that home, we've been able to build at the Hill House in the first source center. This is a home, a one-stop shop, a place where job seekers can go and find resources to get assistance, not only to be able to work on the Lower Hill site, but we are bringing employers to our network. Many of us who have higher levels of educational attainment can go out, we have a broad network if we need to increase our job opportunities not so much for a lot of people in the Hill. And so we're bringing our networks of employers into the Hill at the First Source Center. We've been partnering, we've been planning with the Pittsburgh Public Schools Career and Technical Education Program 
run by Angela Mike. They have a focus in finance, business administration, IT, HVAC, electric, and machining. And so we thought that it would be fitting for us to be able to bridge that U Prep Malayans school to the Lower Hill site so that pipelines can be bridged. Pre-apprenticeship pre programs, program agreements are all in place to make sure that workforce is a central part of our, our plan. I, I just wanna deviate for a minute and connect you to some, some very real stories. Uh, some time ago, I uh, met a woman at a center at the Hill House. She had just completed her training from the Macero uh, School around flagging. She was proud she had her certificate of completion, um, but to make ends meet, she came to work for me. One day the family came to me because she was missing for a couple of days. I went with them to her home. The lights were on, keys were on the counter. You could see it through the window. Fearing some that something would be wrong, I broke the window, climbed in, made my way to the bathroom, and there I found her on the floor. She was a recovering addict. The spoon was there. The dope needle was there. The flowers were there, but her body was gone. And I share that story because some people just don't get the urgency of why we have to push these plans forward even while they are not per perfect. We have had so many community engagements where contractors are coming up to us. I shook a man's hand and he could only shake my hand with three fingers and one thumb because one finger had been shot off, straight bullet. This is the type of environment that we're living in. Another, I met another gentleman who told me the story of how he was shot point blank range in the head. And the only reason why he's still here is because of two reasons. One, because the bullet ricocheted off of his jawbone and came out of his chin. And then two, because he was able to survive that event and build a business that he's trying to, on this lower hill site, get an opportunity. I share those stories because we have an urgency behind this plan that cannot be denied. It cannot be pushed back. Let's go on to the next slide. The reason we believe that this will be a successful plan, a beneficial plan for our community is because we now have an alignment of partnerships that we haven't had before. In the center, you have First National Bank, BPG, Clay Cove, and the Pittsburgh Pens. On the exterior rim, we have made sure that we forge partnerships with the Urban Redevelopment Authority, thanks to Deputy Director Diamante Walker and all of their programming to help support programs like the Catapult program run by Tammy Thompson, who understands the traumatic barriers before people who are trying to build their businesses or just plain old seek employment, gainful employment. We have partnerships with the Riverside Center for Innovation, where some of our BPG colleagues are partnering with them to help MBEs learn the skill of bidding and estimating before the package is out. And if the package is too large, we're, with, large, we're willing to break those packages down so that we can receive participation. We appreciate all of the efforts of the CDC, Marimba Malayan's work to help prime the pump for our development of the lower hill. And we continue to stay engaged with the CDC, the DRP, and the executive management committee overseeing the project site. We have partnerships with the Hill District Federal Credit Union, who can, you can walk in their door with a 400 credit score, no, save, no money in your savings account, and begin to scale and grow your, your, your monies so that you can participate in the, the growing economy of the Hill District. The Poise Foundation is ready and standing as a bridge to be able to partner with 
to bring partnerships of the philanthropic community, the Heinz Endowments, the RK Mellons, P Pittsburgh Foundation, the Ford Funds, and the and McCauley Ministries and others. And so we have this powerful, cohesive set of partnerships to make all of this happen. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I want to now turn it over to, I mentioned Clay Cove Capital. Amicia Ka is with us, equity investor in the project. I want to turn it over to him to talk about the types of investments that are not just surface level, but are actually investing in people. Amicia Ka. Amani, well, thank you very much for those powerful words. Uh, as he said, this is more than just about investing money. Although this project has brought together a unique partnership that is critically situated to help alleviate the chronic problem of lack of access to capital in the Hill District. F&B has a history of providing mortgages and will continue to provide more unique financing for projects in the Hill District. Clayco Capital has committed and will continue to invest equity capital to, for stable capital stacks that will, that will actually look at bringing the capital stacks that do not primarily rely on government grants and foundation grants. I'm not saying that these grants are important, but these grants should be in, to enhance projects, not to launch developments. We want to fix the problem to make sure that we get to the goal of sustainable economic development in the Hill District and to empower the entrepreneurs and developers in the Hill District to redevelop the Hill. However, community reinvestment and involvement does not just stop at that capital stack. As Bomani mentioned, we are implementing a program of mentorship, of shared resources. We uniquely have a developer of national scale and, and, and skill in Wuchini, Poland, who is willing to mentor developers to get to the point where they can build their businesses and they can grow into strong growing institutional quality developers, which will, will have an impact for generations to come in the Hill District and around the Pittsburgh area. Next slide, please. We don't only just want to work with invest in real estate. We invest the community beyond this and look for opportunities to help and provide support for more than just developers. The reinvestment program will include and provide food and beverage incubation for potential restaurateurs. Live Nation will provide facilities for local entertainment and concession industry. The kiosk will provide important food and beverage and retail incubation for business owners in the Hill District. And public arts installations to display the works of local artists and, uh, and fabricators. These are all extremely important in building community and building a business community that is sustainable that will tap into the unmet demand of the Hill District and build an economic environment that can thrive. Next slide, please. Our partnership, as we've said time and time again, has a holistic view of investment and reinvestment. With at least a 12-year commitment to the Hill District, we strongly believe that we can only be successful if we bring increased economic vitality to the middle and upper hill. That means not only investing in real estate and in businesses, but most, most importantly, investing in people and Hill District residents. We plan to partner with the community to build an environment for the Hill residents to thrive and prosper in a redeveloped neighborhood. This reinvestment program will achieve this by providing services such as credit for prayer programs for residents, financial literacy programs, STEM scholarships and internships for young people, AI robotics and coding summer camps, 
the tax diversion with the parking tax diversion will provide funds for down payments assistance on homes. There'll be funds for repairs on roofs, windows, and insulations for homes. We will look at home equity credit lines for homeowners. And we'll also provide funds to rehab existing housing stock in the hill. We're taking an approach that makes us at a point where we can provide the hill district with the type of environment, the type of support, and the type of capital to build a thriving community. We are very proud of that, not only because of our commitment to the Hill District, but because we believe that this is the type of placemaking that makes lives better. And so this investment program goes far beyond buildings and businesses. It's an investment in the people of the Hill District. And we are looking forward to being members of this neighborhood and this community for many, many years to come. And now I hand it over to Boris Kaplan, Senior VP of Development for Puccini Poland Group. Thank you for that introduction, Amici and, and, and Chris and, and Bomani. Um, for the past three years, I've been the day-to-day um, -day executive on this project on the Lower Hill for the Puccini Poland Group. And my goal over the next few minutes is to provide a summary of our prior and our current planning and engagement efforts I remember attending BPG's very first CSIP EMC meeting back in the fall of 2018. And I've attended every one since uh, uh, that, that we've been president in, since, ever since then. I remember at that first meeting, we discussed, uh, we discussed a, a look ahead 10 years from now and, um, and, and how we wanted to envision a project that we can all be proud of. Much as you did Bomani earlier, looking into the future, uh, we tried to do that back in 2018 collectively, both the developer new to the project, as well as the senior stakeholders from the Hill District. I think that was an incredible place for us to start, and we've made a lot of progress since that point. Uh, this is on the next slide, please. So I'm very excited to have a project that's so close to realization, given how many projects across the country uh, have not been able to move forward into the strong headwinds of the pandemic. Not only do we have a project, but we have one that's a true catalyst after which so much additional investment and community reinvestment can follow. A little bit on the chronology and the history. Early on, the development team worked with Gensler to update plans for an overall mixed use development. When we had progress to report, we met at the nearby Energy Innovation Center in large public forums to introduce ourselves, to introduce our team, and to hear direct concerns from residents. So many of those conversations focused on opportunities, which is why so much of our discussion today echoes those very concerns and focus on opportun focuses on opportunities. Along the way, we tried to update our website. We reached out through newsletters. And most importantly, we had a lot of meetings direct with business owners, with residents, and stakeholders to advance the project. Next slide, please. Bill mentioned earlier that we've made a pretty significant submission of all of our uh, engagement materials. No, I didn't think you wanted eggs. You'd be like, I can't have this and that mix, I'll be pooping. <laughs> you can keep going, please. Thank you. So uh, of, the, of the submissions we've made today, uh, perhaps one of the most important uh, single pages of, of documentation is the one that's on the screen today in front of you right now. That is the statement of affirmation from the Community Collaboration and Implementation Plan. Chris Puccini's signature is on this affirmation. Since so much of the reinvestment uh, plan will be realized as we advance this project further, we could demonstrate with this single document and of course, with our diligent follow-up, that reinvestment was more than just a series of promises. This affirmation meant that we were contractually bound to implement a world-class revitalization plan. And I'd like to read this very straightforward affirmation so we're all on the same page together. As a developer for a portion of the development site, 
The undersigned endorses the lower hill, sorry, this lower hill redevelopment community collaboration and implementation plan, and will use commercially reasonable efforts to collaborate on its implementation, signed April of 2019. And after we sign that affirmation, back in April of 2019, um, we proceeded to go into imme immediate negotiations with an incredible anchor tenant and a partner for the redevelopment of the Lower Hill and the revitalization of the Greater Hill District. That's First National Bank. Next slide, please. The f and Financial Center project was announced in December 2019, and we accelerated the engagement efforts in accordance with having a real and time-sensitive project that was quickly moving through pre-development. We then went into 2020, and 2020 was obviously a very challenging year, uh, and, and it was a year during which we fought to save the project and to better define the full scope of our reinvestment. I won't read all the particular meetings that we had with community members that are listed on, on this slide, but uh, I will say that we worked together to advance the goals of the CSIP and to deliver the tangible benefits to residents and to businesses on the Hill District that Chris and Bomani and Amici just talked so powerfully about. We built a more detailed community impact plan, and then we secured our preliminary takedown approvals last May. I think we can move to the next slide, please. And now we find ourselves in 2021 and our big moment. Our team, for whom I'm so incredibly grateful, has grown in quantity, in quality, and certainly with increasing local flavor. Our ability to collaborate on project implementation has improved vastly as more and more and more members of the team are made up of longtime Hill District residents and leaders in the Pittsburgh business and nonprofit community. I can think of a recent example from a CSIP EMC meeting where we had um, Janae Smith, who uh, is from E Holdings and is um, in charge with leading our M and WBE plans. We were talking about all the progress that we were making and stakeholders challenged us to make progress beyond what was on paper. How can we do that? The suggestion was look outside the region, look nationally for additional sub subcontractors, find more opportunity. I'm happy to say that we followed the EMC's advice and we recently put under contract, as Bomani mentioned, the EMSDC to do just that, to take our plans further and to extend the impact of our reinvestment. Next slide, please. I see the images on the screen now that demonstrate this full range of platforms that we've used to share project and reinvestment details. Uh, during these presentations, uh, as exhibited in the upper left-hand corner, we heard concerns about minority ownership, minority project leadership, minority contracts, cultural legacy in the design and implementation of the plan. And we've worked very, very hard to make the plan even better. In good faith, we've conducted an extensive community process, and that process was built upon years of prior planning that preceded us. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, I would say that we have engaged, we are engaging now, and we'll continue to engage to implement the best possible project. Our conversations with contractors are accelerating. Chris, you mentioned that what comes next for us is putting under contract tens of millions of dollars of minority and women-owned uh, contracts to build and operate the world-class F&B Financial Center. Our efforts to engage the community are getting stronger and stronger. And later this month, Bomani, you mentioned, we'll have that first source center open at 1835 Center Avenue. We have a great project that has gotten better over time. We need to, and we're ready to move on the F&B Financial Center and to send into full motion these full, uh, to send into full motion these time-sensitive revitalization and reinvestment efforts. And with that, uh, I'd like to hand hand off to Peter Stubb, who will be covering the next section of the presentation on project design and project programming. 
Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Boris. Um, you know, I'm happy, really happy to have this opportunity to talk about the design for parcels G1 and G4 um, with you today. Uh, and I'm, I'm like Boris and the rest of the team. I'm very proud to be part of this this team and and the uh, this amazingly impactful project, starting with the work on the master plan in in 2019. Uh, in the image on the screen, uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Um, yeah, this image uh, depicts the tower in the context of the master plan vision that was, you know, worked on over the course of those years. Uh, and it's seen as part of a vibrant, robust, mixed use development fronting on a new public green space, what you see in the foreground, uh, which is uh, a shared place for people to come together in a completely new setting within the context of the hill and, and the city itself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, briefly, um, you know, the, the, the tower is around uh, 420 feet in height and 560,000 square feet at 26 uh, stories. And it is a speculative commercial uh, office building um, with contiguous open space. So there's a lot of detail in there, but that's the high level uh, information. Next slide, uh, which leads us to, you know, where, where this project sits. Um, you know, the G, uh, block G, is uh, in the pink parcel, which is the northeast most, uh, northwest most parcel in this 28 acre development. Uh, the initial infrastructure has been uh, constructed in accordance with the PLDP, uh, but what is essentially a series of large parking fields, as you see in the images on the right, um, uh, represents the kind of vacant nature of the present condition, which lacks a uh, program or spaces for people, which uh, you know, on the next slide, when we look at these photos, uh, the context of this site has tremendous potential on the edge of downtown, um, but also uh, right on Wiley Avenue and a direct connection into the Hill District. And so this project will be a catalyst uh, for a new people-centered vision, which on the next slide uh, really starts here with this diagram uh, from our uh, master plan um, explorations, which in essence reestablishes Wiley as a physical and cultural heart of, of the lower hill. Uh, the green arrow represents the central importance of Wiley Avenue in this plan uh, with the G4, G1, G4 parcels literally fronting on Wiley Avenue and that strong connection direct into the hill is, is there. And, um, and also with Washington Place and the Cap Park um, immediately uh, adjacent, um, provides a strong uh, tie into downtown. Uh, so at its core, the project is built around the idea of community and connectivity. Next slide. Uh, and you see in this slide, the actual master plan vision itself. Um, G1 and G4 are highlighted uh, on the image there to, for, for context. But um, you know, this project really uh, can be the start to uh, that bold vision that you see here in this plan as part of a larger holistic open space design, planned with a diverse mix of spaces and uses, uh, spanning from the Cat Park all the way up to Crawford Street, uh, bridging the upper hill to downtown and connecting the, the tower and plaza to this vibrant uh, ecosystem. You know, we imagine Wiley as a cultural connector with these activated open spaces all along its length. Every block in these 28 acres ultimately has a direct frontage on this connective uh, public green space. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just dialing into the, the particulars. If you think about the so for reference, downtown is sort of bottom right in this image and the north of the page is um, looking up towards the hill district itself. You can see the primary frontages along Washington and Bedford. It's a highly visible and accessible location uh, to the broader city and to the community for this, uh, this uh, speculative mixed use office building. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this plan uh, just goes into a little bit more detail. You're gonna to start to pick up on what the character of the spaces that sit adjacent to the tower and Lisa and, and Lakeisha are gonna talk more about that. Um, but the, 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 the graphic here is really representative of, of a really vibrant kind of uh, public space that's really integrated into the building, which we'll talk about in the series of the next slides. Uh, if you go to the next one, please, you can see the, uh, the plan of, of the building imposed on that image and showing the connectivity of the retail spaces to the plaza uh, on uh, the upper plaza labeled as G1, G4. Also the lobby and the retail uh, plaza down off of Washington Street and Bedford intersection. Um, 
So really, you know, connecting into that tissue, uh, the fabric of the city. And also one other thing to point out is uh, in this plan, there's a, there's a terrorist envisioned on the, um, on the podium level of the building that will overlook onto the plazas and also to the river uh, to the north. Next slide, please. So just real briefly, um, you know, walk through major compositional elements of the building's massing and, and facade. So we really envision this building as a, as a base middle top um, uh, typology. So you have this kind of uh, lifted middle section that exposes a, a really transparent base that allows the, the building and the streets and plazas to really interact with one another. And then there's this extension at the top that really represents kind of the way the building meets the sky. Um, and so it has this very, kind of knitted to the ground, knitted to the sky uh, concept. Next slide. Next. Just spinning around the building here. Next slide again, please. Uh, and um, to the next slide. And so, uh, you know, as the first building in the Lower Hill redevelopment and, and really the closest building to downtown, this has an opportunity to establish this location as a destination uh, with the opportunity to, to initiate a whole new uh, uh, level of development here. Um, it's a unique opportunity in the Pittsburgh skyline. It's highly visible. Um, in reality, there's not a bad view uh, from all directions, and it has the opportunity to really be a gateway and, and a signature tower that draws people to this location and making it a successful project. You know, ultimately, also, you know, this this building has, uh, you know, it's differentiated in the marketplace um, because of the, the type of uh, building that it is. That it, the, the kind of views and, and uh, daylight that one will uh, be afforded from within uh, will be quite incredible. And the next series of slides that we'll walk through pretty quickly is just um, uh, how the building meets the ground, as I mentioned, you know, this idea of this kind of transparent base, because it's really about the connectivity to the spaces that are really here for the community. Um, streets and plazas kind of knit themselves you know, into, into that lobby that you'll see here, maximizing green space on the G4 and G1 plazas. So this is like an aerial view looking down from, from above, um, over center. If you go to the next slide, uh, again, that idea of the highly visible lobby um, that is here envisioned from one of the steps terraces that rises up to the, um, the upper plaza. So this variety of activity. Uh, the next slide uh, gives you a sense of the pathway. So it's all about kind of creating pathways. Um, so from the Washington Place uh, uh, Plaza, the Washington Place and Bedford corner, a view up towards the upper plaza, the building's entry on the left. And the next slide, um, kind of hovering back up again over the Bedford and uh, Washington Place intersection. Um, you know, there's, there's a great crossing at this location that stitches the building into downtown. Uh, the retail space that anchors the corner there um, with that, uh, you can see the stepping uh, plaza uh, that takes you up into the uh, upper plaza um, in the background there. Next slide. If I could just interrupt you for a minute, is mm -hmm. the commission um, had some specific requests for additional information at the pre-briefing? So if you're covering a slide that's changed or okay. You want to point it out specifically it now would be a good time as you're going through so great uh well i'll be getting to those in a second yep. yeah yeah peter i think we want to specifically focus on bedford uh it's one of the things i should have mentioned at the outset because the, the commission was was interested yeah. in so. so so if you go back if you go back to that slide then on bedford um you know what, what you're seeing there is the uh you know the street trees along the the edge of the street you can see the how the uh the crosswalk intersects, they're, they're indicated there in the white stripes that take you right to the corner that leads you to the retail space um, that is on that corner there. And um, there's a planting strip adjacent to the, uh, the building's base, which uh, is envisioned to be seen as an extension of the plaza that meets the building on the other side, essentially coming through and, and providing that buffer and creating a really nice pedestrian environment as you walk up the Bedford Street um, pathway. Um, the next slide just uh, it takes you around to the upper plaza, looking back towards the building and the downtown in the background. You know, it's a high performance office building, uh, which um, we think is going to provide a, a state of the art workplace environment in this in this market. Um, next slide. Again, a view from the upper plaza, looking back towards that uh, that lobby and the openness and and. Uh, interconnectedness of interior and exterior spaces. 
Um, next slide, please. And uh, you know, this is uh, this next couple of slides just really contextually talk about the massing materiality and and sort of not only is there a conversation about surface expression that we'll get into in a second, but this idea of depth and and um, and reveals and relief in the facade as well. Um, so you're seeing sort of a foreground and background composition. Um, next slide, please. And how using articulation of the glass typologies and surfaces to kind of articulate the building. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, something we, we worked a lot with uh, staff to, um, to achieve a facade that, that was meeting the requirements of the building. And I'll walk through a, a series of, of slides very um, just at a high level to kind of explain some of the strategies of the facade development. Um, and this one in particular talks about the, the coming together of many elements such as uh, fins that project out uh, from the facade creating uh, relief to differing glass types that create a sense of pattern on the facade as well. If you go to the next slide, you'll see in detail um, some of how, so the, the one on the left is just a kind of a single floor detail and showing the, the kind of surface articulation and rhythms that will be seen um, in this facade. Um, the next slide gives you kind of a rendered perspective uh, from a couple of different vantage points of how that might might appear to the occupants of, of the spaces around the building. Um, and then the next slide is kind of gets into a little bit of, of some of the conversations around the concealment of the garage spaces, which are actually incorporated in the podium of the building, so the third and fourth levels. Um, and that, the garage actually sits behind the glass itself. Um, and in this image on the right, you're seeing a patterning to the glass that will help um, kind of screen the perception of, of the parking spaces within the building um, through, a, through a, a patterning in the glass. And you also note in that view that at the, the base of the building where the building meets the ground, that kind of um, articulated uh, landscape uh, feature along the building's edge. The next slide um, also responds to a comment from the, the, the briefing, which is about the materiality of the screening of the garage and the podium. And here is the, um, you know, on the right, you're seeing a detailed elevation view of a metal screen that has varied patterns to it and some fin articulation that keeps the kind of rhythm of the facade moving through this. Uh, so there's a metal screen over top of a stone base that adds a low level of richmen, uh, um, of richness to, to the, uh, uh, some of the materials that are uh, envisioned. So if we look at that same view on the left, and we point to the materials, you, there's gonna be a variety of perforated metal panel that will be uh, finished in a non-weathering uh, material. They will not rust. They will be designed to be uh, you know, in the, in the palette of the building along with the metal fins and the stone uh, facade material that you see in the, in the middle image. Um, and that all complements you know, the glass facade, which is kind of represented by that, that image in the middle on the bottom and the idea of kind of this metal detail that adds a level of articulation to both the garage and the glass facade. And they all kind of work together holistically uh, around the facade of the building. And the next slide, uh, we, we kind of uh, switch into the stormwater management strategy. Uh, you're seeing a diagram on the screen that uh, shows uh, all the, uh, the, the three primary features, uh, if you will, of the stormwater management approach here that is uh, designed to reduce stormwater for the entire G block uh, uses three primary features, uh, maximizing uh, pervious surfaces. So, um, you know, grasses, native ground covers, vegetation paired with strategic shaping and sizing and sequencing of hardscape elements um, to uh, increase the porosity. Uh, integrating stormwater management as an effective element of the landscape through terrace planters. This allows for you know infra infiltration to happen at each of these beds as they step down the site. And but the, the big one is the sort of a major infiltration bed located beneath uh, the event long on parcel uh, G4, uh, which is really just a series of perforated pipes that'll infiltrate the the first inch and uh, a quarter of rainfall as as is required by the PLDP. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
uh, and then the sustainability goals of this project that we're tracking to lead Stillbrook currently. Um, the, the approach, as you can see here, uh, gives us a five point buffer, uh, which we're comfortable with. And, and there are actually a couple, you know, maybes in, in the mix that, that, that will help us um, as we go through this review pro process. Uh, and I think notably as well, the development team, you know, they've committed to the PGH uh, 2030 pledge, uh, which you see here in this uh, signed document. Uh, and with that, I will hand uh, over the mic to Cindy Jampol with Trans Associate to walk through some of the uh, finer details of, of the project. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Cindy Jampol from Trans Associates. And uh, that's not my slide. OK, here we go. All right, I'll provide just a, uh, a limited overview of the transportation study. Uh, which is consistent with the transportation study that was done for the overall master plan um, for the entire site and which is currently under review as an update to that approved master plan. This figure indicates the area of study uh, for the transportation study as specified by the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, that is DOMI, uh, with the site called out and all of the study intersections indicated by little traffic signals for those that are signalized, blue dots for unsignalized, and green for the access into the block. The project itself provides a parking garage of about 108 parking spaces. Um, about 300 spaces will be removed from the parking lot that currently occupies uh, the site, and those things were considered in the uh, transportation study. Next slide, please. This site is well located for multimodal opportunities, and this, this busy little slide shows all of the public transit that is available in the immediate area with the uh, routes and route numbers indicated, uh, east busway shown, the T, and, uh, and this just provides uh, information about the regional opportunities for the use of public transit uh, to the site. Next slide, please. This slide indicates the bicycle facilities, both present and future on the site within the area in the form of on-street on bike routes, uh, protected bike lane and cautionary bike routes. And we've got healthy ride stations uh, shown as uh, aqua rectangles as well. On the site, there will be um, an interior uh, bike room that'll be accessed from Bedford Avenue, as well as exterior bike racks as shown uh, on both sides of the property. Next slide, please. After a lot of analysis, we did come up with a program of recommended improvements. These improvements include the impact of the BRT system and changes that are anticipated in um, traffic in the area related to changes in the Fifth and Forbes corridor, which will cause traffic to relocate in some cases in their east-west travels, as well as addition of the 108 space plus minus uh, parking garage and removal of the 300 spaces on the Block G site. Uh, the impacts and improvements extend from Washington the Place up to uh, Crawford, with Crawford being the point where uh, vehicles passing through the neighborhood uh, would enter into the site area. Um, so as shown here, we're indicating that at the traffic signals, optimization of traffic signal timings will serve to um, improve movement of vehicles while also providing for pedestrian crossing conditions and decrease of congestion and queuing in the area. Two, two Cindy, would you focus um, on impacts on Crawford Avenue, please, both parking and traffic? And how oh, that sure. Will affect the residents. Right on Crawford, uh, there is uh, there is residential permit parking on the east side of Crawford, and there will be no change to residential permit parking 
uh, whatsoever on Crawford uh, or in any other street in the residential permit parking area. The um, development on the site is anticipated to meet its own parking demand on the site. As far as traffic flow in the neighborhood, compared to what's, what's there now, and there are vehicles that move through Crawford Avenue to access the parking on the Block G site, uh, we anticipate a very small difference in the number of vehicles because we're minusing 300 spaces and plusing 108 um, of typical uh, weekday travelers, basically. Uh, so we're looking at a change of maybe in the range of 10 to 20 vehicles an hour through those intersections due to the changes in the parking as previously described. Uh, I have one more box on there, which um, uh, calls out the improvements for access on Bedford Avenue. And those are shown in the next slide. Okay, on this slide, um, we're looking from the bottom of the hill to the top, moving from left to right. Uh, there will be two driveways separated by a five foot pedestrian refuge area as access to the site. The lower or westerly driveway will be the, the uh, driveway for passenger cars into and out of the parking garage, one lane in each direction and controlled by a stop sign on the exit onto, uh, uh, onto Bedford Avenue. Then so there'll be the be able to access the site inbound on Bedford. Oh, no, uh, not unless you can fly. Uh, there is a very significant uh, median with brick, a raised median on Bedford, which precludes any movement from uh, westbound Bedford Avenue into this parking garage. So the garage driveway and the loading driveway will both function as right in, right out driveways only only accessing the eastbound lanes on Bedford Avenue. Uh, then we have the five foot pedestrian uh, respite area and followed by the driveway to the loading area, which is shown furthest to the east, which will also be controlled by um, a stop sign. The loading area is not going to be accommodating tractor trailers, but uh, up to a size of a uh, 40 foot single unit truck. That is, that's, that's the short course. We have one more slide uh, down on Washington Place. There will be a pull off area in front of the main entrance to the building on Washington Place. And you can see that indicated here on the figure. Uh, in addition, in order to um, prohibit people from merging multiple lanes across when they leave the pull-off area, uh, there will be uh, delineators uh, installed as shown on this drawing so that when one drives into the rightmost lane, which is a right turn lane, one can either pull into the pull-off area or continue up to the signal and make a right onto Bedford Avenue, but it will preclude the movement of uh, the horizontal movement of traffic across multiple traffic lanes and will provide access for vehicles that want to uh, pick up and drop off uh, in front of the building. There will be signage and pavement markings that go with that. Um, we have done some preliminary investigations of construction management. That seems kind of at the the tail end of things right now in this rather lengthy presentation. So I would suggest that we go on to slide 72 and Lisa Dugan will continue from there. Thank you. There you go, right there. Thank you, Cindy. And good afternoon. Um, so we are looking at a um, the vision of connected and continuous open space, um, and of which G1 and G4 open space um, is really an essential component um, in all of this. If you look at the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll see Cat Park, which is currently under construction. And then along Washington Place, um, 
there are two existing crosswalks that are actually connecting directly to our site. Um, and then I just want to touch on as well, um, just as an overview, that some of those um, cultural and historic uh, elements of Cat Park are also going to be, and you'll see in later parts of the presentation, but threaded throughout um, the, the open space of the G1 and G4 parcels. Next slide, please. So this site plan really um, provides an overview. If we start at Washington Place um, and work our way kind of up the screen. Um, on the G4 parcel in the center of the screen, there are a series of uh, low walls and terraced uh, plantings that really extend from Washington Place all the way up to the upper level plaza. And that really transitions that 25 feet of grade change. Uh, once we get up to that uh, central core and basically the center of your screen, you'll see we have the Great Lawn, um, which is really the heart of the open space. Um, it's framed by um, trees, there's kiosks, and it's really um, framed on all sides by those pedestrian pathways. Um, if we uh, continue further north, you'll see there's a, a plaza which provides additional uh, outdoor dining opportunities and really um, kind of important uh, socialization and spill out space um, with all of the programming of uh, Logan Street as being a festival street. Um, and then as we move back towards the G1 uh, tower, um, adjacent to the lobby, there's also a gathering space, uh, movable furniture underneath kind of a shaded grove of trees. Um, and then I'm gonna move us back down to Washington Place. You can see there's a central stair that's really bisecting um, those terraced uh, planting areas and the building. And I want to also bring to attention, um, which was a comment from the prior meeting, um, we have also included an additional stair connection on the right farthermost side of, of the project um, in between the G4 parcel and what was being shown as the Wiley Avenue right of way. So there's stairs and retaining wall there so that you can have that continuous connection. Um, there are gathering spaces that I'll touch on um, that are kind of carved throughout those G4 terraces, but I, I think that's a really important um, piece to note. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to take just a, a minute uh, to walk through the accessibility and the pathways because I think this is a really important part of this story. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, the Cap Park. Uh, at the utmost bottom, you'll, you'll just kind of see that. And then the two connections, uh, existing crosswalks from Washington Place. And once you cross over from Washington Place, you can enter the site. There's either a stair connection or as you can see with the, the red arrows indicated near the 815 um, marker, that there's an integrated stair and ramp. Again, we're trying to create um, kind of the seamless um, and universal um, experience to the site. So if we go up that, um, that ramped uh, or stepped and ramped walkway, um, at that 815 marker, you'll see there's a green arrow. We can enter in the Washington Place lobby. There are inside the building elevators that you can then take up to the upper level lobby, which will transition you right out onto the upper level plaza. And you'll notice all those red dashed lines and arrows all around that, um, that great, um, that great lawn area and also to the overlook, uh, which you can see at, um, on there adjacent to um, the great lawn. So all of that is at the, the same elevation. We do show in black, it looks like a zigzag coming from Logan Street, uh, a temporary um, accessible connection from that upper plaza to Logan Street. So you can kind of transfer um, from Washington Place, move through the building through a series of lobby elevators up to that upper plaza. Again, this is that um, initial pathway condition. I also want to point out down by Washington Place, uh, again, by that 815 um, note on the plan, that we do also provide accessible access to um, some of the really significant um, kind of uh, terrace seating and gathering spaces that are happening there. So that, again, that experience is, can be um, enjoyed and shared by a variety of users, um, that it's not restricted um, due to stairs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this was the, um, the retaining wall that I had touched on in the earlier plans. This is forming that edge between the uh, right-of-way of Wiley 
Avenue and the G4 parcel. Um, and again, this is addressing a comment from the um, prior meeting. Um, really this, the wall also provides additional opportunities for um, art engagement as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is providing our view, uh, the big view <laughs> uh, in the future, uh, showing how um, we are connecting across uh, the G1 and G4 parcels and really utilizing um, and making uh, meaningful connections to the F2 accessible routes um, that are showing on the kind of right portion of your screen. So again, we, we have you know, stairs that are flanking either side of those G4 terraces, but at each of those landings, we're directly connecting to those future connections. So we've planned for it today and can connect in the future. Um, and then again, the, the plaza space is, maintains you know, that um, same elevation and, and kind of continuous access throughout. Next slide, please. So this is a section through the G4 Terrace. Um, you can see how these series of low walls and plantings are kind of stepping your way in five foot increments up to that upper level plaza and that overlook, um, which really provides those kind of great views out over the city. Uh, each of those planting areas also performs um, a nice opportunity for not only native and adaptive plants, but again, uh, it's important in our stormwater management strategy as well uh, in terms of you know, opportunities to infiltrate water. Now, at each of these terrace areas, again, we're connecting to, you know, staircases on the left and right side of, of either side of the terrace. But in the future, we're also making important connections to the future F2 accessible routes as well. Um, additionally, along the terraces, they're not just pass-throughs, we've really carved out these um, little intimate gathering spaces. Um, there's flexible seating, permeable paving, you're underneath the trees. We, I think it's really important to note that, you know, all the programming isn't just being planned for that great lawn, that we've really thoughtfully tried to consider um, activating and programming spaces throughout the site and at different scales, because not everything's going to be at that large, great lawn scale, that it's important to also have spaces um, at, at smaller and different scales. And Lakeisha is going to really uh, hone in on uh, all the programming um, of these spaces. Next slide, please. Now, this is an aerial view. Um, you can look uh, off to the right of the screen. You can see that overlook, um, which is really, again, taking advantage of those great views out over the city. Um, also provides some nice views over, um, be, over the basically tapestry of landscape below you uh, at those G4 terraces. And you can see those hints of um, wood seating. Uh, again, those are um, part of that intimate, you know, spaces that have been carved out, places for gathering, places for lounging. And you'll see those wood elements kind of threaded throughout these, um, throughout these uh, terraces and then those elements kind of um, being a cohesive link throughout even the upper level plaza. And then uh, the image on the, the left of the screen, you'll, you'll just see it pointing out um, movable furniture, permeable paving um, uh, underneath those trees. Next slide, please. Uh, this view is if you're standing at Washington Place and you're looking up at uh, the major stair um, that's connecting from Washington Place up to that upper plaza and Great Lawn and then ultimately terminates in that uh, Logan Street um, dining and, and seating plaza. And, you know, on either side, you're, you're flanked by these um, planters of low walls and, and, and sloped um, basically sloped greenery and, and trees and planting in those areas. Next slide. And I touched on this earlier in the accessibility slide, but it is important to just note um, from Washington Place that we do have um, an integrated uh, stair and walk to really create a unified accessible experience. We don't wanna separate out users. We really want to create this seamless connection uh, for people um, and that unified experience. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the site furnishings, uh, it's important to note that uh, the open space uh, of G1 and G4 really touches on uh, four 
uh, overall typologies of, of seating. We have movable furniture. We have uh, the wood seating elements that are located on the G4 terraces and are in the forms of seat walls. Uh, we have um, fixed dining, and then we have uh, fixed uh, benches that are both backed and backless. Next slide, please. And then our, uh, the paving of our plaza, uh, we have planned you know, for concrete unit pavers. You'll also see um, at the bottom left corner of the screen, there's um, imagery of exposed aggregate concrete and broom finish uh, concrete. Those, are, those two elements are um, actually requirements of the PLDP in terms of the right of way. There's a, a whole prescribed uh, patterning based on those tree planters and how the uh, aggregate concrete and plain concrete uh, interact on the right of way in the streetscape there. Um, we've touched on the permeable granular material underneath the trees and the G4 terraces. Um, and I just also wanted to note uh, additionally that we are being very thoughtful in terms of um, in terms of the selection of the hardscape materials um, and really uh, making efforts to reduce our um, urban heat, uh, excuse me, urban heat island effects. Next slide, please. And then lastly, just uh, wanted to touch on um, the kind of lighting concepts for the landscape. Uh, the top left image kind of gives you um, a feel for the open spaces uh, towards dusk as things are starting to be illuminated. Um, we're really looking at um, integrating a family of, of pedestrian fixtures, you know, from um, you know, larger scale of, of illuminating kind of that great lawn space versus uh, to kind of smaller, more intimate scaled lighting at some of those um, smaller seating areas. Um, it, it is really important that we're creating a space that is really comfortable for people to use at different times of the day that people feel you know, safe, it's inviting, um, and that the lighting is, um, is the lighting that we're selecting is, um, you know, beneficial to the landscape, but it's also tied to um, and complementing the um, programming and activation that's happening um, on the site. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Lakeisha, who's really going to um, dive further into the activation and the programming. Next slide. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, um, I am Keisha Bird, working as an architectural design consultant with BPG and the Lower Hill Development Team, specifically with the design activation and programming of the open space, which includes portions of uh, the G1 uh, as well as the G4 sites, as previously mentioned. Um, it's just to note, it's, it's essential that we extended the design scope and intent to not only include the activation and programming of the open space, which includes uh, the G1 and G4 park, uh, sites, but to center the open space, um, thus creating um, opportunities, scalable opportunities, as well as immediate space for social, recreational, as well as cultural uses. Um, the intent of the open space is um, as kind of identified through the previous uh, slides and discussions is to connect the Lower Hill site back to the historic Hill District, as well as re reestablish connections, uh, cultural connections, sustainable connections, economic, um, as well as pedestrian connections between the downtown site, as we can see, uh, you know, with the activation of the cab park through our sites, uh, G1 and G4, back up into the historic Hill District. Um, uh, just want to note by reestablishing these connections and ultimately activating the open space, we, you know, we were presented with the opportunity to really elevate Wiley Avenue in particular um, as this Main Street and heritage site, uh, uh, this people-centered or pedestrian-focused connection between downtown and uh, the historic Hill District. And as evident by the diagram on the screen here, you can kind of see that spine that flows through the center of the screen where uh, that is Wiley Avenue. Um, and it has become a core element um, of the site that is both anchored and activated by the open space. Um, and all of this starts with uh, the, the G1 and G4 parcel, which fronts uh, that Wiley Avenue spine, and, uh, spine. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, 
this this uh, image had been shared previously, but just to uh, further reemphasize kind of uh, specifically around the activation and programming and um, how that starts with being able to identify and design uh, for both economic and cultural opportunities, both within the built and the the, the lands uh, the built environment and the landscape um, at varying scales. Uh, uh, Following, we'll talk more about specific opportunities, but we just want to start by just asking the question, how do we create and sustain presence here in the Lower Hill site? And, and as mentioned, this starts by centering the open space and reestablishing those connections uh, between uh, the site uh, downtown, starting with the Cap Park um, and, and connecting back to the historic Hill District. Uh, as And again, just activating, uh, utilizing activation strategies um, that open up the site beyond your, the traditional nine to five office building concept. And so the question is, how do we do this? Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the, the goal is to introduce both fluid and flexible spaces um, that allow us to incubate scalable ideas and concepts um, that provide lower barriers and, and risk um, and, and giving us the infrastructure to incubate art entrepreneurs and local businesses. Uh, we begin to feel and live the culture through these opportunities, um, which go beyond just leasable spaces, but really think about other opportunities as well. And what we are uh, illustrating here are just, uh, we're calling out different opportunities, both directly within our sites, the G1 and G4, but how it also connects to a larger narrative. So just to provide some context, as you can see, from the, uh, from the previous uh, diagram and, and, and just really laying out the site and the different elevations of the site, creating these different moments. We also wanna capture uh, the, the culture through different opportunities. Um, you know, early morning uh, opportunities with like yoga on the lawn or, you know, inviting the youth out for chess, um, chess and checkers and just being able to be out in the, the, the public space. We also look at opportunities uh, to um, activate the, the corridors uh, with food truck opportunities. And uh, several of these other are just calls out, call outs to kind of start to illustrate what the opportunity is when we activate the open space and connect that to the spine, if you will. Um, other things to note, um, there'll be events that will be activated at the cat park that we'll connect to. Um, and we'll speak more on that momentarily. We look at, um, creating open space opportunities allows us to uh, engage with people um, in the public realm, which is really the first layer of engagement. So by being able to, uh, to provide daytime concerts, you know, the, the hill is filled with uh, many artists, performance, performing artists um, and, and other, other type of artists and creating spaces where they can be seen is, 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 is vital to this, to this development. Um, one thing that was mentioned earlier uh, is these kiosks that are scattered throughout the site and will be activated on the, the G4 parcel um, at the, I think that's the uh, southeast corner. Um, where there, there's an opportunity for us to provide um, kiosks of varying scales where, you know, from pop-up opportunities as well as uh, full service kiosks. Uh, the opportunity there is that we can engage uh, people who, uh, businesses and entrepreneurs and, and help incubate uh, these opportunities with lower risk and scales. And just to reemphasize with these, with these kiosks specifically, um, creating these full scale opportunities right there immediately on the street, um, it captures a different type of audience and creates a different presence that goes beyond the nine to five, you know, office building concept, if you will, is something that can be lived day and night. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, and again, this is just really creates the infrastructure uh, to incubate our entrepreneurs and local businesses uh, by activating uh, night markets and pop-up plazas and food trucks, if you will, um, and creating this culture that can be lived around the clock. Um, it, it really creates an opportunity uh, for us to um, really include, uh, create opportunities for inclusion with our local entrepreneurs, um, black, and uh, black and brown artists, as well as to incubate small and diverse businesses. Um, and again, what we're illustrating here is just the day and night opportunities that will be created. And, and we can even extend that to say, you know, 365 um, opportunities uh, 
you know, we, we, we see examples like that across the city now with, for example, the holiday market that is uh, uh, downtown in the Market Square op, uh, area. Um, we want to create opportunities like that, you know, for our neighborhood as well. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Ultimately, what we're doing is creating value, opportunity, and presence. And with that being said, I would like to reintroduce uh, Dr. Kimberly Ellis, who will uh, further speak on art, cultural legacy, and activation. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Peter and Lisa. You did an excellent job outlining our space. Um, I'm going to be filling in a couple of gaps here and giving you um, the, the last overall view. Um, if we start on Crawford Street and we look at Wiley and Crawford, um, you see it says curtain call. Curtain call is very important because it's actually a, an old promise uh, that the Pittsburgh Penguins uh, engaged in with, uh, in our last community benefits agreement. Um, and it was supposed to be on the arena site and it, different things. Uh, there's just a big mix up. And uh, so uh, Curtain Call has been re-engaged uh, with uh, Walter Hood, the national artist, with a $2 million contract uh, working through Cosmos. And so Curtain Call is alive. It is well. It will be at Wiley and Crawford Street. So that's the picture that you see there. I wanna direct your attention to the arrow that takes you from uh, Wiley and Crawford to Freedom Corner. Freedom Corner is not shown here except for the name, but I just want you all to be clear that Freedom Corner is the space where Frankie Pace and her colleagues put up that billboard that said attention City Hall and URA, no more redevelopment beyond this point. Freedom Corner is now a public art space. Freedom Corner has been adopted by the development team to finish uh, repairs, including the kiosk, uh, the etching on the back wall, the etchings in the, uh, the center, and to provide annual maintenance of Freedom Corner. Um, that's extremely important. Um, and so going down Wiley Avenue, um, the kiosks have already been discussed uh, many times and just be very clear that they are for the arts entrepreneurs to build up their businesses with a robust footprint and to create generational wealth. Um, these kiosks are built and paid for by the development team and are items the artists won't have to manage, which is extremely important when it comes to this type of pop-up um, entrepreneurship. So, and then with regard to the open space, the open space is for daily leisure, is for small events, is for slightly larger events, and then it's for larger festivals, particularly when we focus upon the event lawn and Logan Avenue. A part of the open space will contain a large video display that was actually in Keisha's slide um, that you can have the potential to show games and other sporting events and concerts. The open space largely depends upon activation and programming. Otherwise, it's just an open space. It's just event lawn, right? Um, so it requires people. And as I said before, we are invested in people. So what is the presence? What is the presence of the lower hill? What is the presence of African-American artists? What is the presence of the entire hill? Beyond the curtain call, um, beyond the kiosk, beyond the programming, there are plans for embedded, embedded artistic renderings on hill history and culture. So you all saw the stairs. There's so much potential for um, great quotes from our favorite uh, artists and our favorite literary experts. Um, you saw the benches, you saw the chairs, you saw the lighting design, all of those aspects. Imagine a North Star constellation with our lighting design, which would be actually bigger and better and match uh, what's in Market Square. So the art, the narrative, the design, the culture, it's not always about the past, but also about the future. So um, as I go down Wiley Avenue, I'm gonna show you something else, which is we're looking into Cap Park, all right? Now Cap Park is a public park. Um, it is being finished as we speak. It's supposed to be finished in November. However, the people that worked on the Cap Park are myself, Lakeisha Bird and LaQuatcha Bonchi. And so the team is back together again to work on the urban open space. Why is that important? Because of what we created in the Cap Park. Um, so I, uh, in, let me see, 
I just want you to be mindful of this. All right, next slide. Cap Park. So this is what we, this is a part of what we created in the Cap Park. And this, these are specifically my designs, all right? So on the bottom, we have the history walls. Um, that this is features Martin Delaney. I told you about his history already, but this is the 1800s. In the 19, 1900s, I told you about Frankie Pace and that history is already there. People will be able to read that and so on and so forth. And then in the 2000s, we wanted to welcome the next generation. And this is Keisha. Keisha is our tour guide. She likes to play and dance. She likes to contemplate at night, looking up at the stars. And even though this picture is rather small, what you can't see is that she's looking up at the North Star. It's very important. She likes music and the performing arts. She likes to sit in the grass and read like many of the, of the young people will have the opportunity to do so. Um, but something smaller that you also can't see is that she's reading uh, uh, about Harriet Tubman and, and, and Martin Delaney. All right. And lastly, she's leaping her way into the future. All of these things are important. And all of these pictures are put on these, the sort of silver signs that you see. And that's because we're place making in the Cap Park. Um, so each of them say like, welcome to Wiley Avenue, or do you know about stormwater? Uh, welcome to the children's garden, things like that. All right. So we wanted to transfer some of these cultural elements from the Cap Park over to the urban open space, which we can do because we all worked on the cat part. And I specifically brought these designs and hired the illustrator and managed that process and wrote the stories. So they do have the right people. Um, so we're talking about presence here. Um, then you see the totems, uh, we'll have different lighting design. That's just, an, that's just an example of the type of art that we created on cat park. And we will do some more on the urban open space. Not exactly this design, but with that element, all right? So um, next slide. Thank you. So um, again, you see Keisha and these elements down in the, the left corner of the screen. Um, and this is important just because we're further creating the route of the Underground Railroad. Like this is not just for the Lower Hill, right? This is also about the city of Pittsburgh in general. And we definitely want to tell a story. As I started off in my historical presentation, it's time to tell a new story about Pittsburgh. It's time to tell the progressive story about Pittsburgh that for whatever reason has been um, undertold. Let's just say that. All right. So when it comes to these uh, designs, we have the Keisha element. We have uh, quotes and places where we can put um, in engravings um, and embed the art. Um, Lisa showed you how uh, the art installations could come on that wall that, that co goes down Wiley Avenue. Plenty of open space. That is an artist's canvas. That is their best dream to have just a, a blank canvas to do their art. And we are going to give it to them. Um, and then also we're gonna have a call for public art because we do want a major piece of public art there in this space. Um, so we're gonna do a call and it will be culturally responsive and internationally attractive. Um, so that is, I think almost everything. And I think the next slide, um, oh yeah, and just in terms of our kiosks, they're gonna be, they're, they'll be permanent, some will be temporary and they will be mobile. So just know about that. So when it comes to um, the tears, this, Lisa and Peter showed you these slides, but the Keisha, the Keisha signage will be something like this. I know that it looks small in, in, in this picture, but you know it will be to scale. And then the stories at the overlook, this is one part where, you know, imagine looking out over at Cat Park and learning about the history of the neighborhood and the community uh, where you're standing and having a real vision, right? For, for where you are, having an appreciation. Um, we're talking about placemaking here, all right? Um, next slide. So this, this is the overall connection to Wiley Avenue. I wanna remind you all um, that, as I said in the last presentation, the streets between Crawford and Wiley and Fullerton and Wiley and Logan or Wiley have already been developed. Those are open streets. So the last part that we have is just Logan um, over to Washington Plaza, all right? And so that's why we wanna make that urban open space and that connection to Cap Park. Um, one of the things that Lakeisha reminded you all of early on was that the connection to Wiley Avenue is meant to honor the legacy of Wiley Avenue 
um, and it was not necessarily meant to be a fully vehicular um, uh, pathway, but, but to be a pedestrian pathway to a certain point. As you all know, Wiley Avenue actually doesn't go directly to downtown. Um, it, we, it stops, you know, and it stops at the Doubletree uh, Hilton uh, downtown. And so it'll get you there, but the way that we want to get there is very important. Um, and also that Center Avenue is our main street now. You know, Wiley, Wiley was lost in that way. So Center Avenue is our main street. Center Avenue is our business corridor. And you saw a great presentation from Bomani and Am Amici um, and Chris about the Center Avenue corridor and how we're developing the Center Avenue corridor. So we're honoring Wiley Avenue and developing Center Avenue. Um, next slide. Um, these are just notes about the Lower Hill redevelopment. This is just for, for you all to have. Next slide. Same, the public art plan. Next slide. All right, so this is it, Planning Commission. I know that the, you all have been here for quite some time. Um, this is both the F&B Tower. This is G1 and G4. This is the start of our project. And we want the Planning Commission to vote yes today so that we can move forward on this project. It is time, it is time for us to write a new chapter of Pittsburgh that tells the progressive history of its past as well as its future. Let's move forward with a new vision that honors and repairs the past, that creates a better design for the future and forges a new equitable path of shared prosperity. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you listening. Thank you. Um, so at this time, we do take public testimony. I'm sure that there are people here who are waiting to te uh, testify. You can raise your hand and you'll be called in the order at which you raise your hand. Um, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. We do have some organizations that we will allow a little bit longer, but we would ask that they um, specify their testimony when they are brought into the room so that we know what to expect. Um, I, uh, when you come into the room, please state your name, your address, and then any organization that you represent. Um, and we do have a timekeeper. So let's get started with that um, uh, when you're ready. Um, actually, uh, uh, Staff, uh, planning colleagues, um, do we have any representatives, elected officials that we want to bring forward first? Sorry, Chairwoman, I'm trying to scroll through uh, the attendee list. Um, it does uh, look like we have Councilman Laval. Okay, good. Uh, that's who I was looking for. Uh, so if we want to, if, if we want to promote him uh, first and then go through public uh, testimony after that. Hey, Andrew, thank you. I'm actually in the process of picking up kids, so allow, allow the public to go, and then when okay. they're done, I'll be ready. Okay, we will do that then. All right, uh, then with that, uh, Kathleen, can we move to uh, whoever's first in public testimony? Uh, yes, we've actually got a someone from uh, the, the panelists, um, the applicant team, um, who's uh, got their hand up. Kathleen, do you want to say their name? Because I don't. Uh, think Tracy, yes, Tracy McCann's Lewis. You should be unmuted. Uh, thank you very much. Again, my name is Tracy McCann's Lewis. Address is twelve twenty one Pemberton Street, Pittsburgh, PA, one five two one two. Uh, T R A C E Y McCann's M C capital C A N T S and then Lewis capital L E W I S. I am a member of the C C I P E M C. I'm a board member. I have a, a brief statement uh, to read. Um, as a member of the CSIP Executive Management Committee, EMC, 
I can attest to the commitment by EMC membership to ensure the developer's adherence to the CSEC goals. Both FNB and Puccini Polling Group have responded to guidance from the EMC related to their responsibilities as outlined in the CSIP. Over the past year, they've improved and proven their commitment to the CSIP with respect to the first phase of the Lower Hill redevelopment, specifically the FNB Tower, MBE hiring, hiring commitments, and the First Source Center, to name a few. Community development is not easy, and a project of this magnitude is no different. The EMC has been actively reviewing the developer's community benefits plan and engaging in negotiations to oversee that the entire development is in alignment with the CSIP goals. Through these negotiations, there's been some give and some take. And while not all parties have been happy at all times, the proposed FNB Tower project is an important first step that will ignite the equitable redevelopment on the Lower Hill and offer economic community investment in the Middle and Upper Hill District after years of delays. The first phase of the Lower Hill redevelopment is worthy of advancing toward final approval by the Planning Commission and I support such approval. Being that the Hill District has suffered from disinvestment for over 70 years, I believe this project is a historic first step in the right direction. The work of the EMC will be ongoing, committed work that will oversee the entire redevelopment and not just this single project. Our work will not cease at the conclusion of today. It cannot. There is more work to be done by the developer in the future to reach the CSIP goals that we as members of the EMC are empowered to see come to fruition. This letter is signed by me, Tracy McCants Lewis, EMC board member, Kevin Acklin, EMC board member, Tyann Battle, EMC board member, Majestic Lane, EMC board member, Daniel Lavelle, EMC board member, Glenn Mahone, EMC board member, and Irvin Williams, EMC board member. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Um uh, Tracy, before you leave, uh, I'm not sure that everyone on the Planning Commission is aware of what the EMC is or what its role is. Can you just speak to that, please? Yes. Uh, so the CSIP Executive Management Committee, EMC, we oversee the adherence to the CSIP goals um, as outlined. So we work on behalf of the community um, to ensure that the CSIP goals are met by the developer and other interested parties. Thank you. Okay, uh, Leonard Havens for a second. You should be unmuted. Uh, yes, uh, good, good evening, everyone. My name is Leonard Hammonds. I am Chief of Staff for Representative Jake Wheatley, and I have a statement from the Rep. As State Representative of the 19th Legislative District and as a resident of the Hill District, I have participated in numerous discussions, meetings, and battles relating to the Lower Hill District site. Through my tenure, I've learned there is no perfect plan or process and that the true value of our work lies in the middle of our collective demands. Our goal is to help build consensus with the Penguins and their development team and the community to work together for the benefit of the Hill District. Hence, I write in support of First National Bank stepping in to make substantial investments in the neighborhood. As a community, we are ready to move forward with equitable development on the lower hill and cannot afford to wait any longer. I stand together with Councilman Daniel Lavelle and other elected officials who are supportive of advancing development of the Lower Hill while holding the development team accountable to the goals of the CSIP. I acknowledge the, the Penguins and the uh, B uh, Buccini Pollen Group together with the representatives from the community have worked in good faith over the past year during the pandemic. As a result, the development team has agreed to a substantial benefit package that will invest millions of dollars into the Greater Hill District, help create Black wealth, and provide employment for opportunities for Hill District residents. Though there is still much work left to be done, but this first step forward with First National Bank is a tremendous opportunity for us to move the needle forward. I am thankful that First National Bank has shown the willingness to be part of our community and make the commitment to invest in a historic Hill District. Now is the time for us to continue the work for a much better outcome for our residents, businesses, 
and organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janae Smith, you are unmuted. Thank you. My name is Janae Smith. I am the managing director for eHoldings. Um, I want to thank everyone today for the opportunity to express our support regarding the FNB Financial Center project. Um, eHoldings is a Hill District based business. We are a multidisciplinary MBE WB firm with expertise in community engagement, development. Um, construction management and technical services. Um, we are also part of the Bacchini Group's larger consulting team, helping to make opportunities available and transparent and inclusive for MWB businesses, excuse me, as part of this process. Um, as a firm, uh, my family, my husband, my father and I, we are committed to our community um, as both residents and business owners. And we're very passionate about the future growth and the development um, of our community that will respect and protect our historic neighborhood while moving forward our current and future residents um, toward equitable means. And so by providing investment and job opportunities on such a scale at this, on, on this scale at this very difficult time, we believe this development has the ability to greatly impact the quality of life and economic opportunities, not only for residents, but business owners in our community. We believe that um, BPG and partners have worked collaboratively and creatively to ensure inclusion of women and minority businesses from our community and the region as just one way to contribute to community wealth building that aligns with our support for this project. With that being said, we are happy um, to support this project to move a full, excuse me, to move forward immediately and ask that you consider our comment in that manner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Earl Buford, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Earl Buford. I am presently the, the president of CALE, the Council on Adult Expert and Learning. Um, but, about, but about three weeks ago, I was, a, I was the chief executive officer of Partner for Work, the local workforce government board, and also a workforce partner on said project. I am also a standing commissioner on the EORC. <clears throat> um, I am a Pittsburgh resident, um, 1909 Waterfront Place. And thank you for giving me the time to speak today. Um, I just want to say that the, I'm excited to be, have been a part in this project and the need for this project to move forward without any delay is, is necessary. Um, I've had the pleasure in my career um, of working on other major projects similar to this. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin originally, and have worked on major projects as diverse as the Milwaukee Brewers Baseball Arena, leading the workforce on that, the Milwaukee Bucks Basketball Arena, <clears throat> Uh, Northwestern Mutual Headquarter and, um, and other projects of that nature. And um, this project is on parallel, if not a further advanced than any of those projects at this point in time. Um, so really excited to have had a role and a voice in the development of this and the impact it will have in the Hill District and in the Pittsburgh greater community as a whole. And you know, with, with the ELRC's union has approval back in March, that was also another major step in getting this uh, project moving forward. So this team is focused on all the right goals and have built plans that can have the kind of impact that we all are envisioning, um, just as I've seen this in other major markets. So with that said, I'd see this project as a, as a major and critical catalyst for small businesses, black owned businesses and workforce development efforts across um, greater Pittsburgh area. I believe in this project, I believe in this team and I wholeheartedly endorse that this plan moves forward with your approval. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Uh, Darnell Dinkins, you're unmuted. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Darnell Dinkins, um, owner of TD Construction Group. Um, we've done work with uh, um, Virginia and Poland, 
And I just want to, you know, first start off and just saying, you know, in Luke 12, 11 and you know, 12, it says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each other. And I just say, you know, in this season, you know, we really, you know, need this project to move forward, not just for, you know, the money that's coming into it, but for the people's development. You know, uh, me and my you know, partner, Derek Tillman, uh, we got into uh, this phase because you don't take, break generational curses with, you know, money, you break it with education. You break it with showing people how to grow and how to build. Change is inevitable, but growth is optional. And walking the streets of Elmore Square, I walk down Center Avenue and walk past so many different things, going to Shinley High School every single day. I was able to go up to Kennard Field and then practice for two hours a day to the point where I was able to make it to the NFL and then, and then was able to win the Super Bowl with the New Orleans Saints. So when I talk about doing things in the Hill District, gentrification doesn't happen. If buildings get built, that's great, but the people need to be built. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, it says, for as many as, for as the body is one and many and have many members and all the members are one body. And this is all about all of us growing together. You know, and I think that, you know, if you guys understand what the BBT is trying to do, you know, they are really trying to implement change. So what, what I've been able to do is get in contact with the EAS, Eastern Atlantic you know, States Council for Carpenters and the local five with, you know, uh, with Curtis Moorhead. Uh, and I had the main guy, Bill Sproles, who sees everything from Maine down to Puerto Rico. So we can start helping develop people right at our, right at our, you know, um, we're at the EIC, which is at 1435 Bedford Avenue. And really we've been very, very supportive of this whole project and even inclusive as far as the uh, dealing with the First Source Center and um, the Hill House, you know, that's, that's going on. So we want to make sure that we are part of the development because there is, there is a lot of history that goes along with all the things that's going on in the Hill District. We want to help shift it into destiny. And I've always been a part of, you know, great teams. And we right now need to stand more united than ever. So um, I just want to just say on behalf of myself, Derek, TD Construction, that uh, we want this project to move forward so we can start helping redevelop our Hill District. $17,000 is the, is the you know, median you know, income. If you really look at that, if people were making two hundred twenty dollars an hour, twenty five dollars an hour doing jobs, and we work ten hours a day, you know, you take that over twenty six you no know, pays throughout the year, and that's sixty five thousand dollars that you just help somebody from an apprenticeship program. Now the buildings are being built, and they can go to all these things, they can go to the concert. So who wants to go to a concert? You don't got no one to do it. I know when I was growing up in the Hill District, we had nothing. So if we can start doing these things to create change, then we'll start to see change happen. You know, I, I once read a story of, of, of an Aesop's fables. I'm here at Alia Wow, Alia Wow right now. I was reading to the kids today. I read them the, the story of a bundle of sticks. There was once a man who was listening to his children, you know, grumble over, you know, quarrel over everything. So he tied together a bundle of sticks and had them sit down and try to break it. And try as they made, they couldn't break it. So then he unraveled the sticks and gave it to them each one by one. And then once he, once he was able to, they broke it easily. So he said, see, as long as you stand together, you can never be broken. But the second you separate, you'll be easily destroyed. The, the, these outdated you know, mandates and, and things of that nature has caused this project to be, you know, become quarrelsome. And we just need to all stick together. So in my, in my team, I put down my helmet and picked up my hard hat and trying to start as many pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs as possible. So the whole venture, the First Source Center with the Hill House was to stand for, I pray that I can you know, help do it. And I'm rolling my sleeves up and I want to help this team make sure that our people, because it's really- Just go ahead and wrap up. Really about the people, because it's where I come from. So it's not about a three minute conversation. It's about us making sure this project moves ahead for the people who are not speaking for themselves today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you're unmuted. Okay. Sorry, I was looking for the video function and I just... <laughs> Let me just do audio, that's fine. Yeah, we can hear you, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, first of all, I just want to, uh, I just want to thank the um, commissioners uh, for your um, attention and detail on this project. Um, it's, it is refreshing. 
Uh, my, my name is Paul Ellis. Um, I uh, have strong ties to the Hill District and the city of Pittsburgh. I was raised on the Hill um, and maintained the business uh, on it. I'm currently doing so for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm the founder of the August Wilson House and I've had the privilege of leading a multi-billion dollar uh, development project on behalf of uh, uh, this national asset and a regional economic incubator. Um, for several years, starting back in 2006, I uh, had the privilege of uh, fighting for Hill District residents to secure a community benefits agreement and a Hill District master plan. And I happen to be a signatory on those, uh, those two documents. Um, and I just say that to say that I'm, I'm you know, one of the last people that would uh, lend support to this project if I thought it wasn't warranted. Um, there, uh, there's, there's understandably some apprehension um, uh, by some Hill District residents. And I just wanna be clear uh, that that apprehension is justified. Uh, there are a few neighborhoods that have experienced the depth of, uh, of broken promises and destruction and neglect and blight and disinvestment that the Hill has endured. Um, so, you know, I say that to say that the proper outcome uh, for, uh, you know, procedural and, subs and substantive justice uh, in terms of outcome for the Hill District, the proper outcome is to restore this historic neighborhood uh, to the um, level of uh, economic and cultural vitality that it earned a national reputation for and, and an international one at that. Um, you have to have uh, empathy to be concerned about the civic health of a community. So, uh, you know, my, my uncle once said that he has a fierce affect, affection for the Hill District. That's exactly how I feel about the neighborhood. Um, I've had a chance to review the investment plans. Uh, I, I worked very closely with Bomani and my sister uh, Kimberly Ellis for years to improve our communities. I worked with Kevin Acklin and Tracy McCance Lewis and uh, the last two mayoral administrations. So um, I, I fully intend to work closely with the Lower Hill team to, to uh, maintain accountability um, and be an ongoing resource as these uh, historic waters are navigated. Um, I did provide a letter of support um, in the packet um, to support the um, uh, a Buccini and Pollen Group. Uh, and for these reasons, uh, I endorse the Lower Hill Redevelopment Project and its bid before the City Planning Commission. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis Stafford, you are unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Phyllis Gafour, P-H-Y-L-L-I-S-G-H-A-F-O-O-R. My address, my family home is at 624 Summer Street in the Middle Hill. Uh, my background is in urban and regional planning and business, a master degree in both. I have been involved with this project since about 2006, up to about beginning of 2019. Um, I have had over a thousand hours of volunteer time, as well as nine to 13 of my comrades that live in the hill, lived in the hill. Um, I've also managed about 150 development projects for the um, Pittsburgh City Planning Commission. So I'm intimately knowledgeable about development, what it's supposed to do, zoning policies, and et cetera. I'm on here today because I have four issues and this is not a long conversation. When we are trained as urban planners, we are trained to look at the holistic impacts of, of physical development. We look at the social impacts, we look at the political impacts, technical, cultural, historical, and et cetera. My four issues briefly, there is devastating physical decline in the hill right now. And one of them is my family home. No help from the city, no help from the penguins, no help from anybody. And therefore we are suffering mightily up there. Secondly, there is too political and has been a process. Everybody wants their piece of the pie. Everybody wants their $100,000. Everybody wants their title and so forth. In the meantime, 
A 17 year old was buried yesterday from being shot with a shotgun in the back of his head because people don't sense any prosperity coming towards them. Black faces right now do not translate to an integration, nor does it translate to leadership. Many of the people whose faces you see today were not part of the past 10 to 12 years. In pieces, yeah, but not in the nitty gritty to see what happens when development was supposed to take place and has not. I am also concerned on a physical level about the Southwest and the Western side of Site G. As we know, there are terrorists, there are organizations that would love to get famous by driving through all of that glass, by driving through crowds, by driving through your, your venues and cause a lot of havoc. So there needs to be some ballads, I don't know what the proper terminology, but there needs to be some public safety um, um, measures taken because of what's going on. Bomani, um, and this is pretty much my last point, Bomani Housie mentioned some things that had tears going down my face about the young lady who became a flagger and was still addicted to drugs. My feeling is this, and this is from watching many projects, that we're going to train an all-male, mostly all-male workforce for construction. The population of the Middle Hill is not all-male. It's poor, female-headed households and the elderly. So things that are devastating right now, you're telling us to wait five, six years and get some relief. The city and the URA and LaBelle and Wheatley need to talk about getting us relief right now. A lot of people are getting good salaries now from the benefit of people like me who were in the trenches, going to hearings after hearings after hearings. And yet we're supposed to look at them and feel that you're our leaders, you're speaking for us. I don't think so. They kept saying in the day, that this was a transformational project. But Kim just got finished saying, oh, we're gonna take the black bourgeoisie project called the CAP, and we're gonna take that same value system and go all the way to Crawford Street. We want big duty artists in that space. There are a lot of very talented artists that you could utilize from here that could use the money that could use the exposure. But it seems to me, as long as we promote the black bourgeoisie from the upper hill, get them to testify, we're okay. In approving this, please so a, a proper economic, yes, I'm stopping, a proper economic and social plan. Because what I have heard is pretty much the same old thing, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sean Ty Turner, you're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sante Turner. Uh, my address is 608 Duff Street, Pittsburgh 15219. I am representing the Zone 2 Public Safety Council. And I'll read a brief statement that we've prepared. As residents of the Hill District and members of the Zone 2 Public Safety Council, we offer our full support for the Lower Hill FNB Financial Center Development Project. Capital investments such as this project not only enhance business objectives, but they also create economic opportunities and expanded growth for the communities in which they exist. As a council, we all agree on one fact, the redevelopment and revitalization of the Hill District is long overdue and we cannot wait any longer. We believe that this project will be the catalyst to improving the condition of our community and for creating a safer community for current Hill residents and future generations 
acceptance of Hill residents. We do, however, expect all parties involved to keep the interests of, Hill, of the Hill District and its residents in the forefront of this project as it moves forward. Signed by the Zone 2 Public Safety Council, Gail Felton Chair, members Lorraine Morton, Tanya Ford, Sante Turner, Pam Walker, Tiffany Kinney, Antoine Bailey, Jane Council, Antoine Smalls, Tom Boyd, Mike Logan, and Gilbert Lowe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Holly Douglas, you're unmuted. Thank you. My name is Holly Douglas. I am the Vice President of Cosmos Technologies. On behalf of myself and our president, the Frederick Douglas, um, I just want to acknowledge our support of the FNB Tower. Cosmos Technologies is a minority-owned business. Um, we are located or headquartered at 700 River Avenue, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15212. Um, we are very impressed with the FNB Tower um, and their engagement of the Hill community, not just, but not just the Hill community, also of the MBE and WBE minority and women-owned businesses throughout the city of Pittsburgh. Um, the passion and commitment that has been highlighted here today um, is really exhilarating. Um, to kind of speak to one of the, the former speakers, I do want to say that, you know, um, as part of the initiative and the preparation for this particular project, there's been a lot of interaction with the minority and women-owned business community um, and the training initiatives have already started. Um, I can say this um, with certainty because we are providing the safety training um, for these programs, but um, recipients, not just um, male, male businesses, but female businesses as well, um, are receiving safety training, bonding initiatives, um, and other things to make sure that they have a sustainable business, not just for this venture, um, but, but throughout the rest of, their, um, rest of their career. So I just wanted to say that we fully endorse this plan and we are truly proud to be part of the team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cheyenne Bronzel, you're unmuted. Hi, thank you. My name is Cheyenne Bronzel. I am chef and owner of Fat Girls of Cooking. I'm located at 2308 Arlington Avenue, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15210. I'm grateful that I was invited here today to um, speak. First, I would like to say that I'm definitely in agreement of the FMB project. Um, I, I guess um, what I would like to say is that I think that this new, um, this new project has given hope to people like me because at this point, I've been in contact and in, with a lot of help from several um, representatives from the Hill, Marimba, Diamante, Bumanti, um, Diamante, Bumani, Kim Ellis, um, Jake Wheatley have all been instrumental in helping me keep my business afloat over the years. However, I have come to the point that when I only want for my business to be located on the hill, I've never wanted it to be located anywhere else but on the hill. I was born and raised on the hill, Webster Avenue. I was raised in Elmore Square. Um, I was born, I was at the town where the hill was flourishing. Um, full of black businesses. And that's what I would like to see again. Um, I like to thank everybody for allowing me to be here. And I don't want to put like sadness on it, but I really was at a point where I was ready to give up on my business because it didn't, I didn't feel like the things on the Hill District were flourishing as well as they were going to. Um, I also had a conversation with someone the other day and they asked me why did I want my business to be on the hill when it was dead. It's not dead to me. It's a lot of problems. Problems that we would hope would be fixed soon. I don't have anything to say bad about the hill. It's my first love. Um, not only do I want my business to be based on the hill, but I want to live back on the hill. Um, I, it is also my hope that 
I will be able to help those that have the same kind of problems that I have as a food business owner um, not give up on their business. Um, thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. Uh, Christine Turkovich, you're unmuted. I say thank you for having me. My name is Christine Turkovich, T-U-R-K-O-V-I-C-H. I live at 6719 Buchanan Avenue, West Fifth, 15122. And I own Turco LLC, which is a women-owned carpentry company. And I am here on behalf of Support of the Project. And I would like to tell you why I come from a unique point of view, I used to live on the hill in the Bedford dwellings, and I also am in a male-dominated industry, and there aren't a lot of women out in the field running work and doing administrative as well. Um, it's funny that Bhavani brought up the environmental factors, because I have been saying for a long time that you cannot change things unless you provide options for a community. You cannot create change when environmental factors are everywhere, at home, at school, on the street. It, it is difficult to see hope and a way out when you live in that, in that trench. That being said, there's been many things throughout this process and this project that impressed me. Number one, the kiosks. I have said for a long time, there are so many entrepreneurs in and about the Hill District that maybe aren't ready to go full on business I see it as a way for the many restaurants, the craft makers, the retail operations um, to be introduced to a business model and maybe find some long-term income to the local entrepreneurs instead of it being a cash entity with no long-term security. This is something that I experienced. Um, Bomani talked about um, the environmental factors. Um, I call my way out of those environmental factors. Factors. I'm a product of Riverside, of the BizFit program. I actually got my OSHA 30 through Cosmos Enterprise a long time ago. And um, I think that these opportunities for women owned from that angle are incredible because I can tell you there's something that occurs. I have been bidding work. I'm non-union. I've been bidding with the certification. I bid prior to the certification commercial work. I've been involved in projects that had not necessarily labor agreements, but agreements where we could intermingle with union companies. I can tell you that there is a due diligence to minority and women owned inclusion that oftentimes doesn't have any, any end point. You know, my email was filled in the time of this, this video thing with 25 invites and none of those people even know who I am. They just know that I have a certification. And that's usually as far as it goes. I wrote an email when I, I, I got a blast about the Hill CDC and, and I put my frustrations out there. It was a matter of 72 hours. I was addressed by BPG. I was addressed by um, E Holdings. I was addressed by PJ Dick. And I can tell you, I've written more than one of these emails. I've addressed people. And this is the first time on a $331 million project, I'm a third tier subcontractor. The price of tea in China, my spot will be very small. I was treated with a red carpet priority in wanting to know what it is that we need, what I need as a third tier subcontractor to make this work, to make the work available to me. So on many levels, I wanna be involved in this. And, and real quick, um, I hire recovering addicts. I hire section three workers. I have an active duty member in the service on my staff. I would be willing to continue the promise from the top tier all the way down to the bottom tier in efforts to make this project succeed because the Hill District is very close to my heart. And I believe that we learn empathy through experience. And I've had the experience to understand. And I also have put the time in on the other side in construction to be part of this. As far as work, I keep hearing this undertone of it's only temporary construction work. Let me tell you. Oh, 30 more seconds, please. Thank you. One to three years of temporary work 
is a game changer for construction. It's very difficult to attain that long-term work. So this would benefit um, many small businesses in a very big way. I wanna thank you for the opportunity and I'm in full support of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Curtis, you're unmuted. Hello, everyone. My name is Curtis Moorhead, um, C-U-R-T-I-S-M-O-R-E-H-E-A-D. I, uh, I help my wife run Emerald Electrical Services. We're a union-owned mechanical and electrical um, contractor. Uh, I'd like to um, first thank uh, the, uh, the commissioners, um, FMB, uh, 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 Bumont, uh, Bumani Howe at uh, the, the firm Puccini in um, Poland. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to you know, speak briefly. I'm a child of the Hill District, grew up up in a project called Robinson Court a lot of years ago. I was always very much interested in being able to do something else to be able to change the uh, structure of, uh, of my environment. And uh, very fortunate to have been able to continue my education. And my wife and I um, have been able to start a union electrical contracting business because of my 44 years in the electrical trade. And I'm presently outside of uh, local union number five. I'm getting ready to, uh, to teach a class. So thank you for putting me on right now. I appreciate that. I uh, was, uh, was always behind the development up there. I remember back in 1968 during the riots, there was, uh, you know, previous to that, just a great, uh, um, uh, a great business um, up and around the uh, Hill District. I uh, fortunately enough was able to purchase some uh, property up on uh, Center and Kirkpatrick we have my wife and I own 75 square by 120 up at Center Kirkpatrick, formerly the uh, Old West Funeral Home, uh, Sugar Ray's, Willie Todd, Diamond, Five and Ten, some of the uh, places you guys would probably remember. So being able to uh, develop up there is my interest. Having developed a uh, union electrical contracting business, we have uh, supplied jobs clearly. Um, you know, 50 to 80 percent of the labor that we have are minority and women. Uh, we intentionally, you know, hire that way also. Um, uh, just, you know, very much interested in um, uh, I, I wrote a, a letter to the Penguins, to uh, to the commissioners for uh, for our support for this project. And you all can see that I'm fully vested in a lot of different ways. I just never turned around, always believed that there was something else to uh, that could be done. And we're finding ourselves postured to be able to uh, bring a great project like this to fruition. And we, we would appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to continue that. I'm working um, closely uh, with, uh, with our local union um, and uh, a, a number of good people. Um, Darnell um, Dickerson, for one, to be able to uh, develop a um, pre-apprenticeship program. So I am fully vested in this. It takes the, uh, it, it's going to take this whole community. We've got uh, uh, you all fully involved. And honestly, it, this is just a great time. So God bless us all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Dale Snyder, you're unmuted. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Dale Snyder, pastor of Bethel AME Church and Trinity AME Church in the Hills. Um, at first, we have very a lot of emotion around the project because um, 
we were not a, really a, a partner in the beginning of the project. But I do want to thank the Penguins for um, understanding and helping us tell our story. 213 years ago, Bethel Amy Church started. Uh, in 1958, the URA took our church, which sits almost 150 feet from where the Penguins building is now. Uh, 8,700 square feet was our building. Um, our church was given $240,000 to rebuild the building that holds 19,000, I mean, 9,000, I mean, 1,900 people. We are a congregation of 3,000 members. We were the history of the hill. We were that congregation that seeded the development of the hill all the way up. Our story has not been told. A similar white church, uh, smaller size than ours, was given $1,240,000 to be displaced. Uh, the Penguins heard our story, sat down with us, and now in agreement with us to help us fight for our reparations, uh, to get our land back, to get the right um, kind of funding, to help us fund our church that's now up on Wiley Avenue. I mean, we have one church that's on Wiley and one that's on um, Webster. Um, we have been here, we opened the first school to teach blacks to read. We were part of the Underground Railroad. We own property all up and down the hill where people came from the South. Our church was a synodel of hope for African-Americans that was built in 1908. Um, where it was black took their nickels and dimes and quarters. We started our congregation in 1808, and we've been about the liberation of African Americans for 213 years. I want to honor those who have heard our story. Some say we're not entitled to reparations, but I think that we are. And I want to thank those uh, in this project who will hear our story because there will be other stories that come forward. When you are an oppressed people and an oppressed group, all avenues of communication needs to be opened up. And I, I think as we go forward in this development, our voice will be one to make sure that those who are locked out, closed out, left out, will have an opportunity to participate in this project in a more meaningful way. I'm bivocational. I belong to the Laborers Local Union. I belong to the Operating Engineers Local Union. I have a bachelor's in business, a master's in theology, and God willing, on the 14th, I'll graduate with my doctorate in ministry. I bring a plethora of opportunities and experience to our congregation. Only been here for 16 months, don't hold that against me. But I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to engage and to correct some past wrongs. We are probably one or two only businesses that survive the detriment of the URA taking the land from the URA. And unfortunately, um, we were not part of any of the negotiations, but we're here now. We can't, un we, can un we can't undo what's been done, but we can create an opportunity where everyone can win who's been at the table. We are single congregations, both of our buildings we own, and we're looking to help in the development of the upper middle hill and to do what we can to support this project to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to win. So I wanna thank you. Um, protocol has been established, but I do want you to understand the historical context of Bethel AME Church and we want to reclaim our land, reclaim our history, so people can understand the significance that we have given to this community for 213 years. Thank you for giving this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Congratulations on your doctorate. Yep, thank you. Uh, Angela Jackson, you should be able to unmute. Uh, we'll come back, I think. We'll, we'll continue through the list and come back. Um, Marimba Lyons, you're unmuted. Good afternoon. 
I'm here before you today as a signatory to the Community Collaboration and Implementation Plan and President and CEO of the Registered Community Organization for the Hill District Neighborhood, the Hill CDC. I am also a member of the Executive Management Committee. I'm here also as a proud lifelong resident of the Hill District community. But perhaps most importantly, I am here as a witness to this moment. Ironically, it was a chilly May day in 1956, much like today, that the city of Pittsburgh and URA started demolition of 95 acres of land on the Lower Hill District. You see, big dollars were flowing from the federal government and states were enacting redevelopment authorities to implement infrastructure funding for America's highways. That mon money ended up destroying thousands of black communities throughout our country. The Hill District was no different where we lost 8,000 mostly black residents, 1,300 buildings and 400 businesses. In addition to Pittsburgh's most powerful corporate and government leaders, many black leaders welcomed the proposal to clear the Lower Hill District. Many elected officials, business people, contractors, socialites championed the plan as a renaissance. They later realized that the plan wasn't for them and that they had made a mistake. Representative Homer S. Brown, who endorsed the plan in the beginning, was followed by his son, Berg Brown, a generation later, who tried to repair the damage from the prior generation's mistake. Burr Brown, together with James Jordan, the lone Black city councilman, Robert R. Lavelle, a realtor, and Frankie Pace, businesswoman and activist, formed a group called the Citizens Committee for Hill District Renewal and demanded that the city put money into the community's improvement rather than its de destruction. Together, they erected a billboard that you saw earlier in the presentation and organized themselves to save their community from complete destruction. Here we sit 65 years later, still trying to mend those broken promises and still trying to create sufficient resources and still falling into patterns where we do not hold those with the greatest resources and power sufficiently accountable to promises made. Only now we're also ignoring the community's only established process for resident input. A process established by the city of Pittsburgh's registered community organization ordinance, a process that is equitable in and of, in an equitable, inequitable in and of itself because it requires much work to collect and share community voice with little responsibility on the city to adhere. I could talk about how the development team's FLDP does not align with the PLDP and that acceptance creates a poor precedent and a legal matter of concern for the city, the planning commission, the developer and the community, but I won't. I could talk about the 200 community members who cared to show up at the development activities meeting that the developer forced a meeting that lasted three hours with no documented support from attendees, but I won't. Most certainly I could cite the areas of misalignment with the CSIP, starting with the fact that the Pittsburgh Penguins did not disclose or work with the EMC on the selection of the developer and that the developer clustered block G1 and block G4 together in recent month, months, giving the illusion that the combined blocks meet the CSIP goals when the projects continue to need serious tending. I could even cite how the EMC is stacked in favor of the private developer and elected officials and that limited com community voice is available to protect the Hill District within the context of the management committee, but I won't do that either. I will only ask you today to condition your approval on the signed community reinvestment plan that the Buccini polling group referenced in their presentation and showcased today. We have yet to receive a signed agreement that assures that we do not repeat history. And so I want to step into the future. In my conversation with Chris Buccini just yesterday, he said, Marimba, you should be the first one taking a victory lap. All of these benefits accruing to the community, all of this work you've done over the years, it wouldn't have happened without you. This is your moment to take a victory lap. And that is a lap that I am eager to take, the moment that we can secure our community's future 
with a signed agreement to assure that there is no miscommunication, that there is no misunderstanding, and that there is true accountability. And so I would like to ask that Felicity Williams follow um, me. She is going to talk a little bit about the process. Um, and she's also from the Registered Community Organization. And she will be able to offer a little more insight as to why your approval should be conditioned. Um, uh, excuse me, why your approval should be conditioned by assuring that the community has a reinvestment plan uh, based on this specific proposal. Uh, and I also want to just emphasize- Excuse me, about 30 uh, seconds, please. please. I'm sorry? About 30 seconds, please. No problem. Thank you. I also want to just clarify for the group that the Executive Management Committee has not endorsed and approved this plan at the Executive Management Committee level that individual committee members agree to sign a statement, but those are personal statements. Finally, I will say I am excited about the potential of this project. I wanna be 100% clear. I'm excited about the potential of the project, but we must be informed by history. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathleen, if you could come out to Felicity Williams, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, Felicity Williams, you are unmuted. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Felicity Williams, Programs and Policy Manager and Special Assistant to the President CEO at the Hill City C, which is the RCO for the Greater Hill District, including the Lower Hill. I have broken my testimony in three parts. A personal statement, a statement on behalf of the Development Review Panel on the status of noncompliance for the project with the CSIP, and a statement to raise precedent and legal concerns with approving an FLDP that is wholly and substantially inconsistent with the 2014 PLDP amended in 2015. In positive news, we were able to get concessions from the city of Pittsburgh. Councilman Lavelle signed an agreement this morning on the eight proposals we made to our government partners, which gives us some comfort and protection. We have yet to secure an agreement, not a plan, with the development team for how commitments will be realized from the CSIP. For my personal statement, I will start with a quote by John Lewis. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, that is not fair, not just, say something, do something, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. I'm speaking today because I see something that is not right. I have been meeting about the Lower Hill every two weeks for the past four years through transitions of leadership at the Pens and transitions of development partners, in addition to my day-to-day -day work at the Hill CDC. Before the EMC hired a project administrator who is surprisingly absent today, I facilitated the meetings. My great aunt dedicated the majority of her career to education justice in the Hill and was a principal at Madison Elementary School for nearly 20 years where I spent a lot of time. This is not just my work, I'm personally attached to the Hildershire community. I wanna remind us the city nor the Hildershire has to settle. I'm speaking today to ensure that the entire Hildershire is made whole, not with promises, not with plans, not with tax dollars, not with temporary construction and low wage jobs, not with mentorship and scholarships, not with just loans into building developments and not because people I know and many of whom I personally like got some opportunities and contracts. You've heard from them in testimony today. We are urging the development team to agree to a clause in the agreement for tenants that they will have a goal that one in 10 new hires be a Hildershire resident. That way we are connecting the training at the First Source Center to job opportunities beyond construction and low wage ones. We're asking, urging the development team for commercial and retail space in the Block G1 tower that is affordable to Hill District and black owned businesses, not just outdoor kiosks that are only viable a few months out of the year. We're asking, we're urging them for shared decision-making with the development, between the development team and the community on where investments are made for pre-qualified financially develop, viable developments through their Opportunity Zone Fund and community ownership opportunities. The development team was presented with four and rejected all of them. In the past, there were many who supported previous plans for the Lower Hill, but the plans for widespread jobs, opportunities and promises either came and went or never came at all. With regard to the DRP, the Hill, DRP is the Hill District's unified, democratic, and comprehensive review process. Residents are appointed to the DRP committee by the Hill District Ministers Alliance, the Hill District Education Council, the Center That Cares, the Hill District Consensus Group, the Hill CDC, and Uptown Partners to review development proposals and score them against our guiding community documents, including the CSIP. The DRP seconds. committee has, oh, oh, sorry, DRP committee has collectively assessed this project does not have sufficient alignment with the CSIP. Over the last several weeks, the EMC agreed to a joint process to review proposals. Those two bodies reached uh, consensus, but we were on uh, 
with the develop, we reached consensus on the proposals that we would support, but we never reached consensus with the development team. Uh, none of this is to say the development team is not proposing anything for the health district. You have heard visions, plans, and the like for such today. Furthermore, at our meetings and our communications, we have reviewed what is being proposed. I would note some of what you heard today is not proposed for this particular block. For example, the Live Nation venue and the food hall. The measure, however, of success is the CSIP, not the EORC or any other government agency process. Not how many things the development team is doing is not any other measure except the CSIP. Okay, can, um, we, can we finish that thought, please? Yes. In reviewing the CSIP and their state commitments, our biggest challenge is that we do not have a community reinvestment agreement for block G1 and G4. We were forced to host, let me say, let me skip down so I can wrap this up. <laughs> Without that agreement, the Hedgeshire community is being asked to operate on trust when trust and good faith has been violated repeatedly over the years, including unmet commitments and changing the community's geographic boundaries in secret. Okay. I would like to note that our petition of 76 includes Hildeshik residents, business owners, community nonprofit employees, artists, faith-based, and more, several of whom signed during this presentation today. Uh, I'll skip Thank addressing you. the PLD issues, legal issues, and the dam related issues as well. Uh, those Thank are you. noted in my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brenda Tate, you're unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Well, good evening. I hope I'm the last speaker. There has been a lot said today. Uh, first, I'd like to say my name is Brenda Tate. I'm a lifelong resident of the Hill District. I live at 1911 Bedford Avenue. My aunt, who is 100 years old, years old, she still lives here with me. She also was worked for Lena Horn's father at a restaurant down there on the 28 acres. I'm a PA state committee member. I'm a retired Pittsburgh police officer. I'm 72 years old. So that should give you a framework of how long I've been in this Hill District. I literally live in the same block that they brought me home in 1949. I'm not here to say that this project should not go forward. I've been impressed, extremely impressed with uh, some of the testimony here today. 2006, I came through my living room and I looked at the TV and I saw a woman with a sign walking around the civic arena by herself, Kim Ellis. I immediately got up, put my coat on and went down there. Since 2006, I have been committed to making sure that the residents of the Hill District receive equitable, uh, reasonable, uh, whatever they have to get from this project down at the bottom of the hill. I've been involved literally in this project along with the people that have testified, Bomani, Kim. These are people that I not only love, these are people that I trust. I would hope that this project gets it right. And I think that's why I'm testifying today. My hope is that this project gets it right. And when I say that, there are some loose ends and we all know what those loose ends are. And I think we ought to look at those loose ends. I think we need to come back, look at them, talk about them, get them right and move forward. I would love to see this project move forward. I was a little girl when I tried to sneak in the um, opera, opera tent down there and got shooed away. I don't want that big building down there to shoo away any young kids anymore, like I was shooed away. So I'm praying that the community, uh, the development people, the penguins, uh, and I'm also a member of the board of the CDC. 
And I would hope that we can all get together and figure out what those loose ends are so we can get it right and move this project forward. I love you all and trust you all, Kim, Bamani, and a few others that testified. So I'm counting on you all to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Don Matthews, you should be able to unmute. Hello, um, my name is Don Matthews and I'm a Hill District business owner of two businesses, Home Indeed Realty and Stravantage, which is a robotics process automation company. And I'm a black woman. So obviously my both companies are black and woman owned. And I'm in full support of the project moving forward without delay. I feel the, the hill has gone far too long without uh, substantial capital infusion and direct investment um, as evidenced by not even so much as having a grocery store. Um, and this team has made substantial commitments to provide good paying jobs, livable wages, business contracts, training, partnerships, business expansions, um, even training for the youth through the CTE, CTE program um, and STEM scholarships. Um, I think it's just a terrific opportunity. I don't think it's an opportunity that we need to delay any further. There's too many who are in too much need um, to, not move forward with the, move, to not move forward with this at this time. And that's, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Armani, you're unmuted. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, I'm Daniel Armanios. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University who studies issues of infrastructure and equity. My address is 506 Kerwood Road, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15215. Um, given I'm a researcher, I speak in data, not generalities. And from what I see in triangulating the qualitative and quantitative data, this development deeply, deeply concerns me. My research identifies centering projects and local skills and needs as a key factor that influences the sustainability of our infrastructure projects. In other words, projects cultivating local skills and needs map onto better sustainable outcomes. Taking my research and applying it to what has occurred thus far with this proposed new development in the Lower Hill, there has been little centering in community skills and needs for this project. In fact, it has been circumventing it. Therefore, this is not just inequitable, it is simply bad business. I also wrote this in a recently published op-ed in Fortune magazine. And I won't go into the DRP and the failures therein. I think Marimba and Felicity have kindly and well eloquently done so. What I will say though, is what they've done since then. Rather than working through these agreed upon mechanisms, the group went behind the community's back. And by the way, I mean community because the DRP is a six hill district community-based organizations are involved with the DRP to lobby for a merger of the lower and middle hill census tracts. This allows this lower hill high-end development to exploit opportunity zone tax credits designed for low-income middle hill residents to be used for this high-end lower hill development. In a recent community meeting, when the Buccini Poland group was asked to provide a project for which they thought was an exemplar of their prior community work, they noted their work in Wilmington, Delaware. There, they had previously used Opportunity Zach Zones credits intended for the city's low income South Bridge neighborhood to build high end luxury apartments. This is highly similar with what they are proposing to do here, using low income middle hill tax credits for their high end lower hill development. When Hill District 
residents pushed the Penguins led group to simply meet agreed upon demands in a variety of community meetings of which I observed. The response was that any additions are not financially viable. However, this does not align with their other actions. For instance, if these margins are so razor thin, why then would government agencies already allocate $80.65 million in public loans and subsidies to this project if it was on such financially questionable footing? Why then collaborate with the city's URA to subsequently submit applications for another 22 million in state funding if this was not adequately lucrative? How can on one hand, the group tell community residents that complying to the CSIP, which they signed and said they would agree to is suddenly not financially viable and at the same time requests more public funding for the project based on its anticipated benefits and large economic potential. Moreover, if not financially viable and per the developer's very own reasoning, would this not suggest even more need to slow down the timeline to ensure the project's on more stable footing? This is even more difficult to reconcile when you put this in perspective of the financial uh, resources available to this group. According to Forbes, the Penguins made $159 million in revenues in 2020 amidst a pandemic. According to their own website, BBG, the Bikini Poland Group, boasts, boasts a portfolio of assets valuing over $5 billion, $5 billion with a B dollars. In fact, all of this was explicitly asked to them in many community meetings. When asked if, their plan, if they plan to attach the CSIP to their plan, no answer. Will you have guaranteed local Black community ownership levels on Block G1 and G4? No answer. Even the kiosk will not even have guaranteed Black ownership. Will you meet Excuse commercially me reasonable seconds, efforts? Please. Okay, I'll be done soon. As stipulated by CSIP, no answer. Let me conclude with the following. The Pittsburgh City Council adopted a resolution advancing 10 commitments to racial equity. This resolution notes how deeply systemic racism is embedded in the culture, the fabric, infrastructure, and resident patterns of the city of Pittsburgh. As a commission, you are now being asked to move a plan forward which does not have community backing, a plan which was agreed upon by the entities involved. The commission must ask themselves what signal this sends in lieu of the 10 commitments. These commitments are not just about the city creating new opportunities that support the advancement of black communities. They also are the audacity, authenticity, and consistency of mission to stop advancements that do not advance those commitments. Whatever you decide, know that your decision here is not just a signal to the residents of the Hill District, the whole city is watching because the president you set with your decision here will send a clear signal to communities and developers alike citywide as to how the city will handle projects of equity concern. This will, if you Ten choose seconds, to say, essentially, the bad, bad is, uh, is if you choose to rule in favor of this project, you're essentially dooming any community re review process going forward because if the developer does not choose to comply, they can simply cite this as a precedent. This will only open the floodgates to further development projects that are not centered on community skills and concerns. And such a president will reverberate well beyond these 10 command commitments. And I'm happy to conclude to provide any citations you need for any of the statistics I mentioned there. Thank you. Thank you. AB, uh, you are unmuted. Hello, good afternoon, evening. My name is Arby Bankston. I live at 3337 Webster Avenue, Pittsburgh, PA, 15219. Born and raised on the Hill, attended Madison Elementary, Aaron Hill Junior High, Shinley High School. I'm an engineer, retired. I used to be a supervisor running two nuclear reactors, supervisor in the control room. I have my OSHA 30. I've been a project manager. I've been a consultant on three continents. So that's my background. Oh, by the way, my father owned the small business on here in Avenue that is currently a green space since 1970s. So I have a vested interest in the community. And what I don't hear is and the gentleman who just spoke before me very profound statement. People, there's no investment in the wealth, the growth of wealth of people in the Hill District. So 90% of the residents of the Hill will not benefit in, in this project. And so when you try to, oh, excuse me, I'm also a DRP member and a board member of the Hill District and Census Group. So I'm well versed in all the ins and outs of what's been going on. So the big picture is there's no 
incentive for the residents of this community to participate. So I'll give you an example. The CAP project, it removes a barrier from downtown to the Lower Hill development site. However, Crawford Street is a barrier between the Lower Hill development site and the hill. And it's been mentioned that Wiley Avenue is a avenue that's going to help wealth go up into the hill, but there's a barrier there at Crawford. There's nothing in this project that is going to eliminate that barrier. So when we talk about barriers, and I want to read something since there was a historical context, 1840, so forth. So this comes from 1857. And this is a Supreme Court opinion. And it's a 72, seven to two decision against Dred Scott in 1857. And it's opinion written by Chief Justice Roger Taney. The court ruled that black people are not included and were not include, intended to be included under the word citizens in the constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures the citizens of the United States. Justice Taney went on to write that the local laws from the time of the constitution's drafting in 1787 purported to show that a perpetual and impassable barrier was intended to be erected between the white race and the one which they had reduced to slavery. So that was 1857. So then you get the Civil War, and then you get, after the Civil War, we get, what was it, the, oh, the Ku Klux Klan Act, which was the beginning of eight Civil Rights Acts up to 1964. And now we hear 18, 1955, the Lower Hills taken, and now we move the census tract, 2021, so now the AMI is going to go up, and that's not being addressed. So, excuse me, about thirty seconds, please. Yes, community block grant that would be uh, available to the hill, middle hill won't be available. Same thing has already happened to the upper hill. That's not being addressed. The big picture is that there needs to be a requirement that they engage with the hill district residents, just not specific groups. Okay, all the Hill District residents need to be engaged in some form of fashion so that there is wealth distributed. Our children are not included. There's dislocation. There's no plan to bring people back to the Hill. So you have dislocation, you have vacant lots, and you have $300 per square foot to build on these lots. And there's no jobs. There's no careers. All these things, that's what the gentleman before you was, was saying. I'm sorry, and about 20 time. seconds, sir. All right. One last thing. Window of opportunity, that's a poem. The existence of the window of opportunity is announced. Go through the window, and there are good things for you. How big is the window? Unknown. Is the window open or closed? Unknown. Can we see through, or is the shade pulled down? Unknown. The location of the window? Unknown. Author? Unknown. But this is what the Black residents of the Hill C, unknown, no timeline, no schedule, no completion, no start date, no engagement. It, it needs to end and they need to be engaged. This commendable for what has been done now, great. But let's spread the wealth amongst the black presidents of the Hill. Let's bring them back to the Hill. Let's get some programs okay. in place. All right, thank you. Uh, Daniel Klein, you're unmuted. Thank you. My name is Daniel Klein. I'm a resident of the Hill District. I live at 208 Seneca Street, uh, 15219 in the Uptown neighborhood, and I'm a member of the DRP. Um, <clears throat> I am testifying today to uh, reiterate what my fellow DRP um, panel members have already noted about the developers um, failure to pass our process. Um, they presented to our panel uh, two times about this project and both times re uh, received a failing score. Um, 
we gave them a lot of feedback about the reasons that we scored their project badly. And they did not specifically address our feedback or our, our individual points and just kind of answered our questions in generalities um, and, and gave a, you know, a lot of polished presentations like the one you saw today, um, but kind of glossed over everything, you know, make, making it seem like, yes, we're all in agreement here. I think you know, nobody's saying that we don't want this development to happen. Uh, everyone on our panel has uh, has said that at one time or another that we recognize the the historical nature of the project and we think it's a, a benefit to our community and to the entire city and the region. However, um, we are scoring as a panel the proposal against the CSIP, which is an agreement that was already signed by our community leaders and by the developers. And it, uh, when, when weighted against those requirements, this proposal just does not meet the requirements and that's why they're, they keep failing. So um, I want to um, say for the record that um, I would encourage the Planning Commission um, to go with uh, the recommendation of the Marimba Malayans and make their approval conditional um, on, several, th on uh, several points that the the DRP have already expressed both in writing and in our meetings, uh, but I do think that blanket approval is premature because uh, the developer um, has not addressed the requests, uh, especially around community ownership. There's there's no community ownership in this plan whatsoever. Nobody, uh, <clears throat> there are no opportunities or new seconds. opportunities being created for residents to own. Uh, any any businesses or green spaces um, or to secure jobs in maintaining those things. And uh, the developer's commitments are all commitments of public funding, none of their own money. Um, and they have refused to agree to share decision-making power for the Opportunity Zone. Um, okay. These things have already been mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have Councilman Lavelle still here? Uh, we do. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so Pittsburgh City Councilman Daniel Lavelle, um, my address is 4331 Andover Terrace. Um, you had asked us what hats we wear. Um, I also chair the CSIP and the Executive Management Committee. I'm also signatory to the agreement and obviously I represent the Hill District on Pittsburgh City Council. Um, I'm gonna try to be brief because we've been here a very long time. First and foremost, I wanna thank all the residents and business owners, stakeholders, Hill District stakeholders who chose to show up today, either providing testimony in writing, emailing your testimony and or providing your comments this evening, it's all necessary. Um, and so I just wanna thank you all for participating. One of the speakers, I believe it was Ms. Malayans, um, mentioned that we must be sort of informed by history. And Dr. Ellis started her remarks speaking about history and speaking about the city councilman at the time that said there would be no social loss if and it could all be destroyed if they destroyed the lower hill and looking back we obviously know that that wasn't the case there was indeed a tremendous amount of social loss and economic loss to our community to which to this day we have yet to fully recover i would also argue that the black community in the city of pittsburgh has yet to recover because of that demolition since the day I took office, my goal through this development was to leverage the Lower Hill development for the explicit economic and social benefit of residents of the Middle and Upper Hill District. That's been my goal since day one. That was the goal I made with, that was the agreement I made with the Pittsburgh Penguins before I led the charge to actually tear down the Civic Arena so we could move this development forward. And I believe we're there. Um, there was a, uh, there was another gentleman 
who spoke about the Ten Commandments on racial equity. I wrote that bill. I authored that legislation. If I didn't believe that this was, if I felt that this was harmful to that, or that this, this wasn't in line with those Ten Commitments, I wouldn't be here today because this has taken a very long time to get to, right? This is 10 years, close to 11 years later, where we're finally here, because half of that time was a lot of discussions, bickering at times, fighting at times, trying to reach a deal that would be to the explicit economic and social benefit of residents of the Middle and Upper Hill District. And I believe we're now at a time and place where we have to move. And I think the ironic part about that, um, the statement from the uh, councilman decades ago around the social loss is we are now at a time and place where I believe if we do not choose to move this forward today, our neighborhood will continue to have decades of social loss because moving this today allows me to unlock other resources that otherwise would never come to this community. They don't exist and they wouldn't come otherwise. And the people that all of us collectively are reporting to want to have the best interests at heart would still be left in squire. And so I believe it'd be immoral and unjust if we don't move this forward. What I will also, however, admit is there's still more work to be done. This is step one. There, is, there are a lot of pieces on the table a lot of agreements that need to be reached, but that doesn't mean you can all you can always reach them one immediately by the time you want to take a vote. Um, and so I, I believe it was Miss Brenda Tate who spoke about the loose ends. And my response would be, hold me to it. Hold me to ensuring those loose ends actually get tied up. Because as we move forward, as hard as I've been on the pins in the past, as much as I've spoken to BPG as a developer and put my issues on the table, that doesn't stop today. We're gonna to keep having these conversations tomorrow and the next day because the lives of the Greater Hill District residents require that. Um, with that being said, I think today you've seen the overwhelming support of residents from the Hill District. And so thus, I would ask you to stand with them, to stand with me and asking you to vote today to move this forward. Um, and I don't believe you should move it forward with conditions. Um, I believe the development needs to move forward so that we can begin to realize and restore the social and economic loss that occurred in 1955. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the end of testimony, Kathleen? Uh, we have the one person who wasn't available uh, earlier that we need to circle back to. Uh, Angela Jackson, if you're there, you should be able to unmute. And okay. Commissioner, I wanted to say something as well. I just, I know that I'm a part of the team. I just separated that from my role as a Hill resident. So I didn't know. You, um, asking to give testimony? Yes. Okay, so go ahead and you have three minutes and give your full name again. <clears throat> sure, um, my name is Kimberly Ellis and I am speaking now as a Hill resident, a long time Hill resident. Um, I used to walk, I live on Bedford Avenue. I live in the lower Hill. So I actually oversee the site every day. Um, I used to walk up Crawford Avenue from the bus stop from school. I saw people coming and going from Conley Trade School. I lived right down the street from St. Joseph's House of Hospitality, which I learned used to be a home for pregnant teenage girls. I went to Amma Recreational Center where I danced, I ran and I played, and I got my first legal job at Osnam Cultural Center, which is now the Grayson Center. I took computer classes and went to summer camp in the Hill House. And I learned more about my neighborhood as I walked around with my mother as she was giving tours of the historic Hill District on behalf of her brother, August Wilson. I did all of that while growing up in the decline of the Hill District. It wasn't until I actually went to college where every time I came back home, there were more people that were dead and dying. And I didn't understand what was actually happening. 
I've been in so many different planning meetings, as you've heard many people say. Um, I've been, <laughs> it's been countless meetings and what we haven't had is capital and we haven't had always good community partners. We watched Trek Development come in and finish Dinwiddie in one year. I went uh, to school in Atlanta while Mayor Maynard Jackson was still the mayor. I learned about how he transformed generational wealth and the economic vitality of Atlanta's black community through a single development project, the airport. And I learned about his affirmative action policy that changed the trajectory of the black economy over a five year period. That, that legacy has continued. There were literally 25 black millionaires created and a host of others empowered with generational wealth. No one had ownership in the airport. You do not always need ownership in a development project in order to generate wealth. We in the Hill District created the first community benefits agreement for the state. It wasn't robust, but today we do. Do we have to rely on verbal promises made? No. We have learned our lesson and now we have the LERDA and we have the CSIP, a real community benefits agreement. The, the CSIP was created seven years ago. It did not directly identify with this project. That's why there, there are some misalignments, but it is still a valid document and this development is still a valid development. Um, half of our community is vacant. You heard from people who said they grew up in Robinson, Elmore Square, those are housing projects. We have an affordable housing crisis in the Hill and all of this vacant land. Well, the great part is that we have a concerned and caring URA now, and we have Hill District residents that are represented on the URA. I don't know why the communication failed on the Opportunity Zone, but State Representative Jake Wheatley signed it, City Councilman Lavelle signed it, and Mayor Bill Peduto signed it. So that's a conversation we could probably all have. However, I have to note that from the development team, Amichi, Aka, and Chris came up with the Opportunity Zone Fund to make up for that. About 30 <laughs> seconds, please. Sure. Um, so I think that overall, I just, I wanna stress that there's been a lot of misinformation from the community groups. That is what is unfortunate. And you, you heard a lot of the accurate information from us here and today. Um, we're gonna have further community engagement. We're gonna have better communication. I definitely think that's necessary. And Chris has repeatedly said he will counter sign at any point, always ready to sign the agreement. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here in honor of my mother, Frida Carolyn Ellis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll give a couple seconds to make sure there's no one else. Uh, no, uh, no other hands are raised at this time. Okay, so that closes public testimony. At this time, we take questions and comments from the commission. Commissioners, I um, will refer you to our reports document that outlines um, the background material that uh, that uh, planning staff started with. And in that background material are the criteria by which we evaluate section 922, uh, period 11C2, and those criteria are listed there. Um, I will remind you, as you've heard, that this project has an unusual um, attachment to it with regards to the CSIP, and you have heard much about both those criteria and the CSIP. So if you have any questions regarding the relationship of these documents, um, questions regarding any of the testimony that we heard, um, please uh, feel free to speak your minds now. Christine, it's, I'm sorry, Chair, Chairman, Commissioner Mondor, <laughs> would you read, um, would you mind reading or maybe somebody else could read the, the CSIP piece? Um, I think that we've, we've all read the final land development piece before, but there might be people who are watching who, who don't know that sort of piece of the CSIP that we need to consider. I would phrase that as an open question um, as to, I'm not sure that you can read the CSIP because we might be here another three hours, but um, there might be a question that you have about it or do you wanna? Well, in, um, there is a, a, a piece that I think that 
Ms. Rakes wrote um, in regards to our decision here. Um, I don't know if Ms. Rakes wants to tell us um, what was included, the two conditions from the Planning Commission's approval from 2014. Sure, so yeah. Land development. So Commissioner Mingo, um, when the preliminary land development plan, so the master plan for the Lower Hill was approved by Planning Commission at that time, um, there were two conditions relative to the CSIP, the Community Collaboration and Implementation Plan, uh, that relates to the FLDP that you guys, that, sorry, that the commission is reviewing today. Um, one of it was that all FLDP submissions shall include a true and correct copy of the executed statement of affirmation, which has been made part of the CSIP plan with written documentation of the receipt thereof in writing, which states that a developer endorses the CSIP and the applicant has provided that and then they had included it in the presentation today. Uh, and the other is uh, each FLDP application shall incorporate the community design charrette or other public process engaging the community groups related to the design of the proposed development as agreed upon with the, in, with the CSIP. Uh, and they have provided a statement of that community process. Thank you. Um, Chair Mondor, I don't know how you wanted to start. I had some design things. Maybe we can start with some design questions as it relates um, to the project, unless somebody else would like to go first. Go ahead, Becky, and start with design, please. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate you giving us some example, uh, some making some modifications to the site plan um, in regards to adding the stairway along the side where the right of way for Wiley Avenue is located. I'm, I'm still having a difficult time because I'm still having a difficult time understanding what you're actually building um, versus what is in the future um, and in regards to sort of what happens at the future line because there's drawings that show sort of the other white squares on the plan but there aren't lines that show like a fence that you're building temporarily because it could be I know it might be two years before the next thing happens. So I'd like to sort of understand what happens on those edges for the next two years. So we've tried to show that that edge would be built at an elevation that then could match with what we plan to be the connection with that block F urban space. And if that isn't built, then it, it would be an essential essentially a low retaining wall over the elevation of Wiley now with that stairway that is running along the wall, along, along Wiley. Could, could I ask that you guys um, uh, identify a slide and that staff could put up the slide so we can be looking at the same place? Sure. Lisa, Lisa, you can jump in. I was going to say there's slide number six, which shows um, the overall site plan and shows that connection on either side of the G4 parcel. That's number six. And you can see the right of way. Um, and I, I understand where, you know, if we can zoom in, you can, you can see that we have a stair on either side and the landings. Um, the landings that are happening where we're showing those terrace connections are coordinated with the, the grades of G1, but they're also coordinated with the grades of the future, you know, build out, um, you know, of Wiley and that F2 uh, relationship. So the idea is that we, that, that staircase that you're seeing kind of on that edge between the Wiley Avenue right of way and G4, you know, if that, you know, is built today, that, that provides access all throughout, you know, those G4 parcels up and down and all around, and that there would, by the nature of that and the grade change, there would be that wall that we, we discussed. Um, but the, the grades and those levels, the reason I touched on the accessibility in the future is because we are not just, you know, this works today. But in the future, we also want to be mindful that what we're doing now 
also can work for the future because no one likes to go back and rip things out and redo. That, that's not what anybody wants to do. So the design is taking into account those grades and those elevations and making those landing connections for that, for that continuation of the accessible, that universal kind of accessibility experience that, that you could also visit those terraces that are intermediate and in between. Also in the plan set, uh, it's in pages 74, 75, 76, it gives an idea of what those edges would look like with retaining walls, artwork, stairways. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we've looked at, and as we, this is that difficulty in clarifying, right? Because we're in this area where this is what we can build. And then we're in the area where the urban open space has to be built. There's, pro there's also an interim place just to let you know, you know what could happen. And we could come in with another um, amended PLDP where if, if Wiley's vacated and the condition that staff has proposed actually covers you know, the potential vacation of Wiley, that that would trigger something. We could actually even do um, an interim um, amended PLDP where you'd lay, lay down that slope a little bit uh, you know, pre block F if you were, if we were going to do that. So we really have three different options. Uh, this is the one that works just on G4. Frankly, uh, the, the goal is to get the urban open space on F going so that it's built contiguously. And then if it doesn't, there's actually an interim plan that may, when we do the design and we meet with staff and we meet with the community that may be, you know, an interim position where you'd have some slope encroachment on that right of way and do, do a condition that may be somewhere in between these. But right now we're showing this retaining wall um, and stairways that, that work. The elevation of Wiley, we're, we're very, feel very strongly about, uh, is inappropriate as it sits now for true utilization of that open space, as, as you've seen by the master plan, plan look at, at both F and G4 to create some really usable, you know, lawn area, festival gathering space, that um, elevation of Wiley needs to, needs to ultimately change uh, to effectively do that. So we're trying to plan for it. And if we don't get there, we're able to build this condition. So we're trying to, it's what we explained um, at the briefing and trying to document a little, little, little better here. Okay, so then um, so then above that, where the G3 and G2 spots are, um, what happens at those edges? You're building that space in between those two, but then what happens on the sites of G3 and G2? So I think it probably, um, so we would come in, if G3 gets built, obviously that temporary, um, accessibility access would go away. And we actually have a plan where we have an accessible elevator that could do that in that, that uh, passageway from Logan Street. So we've looked at if G3 would be built that we still have an accessible way to do that. But I think, again, what we're really looking to do is whenever you look at the master plan that Gensler has worked on, and if you look at uh, 76, really, if you could go I I mean, I appreciate that you've submitted this master plan, but it is not the PLDP that we need to approve this based on. So it would be well, great if this was approved first and I could look at this and say, oh, this master plan relates to the PLDP, but it is hard for me to look at that in this context. So I, I will look at it, but I can't judge this project on this. So let's go to what your question was, is G3. And the answer is we're not here for G3. It's not part of that. And whenever G3 comes in, what we can say is we've looked at it in the larger picture and a master planning picture. And we come if we come in for the G3 PLDP before F, we will be able to show that condition too. So are you putting a fence around G3 and G2 in the meantime? Not G3. No. Um, I, I'm uh, out of my realm on, on seating and slope, but we're doing, so I don't want to speak. Is, is there someone? Um, I, it, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if Steve's on the call, but, yeah. but basically uh, G2 and G3 um, have the idea was that they were being graded out 
um, and those slopes were seeded and um, it's, it's tying in into those adjacent grades. Um, so, so that is, that was the, the concept there is that there's kind of, cause you can see that you're up at 845 towards Logan, you're down at 835 at the event lawn. Um, so the, you know, that whole space is being graded out adjacent because they're, you know, uh, for purposes of diagramming, you know, we've shown this nice big white box, but in reality, you know, it, it's, it's not developed. It's. Um, so I, the, the problem was created. We would have essentially had the same conditions at G2, G3, and Wiley that we're showing for G2 and G3, which is basically, um, you know, legal, stable slope, no retaining walls and seated until they come along. But we're into the realm. And that's what we would have shown and have actually designed on Wiley but we don't control Wiley now. So we're having to show retaining wall and stairs. So if we had those same conditions where we had public ownership or they were public right of way at the edges of G2 and G3, we'd be looking at similar situations where we'd have to have a, you know, a fence or retaining wall, but we don't. We control that property. We can lay those slopes back and we can see them. So. Okay. So then that's, that, that's helpful because I, I asked about this at the last, time and so I was hoping there was going to be a drawing which showed about showed what was happening in between for this development now in that space in between because um, things are always changing um, but so then my question is at the edge of that g2 white box is a severe drop to a loading dock driveway am I incorrect in addition there's also a, a an elevation drop if you drew a line, if there's that line between G1 and G2 that goes across, um, that probably has some sort of fence. And so I'm also curious about what is being built there in terms of a fence slash wall of the loading zone difference to your courtyard difference. And what's the temporary solution at the G1 side, G2 side? So at the G2 side, that's been designed, you know, with a potential on some level with the hospitality building. So it was again, designed for the future so that they would be shared back of house facilities. And, um, but in the temporary condition, it's been designed, as I mentioned, where there would be an engineered slope and, and, um, and, 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 and grass and, and landscaping. There's, there's landscaping there and right at the corner of Bedford. We, you know, we were focusing frankly on, on the edge at, um, at Wiley, but those are the those are the current conditions, and we also have um, part of our package on on the rights that we are, are acquiring in relation to bringing down G one and G four are those slope rights for um, those those adjacent parcels. Which again, that's what we would have just done if that were controlled by the SEA. Wiley was the owner of the SEA. I'd be showing you those temporary engineered slope. Um, landscape conditions um, as we are in G2 and G3, but the SEA doesn't control that slope. So that's, those are the distinctions. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I apologize. I didn't really, I should have seen it. I should have seen that's what you're focusing on too. And, and G2 and G3, but we, we frankly didn't. They've been fully engineered by Baker. I mean, those are very well along um, engineered um, drawings that, that we could, uh, you know, we could share. So you're telling me that this, you can make an engineered slope from the corner of Bedford and Logan down to the loading dock without having a retaining wall. That's correct. Okay, and then, but the loading dock ends in a wall that is then at, I think 835, there's a, a height difference. Am I incorrect? On the edge of the loading dock, the driveway goes under the loading dock, and then there's a a wall that happens there. So what's happening there in your drawings? Because right now I just see on the elevation, the facade of the garage, is, there has to be a fence. Yeah, Commissioner is, um, I, don't, I don't know, is Steve Savage in, is he, um, is he I, I am on now, Bill. I, I was on in a capacity where I couldn't speak and that they okay. were kind enough to, right. to flip me over. Uh, by yeah. the circle. So Steve, take it away. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So at, at the edge of the loading dock, there will be a slight difference in elevation 
between the loading dock area of approximately two to three feet. So that, that loading dock is not uniformly flat. It does have a pitch to it that pitches out towards Bedford Avenue. So in, in that context, there will be a, a pedestrian ramp and a set of stairs that allows for full accessibility from the plaza into that truck dock for, for access pur purposes. But also that edge treatment will be something that Lisa and I collaborate on from a landscape and hardscape as well as engineered solution to make sure that there's a, a means for uh, protecting that edge. So we're not gonna leave that out so that it's a fall hazard or anything to that effect. Okay, so there's there are steps and some pedestrian access that you're not showing on any of these drawings that we're seeing here. Yeah, it, it's kind of down into the into the plan level of detail that wouldn't necessarily show up well on on the slides that give the context of the project. But when you oh, drill sorry, down into the, is it inside the building or outside the building? Out, outside the building, outside. it is an exterior mm -hmm. stair and ramp. Okay. Um, okay, that's that's helpful. I, I understand that there's stuff missing there. Um, uh, okay, then my so my other sort of question then if I understand that loading dock area is if I if I were a person who didn't work in this building, maybe I was at the cap project, maybe I was working downtown, but I somehow I parked in your G1 parking garage. Maybe this doesn't happen. Maybe I'm a visitor somehow. Or I parked my bike in your garage. Can I get from the corner of Bedford and Washington up through that loading dock area? Do I have to walk? Is there a way yeah. to get inside yeah. or you have to go through the plaza? <laughs> So, so yeah, we're, we're not necessarily encouraging external users. Uh, that, that access for the dock area is mostly for folks that are using the dock as a, as a loading function. Uh, if you're parking, you're, you're utilizing the interior stairs and, and lobby of the G1 building to get out onto, onto the uh, G4 Plaza area or down to the corner of Bedford. Now, if you're exterior to the building and you've just approached it from the cap park and you're, you're out outside, you know, the intent is for you to be able to utilize the site itself to get up into the plaza. So you're not intending for any humans to be walking up Bedford Avenue on that side of your building and then entering in your building on that side? No, there are, That's correct. That's correct. There are no, there are no, are no building entrances off, directly off of Bedford. There are entrances off of Washington Place as well as the Plaza, and at the loading dock uh, as well. There is actually an entrance to uh, users of the buildings, uh, the building to uh, park bikes, uh, accessed off of the loading dock. <clears throat> okay. Um. And yeah, that's a pretty austere environment. So what if I were walking with, um, you know, my child who had bicycles or wheels um, and wanted to walk through to Logan Street um, from the CAP project, um, or I were a 10 year old or a 12 year old who was interested in coming through the project would I have to walk I'd have to walk around the whole project or is there you know there are some stairs that are built that have ways of pushing bicycles up um, so you so you see what I'm saying that there there are people who are going to have to go around your project how, how would how would you get from Logan Street with bicycles with like a three-year-old in bicycle, you would just carry them through to Washington Place? Or would I walk around Logan to Bedford Avenue? I, I think um, to, to jump in, um, I think Lisa, you might be able to best speak to that. But when I think about 
um, the slides you shared earlier and how you traverse the site, uh, whether you're coming from Logan down into the site or coming up from Washington, there were a number of accessible routes that take us up through the site, as well as coming, if you're approaching from Logan coming down, um, that would not uh, force you to have to go around. Um, I think those slides that you shared earlier speak better to that. Two slides prior. Are you talking about the initial um, proposed condition from day one? Yeah, so if we're coming from CAP, and Lisa, feel free to jump in, of course, but let's just say we're coming from the CAP or, or downtown, if you will, um, you can uh, cross Washington Place either at Center or at Bedford, um, and you, you can be encouraged to come up through this, it depends on your destination and how you want to move through the site, but you definitely can be encouraged to come up and through the site, um, uh, whether if you have, if there are accessibility um, needs. There are those terraces that also have that ramp woven into the site that allow you to move through the site um, as opposed to having to go, as you said, like through, through around the site, if you will. Um, same thing if you were coming from the, the Befford corner, immediately you can see where those, um, where those arrows are showing um, ADA accessibility as well as the stairways. Um, if you recall the uh, sections that we showed earlier, it kind of give you a sense of what that experience is. So it's not, you know, the, the, the goal will be that we can break that up. I think it will be based on the intent. If your intent is just a leisure stroll, I think we've created an opportunity where you can walk through the site. There are moments where you can stop, sit on a bench. Um, but if you're just um, using the site kind of to move to and fro downtown mm -hmm. the hill. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're just using the site to move through and from, you have that opportunity as well. Could we could we go to sheet 64? I don't know if Cindy's still with us, but she could speak to this a lot better. But slide 64, it shows basically what, if you're out on that site, you intuitively know is you don't want to bike on Bedford. So what you're going to do, what that's showing, what Cindy's slide there shows is the bike route is Crawford Center. Now you'll be able to get down into the site and we haven't really shown coming down Wiley or coming down Bedford Fullerton. What we've shown is when you get to our site, you can get the bike into the building, but we're frankly not encouraging um, pass through bike traffic there. That's, that, that's the design. If you're on a bike and you're at the corner, which um, I, I've kind of spent a lot of time at that intersection. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a bike there, but let's assume that somebody got stuck there for some unknown reason. They made a big mistake. You wouldn't want to keep going up the hill. You'd want to go down Washington and up center. And that's where the, as this plan notes, like where the, there's exterior bike racks right there at the corner of Washington. Yes. But Lisa, they're for the building and people that are using them. They're not for bikers to encourage them to bike to these sites. They're just not. It, it, no, it, might, just, it, it yes. might be helpful for the commissioner to see page 47. I don't know if she's uh, had a chance to see it. But that really speaks to um, that. That is, um, you know, where we're concerned about it being stark. Um, that is all ground floor retail and glass. Um, you can see the sidewalks. And yes, there will be a, a small part of the base that is where the parking garage is, um, but or the entrance to the parking garage is, but, but most of it is a wide so sidewalk with glass and vibrancy and retail. So I don't know if that helps or not, but just want to make sure we've pointed that out. One of the reasons we haven't shown, we actually have some more sidewalk and right of way there. One of the reasons we haven't shown more um, landscape feature against the building to soften that is the Domi is actually indicated um, that they'd like to see uh, further widening of the sidewalk there. They're actually more concerned about, you know, having enough room for, for people. So when we work with Domi, um, we'll try to blend that as best we can together, knowing that it's in everybody's interest to soften that, that side even more. Okay, thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, you know, one of the um, issues is that a lot of people are going to try and cross Washington 
Boulevard, no matter what we, yeah. no matter what you do here. I saw on a couple of things, some ideas about how to deal with that. One of them showed um, not bollards, but maybe markers. Um, another one showed a median, putting a median, concrete median. It said by others. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of trying to prove sort of encourage people to go to this corner instead of and cross at the crosswalk versus just crossing at the end of the stairs. I think it was shown on slide number 37 in the plan where it talked about freestanding planters uh, proposed in the median. Cindy Chapel on. Cindy, can you? Yeah, I'm here. I, I just wanted to clarify that those delineators in the road that are shown are not um, meant to guide persons, but rather to guide vehicles as they come into the right turn lane to keep them from um, horizontally moving back and forth between lanes as they pull into the pull out or pull off or to make a right turn onto Bedford. And then Lisa has more information about maybe treatments on Washington Place that would encourage people to not play Frogger across the road. But Cindy, we, we're going to have uh, bollards and, and some mix of landscaping to prevent or deter certainly people trying to cross Washington. But what can we do? Both the CAP and our site is driving people to those corners at Bedford and Washington and Washington and Center. What can we do? And the commissioner's right. That's particularly dicey at Washington and Bedford. What can we do to improve that pedestrian safe, safety there? Well, potentially working with Domi, we could we could change the treatment at the crosswalk to elevate it so that it would be the same height as the sidewalks, giving better visibility of the pedestrians. We could, well, the bump out's already there. We could do a more exaggerated bump out to decrease the pedestrian crossing distance. Um, it would be possible to change signal timings to allow longer pedestrian crossing times as long as one can tolerate the additional um, queuing delay and congestion that would result on uh, Washington Place and back onto Center Avenue um, at particularly busy times. People will go to Ideally, they're going to go to one of those two corners. What we really don't want them to do is try to run across in the middle of the street. And I think that some of those bollard and landscaping treatments and planters are geared toward um, teaching people that you shall not vault over those, that those are going to, you know, make a nice edge to the project, but indicates that that's not a place for pedestrians to cross. Commissioners, if I can um, just make a respectful suggestion is that if you have some issues that are resolvable um, through a condition, but maybe not in this forum, we, you know, we've been at it for many hours, we're going to start mm -hmm. losing commissioners, that you prepare a, com a, a condition um, that would allow staff to continue to have that conversation. If you believe that, that your concern is um, at a level that would um, cause you to not vote for the project, please by all means bring that forward and make us all aware of your concerns. Um, I just want to be attentive to the fact that we're going to start losing people and I want to make sure we maintain a quorum. So. Makes sense to me. Thank you, Christine. That said, are, are there are there concerns at that level and are, are there concerns that you know you would like to condition that you want to bring forward? I don't want to cut off that the debate. I just want to make sure that we're not um, solving it in this forum necessarily. Yeah. Um, I guess, Chair Mondor, you know, we, we have this um, project in front of us that we're, I'm trying to figure out how do I reconcile this um, is, are, am I, am I echoing? No. Okay, good. <laughs> um, just, just on my end then. Um, how I reconcile the, this project with the, with the PLDP that we're reviewing against from 2014 
And then thinking about what that condition is, um, if we go ahead with the recommended motion, which I think the condition right now that's proposed um, is that we would ask this project um, to say, number five says, an amendment to the preliminary land, that the, that the following conditions would be, one of them would be that there would be an amendment to the preliminary land development plan that addresses the removal of Wiley or any other proposed changes to the master plan shall be approved prior to and at the same time as the next final development plan for SP11 and is required within two years for commencement of the open space on block F. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out, are there things that I wanna make sure to also either say as a condition or say to this group about the future of that master plan, having seen these master plans from Gensler and knowing where they're going, um, are there things that I'm particularly worried about? Um, and I think one of them, and maybe it doesn't have to be a condition, but maybe I'd love to get the other commissioners is that, you know, with this idea of Wiley Avenue either being a street or a pedestrian right away, and this difficult situation with Washington Place, there has to be some way of, on all of these drawings, we show this sort of continuous purple line that goes to the cap. How do you reconcile the people piece of that that wants to cross the street? Um, and this design doesn't necessarily have to resolve that now. I, I worry about it being a temporary solution for two years or however long it who knows if there's ever going to be a temporary solution. <laughs> but so that I'm sort of trying to fuss out here. And perhaps that's that just gets resolved in the in the in the uh, amendment of the PLDP. I think I think your concerns are all very valid. The temporary condition, pedestrian safety, the directionality and future flow of whatever happens on the F site in the Wiley Avenue area. Um, I think whoever is the team that's bringing forward and uh, the next, the F site or the next site that triggers the conversation about Wiley Avenue is that there is a, 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 a lift to solve those issues. Um, they, they yes. solved. I, I think what, what you've heard is that we fully appreciate what what you're saying and have wrestled with them ourselves and have tried to look ahead to to uh, answer them the best way we can including we really believe that the pedestrians are going to be driven through the cap to the cap to the edge of f at at center in washington i, I would also suggest that you work with staff to um, create documentation that shows the interim conditions and clearly says what the edge conditions are on these projects as you go um, because it is it, to Commissioner Mingo's point, it is not clear what is uh, going to happen in the interim, nor how the edges are treated. So, yes, we, yes, we, yes. In, in, in fact, um, again, as I mentioned, um, we have those G, G2 edge conditions, so um, we should have presented them. So, our, again, my apology. Um, and to Mr. Layman, I know that we would be in this motion. Um, I, we have a lot more to discuss before we get to a motion, but just to ask the question to Mr. Lehman um, about, you know, we have this note in here, number three, which is a usual one, the final construction plans, including site plans, landscaping plans, elevations will be reviewed uh, by the zoning administrator prior to the rec recording record of zoning approval. Um, and you're okay with us allowing you to figure this out in yeah. regards to the... Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes, and and as uh, I think Chair Mondor can attest to, uh, when things have been particularly sensitive or there are specific commission issues that have been raised, once we get down to that, doing the final plan review, we'll circle back around with the commission to make sure that we're, you know, following the spirit of your of your concerns and your you know your conditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, I would like to um, expedite my questions. I 
they don't all need to be answered today, but posed in, in some response that may go to the staff. One is, um, I really appreciate the continuity that this group put together with regards to approaching this through a human-centered design framework, um, placemaking, honor and history, the relevance about the detail for community regeneration and sustainability. I did have a question about <clears throat> 12 year commitment versus 70 years of disinvestment in the hill. And what is the bridge between at the end of 12 years, how will this project look at supporting um, ongoing needs that will not be mitigated in 12 years? That's number one. Number two, um, I have not heard of what is the building's current carbon footprint and I counted about a hundred trees, which on an annual basis, a mature tree mitigates 48 pounds of carbon. And I need to know what is the proposed building's carbon footprint against the proposed tree canopy that will mitigate the risk of toxic exposure um, due to carbon. Uh, 2B is what is the alignment with this work and Walter Hood's work? so that there's seamless intersections that support that work. Question three, stormwater management. I heard of um, the plan. I would like to have more clarity around project percentages uh, with regards to mitigating stormwater and whether or not that site will help cis have cisterns or bioswales as well for stormwater retention. Um, I think I understood the journal plan. I'd like some more specificity. Uh, four, I'm not clear about which standard is being sought after, whether it's lead gold or lead silver, but I'd like some more clarity around that as I saw that in the presentation. Five, I would like more clarity around understanding the heat, urban heat um, island effect and how the current tree canopy or proposed building construct seek to mitigate that. Um, uh, number six, when you look at the activation of programming um, and community connections, I'm not clear how the ongoing community engagement will address the social, cultural, and recreational needs as expressed by the community. Um, and so for me, you know, when I listen to this presentation and I hear the development team's desire to sign off on the needed um, documents to support the CSIP. I'm still questioning why that hasn't happened in a way that the community is satisfied. And so, Corey, I would hope that, um, you know, once we make our recommendation, that those kind of things are tightened up um, so that this project represents the best of our ability to support a comprehensive approach um, while looking at all of the challenges that projects like this bring to bear when there's historical, um, historical, uh, historical nature that has historically had a uh, disproportionate impact on people of color. That's it for me, Commissioner uh, Mondo. So can we, um, uh, can we have, uh... Can we answer the, the, the more existential question first, Commissioner Brown? Can we just review what has been signed and what hasn't been signed? And I want to address directly um, the, rec the suggestion by a few folks who testified that um, condition it on a signed community reinvestment plan. I'm not clear on what the terminologies are between things. I understand that, that, that the applicant did sign off on a statement of affirmation endorsing the CSIP. What is this other document? And to Fred's point, what is the gap? Why do we have signatures on something but somebody else is not happy with? I don't know the difference between those documents. So I'll just try to just put it in simple form. The PLDP said that there's a statement of affirmation to comply with the CSIP. And we've done that. So we've met the PLDP condition. That was the foresight to say, okay, there's this body that's going to regulate that agreement. It's just for the very purpose that it doesn't put the city or the planning commission or PLI into an enforcement position. That's not the right function for that. It just, it just 
not the right category. So they're not conditions that are attached to a land use approval. So we've covered that. What you're hearing is something that's going beyond that, that the developer is willing to do. And those are things that we believe are not, you know, that, that are either beyond or more definitive than the, than the CSIP. And that is the term sheet that's Mr. Buccini referenced. And he is on, on record. Um, today's just the latest. I, I can't recall the number of times I've heard Chris say that, but he is, he is ready, has always been ready to sign that. And what we, and I, you'll have to ask the other folks, but what I heard today is what our experience has been, is that simply not enough? So uh, my client has been very clear and exhaustive, even through this weekend and early into the morning to say, we're putting everything we can into it and still have a project. And what some folks are saying that we've heard from today is that's not enough. And so we're willing to sign that. Uh, we also, by the way, that would not become part of this. That's not in the document that the planning commission or PLI should enforce. Um, we would out sign that outside and, and, and it's not appropriate for a condition, but as with um, any community agreement that I've ever done, and I'm sure with Felicity Williams and her expertise, we would make sure it was fully enforceable. Commissioner Brown, do you wanna uh, follow up any questions or ask about that since you brought that question up? Thank you, Commissioner Mondor, Chair Mondor. Um, I really appreciate the specificity that's being laid out. I guess my concern is more just a question of integrity with regards to the what what is the holdup, and if the community is you know pretty much close to sealing the deal, um, what is going beyond the interests of the group, so that we as commissioners have a sense of what that is that we're supporting or not supporting, um, so that we can be clear about what's feasible or not, recognizing that there's no legal standing by our standards except for our moral commitment to this project being of sound standing with regard to community interests. And I, my question is more, moreover reflective of some of the sentiment expressed by um, the latter experts that I have a high regard for, um, uh, Daniel um, Manos and Daniel Klein and Harvey and Felicity, um, Phyllis, and Marimba, um, I sensed that there was some real strategic and targeted issues that concern them. And I'm not clear where the crossover is and isn't. Um, I am very clear that this group is working around the clock to try to seal the deal. Um, and if what I'm asking for is not relevant, please um, express that to me. Um, but, but I'm just trying to get a clear understanding before I make a, a decision. Thank you. I, there's not much more to say, except there have been a, a list of demands that were made that we've been um, clear about in certain respects, they're not doable within the framework, either legally or ethically, so, you know, on, on certain of those conditions that are just non-starters because they're, they're not the right thing to do. We can't do them. But by and large, the other items are things that are doable, but outside the scope of this project. I think Councilman Lavelle hit on this. Uh, this is a, uh, and, and he used the word, which uh, kind of disappointed because I'm supposed to be, uh, my, my livelihood depends on words, but he, he said unlock. It's a very good word. Um, this unlocks a lot of things. It can't be accomplished in one project. If you look, there are people sitting around this room. And I haven't heard anybody come up and, and dispute it, in, including Mr. Amianos, that one building of this scale costing you know, this much money to build is generating this much in public benefits. Um, the, my team has said it may exist. We don't know of it here, and we don't know of it at all. We have some pretty substantial experience. I don't know how old Mr. Amianos is, but um, I'm, a, I'm pretty old. And so, um, you know, we're, we have a historic process in terms of what it's able to generate. And what we said is on, on those basic terms, this is, the, this is what does it and allows it to happen. 
and it's it is the it is the catalyst and unlocks a lot of things on the first phase. And we're not going to be disingenuous that they all can be accomplished with one project. So to that end, I wonder if um, if we might talk about some ways of thinking about this in terms of um, one one engagement and many more engagements to follow. I think we've heard testimony from all sides that this project is um, is just the beginning, um, that it unlocks certain things, and that there's obviously more improvement that can be made um, uh, to benefit the community uh, and also to you know think about what future projects um, in the Lower Hill are going to be. Um, one of our concerns is that, uh, one of my concerns, I won't speak for my colleagues, is that um, I, I find it, I find it wishy-washy what the role of the EMC is. Um, I would like some clarification before the next project comes up is if, if they're advisory to us, if they are taking a vote in advance of projects, I would like to know what that role is and to have some clarity in the next time a project comes through. I do appreciate that everybody at the EMC who came forward spoke on their, on their own behalf, but um, just for planning commission clarity, it would be useful to know what that role is and that relationship is. I also think that we need to have some kind of accountability that's reported back to the planning commission every time a project comes to planning commission. So I think that the teams, both teams, if we think we spent a long time this afternoon here, both teams have spent so much longer making this at the point that it is, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, our role every time a project comes through though is to make sure that the the progress that has been made to get us to this point is maintained, that the accountability is there and that it improves. So that the next project that comes through has of course keeping to these terms and conditions, but is pushing the bar on what kind of progressive proactive um, urban development can do in a, for a community such as the Hill District. And so I would like to have, uh, I would like to suggest that we have a condition that there is some sort of um, dashboard or data that is consistently reported back to the planning commission on the terms that have been created to date and how those terms are being improved and built upon it for future projects. Um, I, you know, for the communities on the community side, it feels like this is, this is, um, the only chance you have, and I appreciate that you got as far as you did in this particular project because that bodes well for future projects that we're starting with a high bar, but it's not the last time we get to have this conversation. And I do believe that we'll be able to advance this conversation as we all learn on this journey, what it means to, to be proactive in this. Um, I wanna say that I think what, this, is what, this is what betterment looks like in the future. It's about striving and creativity. It's about projects that have presence for the, for the Hill District, whether it's cultural or otherwise projects that have opportunity, meaningful opportunity, preparing people to take advantage of changes. Projects where citizens of the Hill, residents of the Hill have agency, and that's a chance to make real decisions in the project and to act on their own behalf within the realm of the project. And then projects that provide protection for those who choose not to engage. And that's the displacement issue that we talk about. And so sometimes we get so involved in the kind of nitty gritty of whether 500,000 was proposed in this date or this date that we forget what the big outcomes need to be. And these are what the big outcomes need to be. So when we come back with a kind of accountability sheet of what's happened here. I think the planning commission is, well, I'm speak for myself. I think that I would look for these four qualities to be both expressed through the design and through the kind of continued refinement of the terms in living to the, to the spirit of the CSIP agreement. Um, one other point I'd like to make is that I think we need to up the game on the, on the public realm work. Um, I think that um, I think that you're on your way. I think that it needs to be um, 
very thoughtfully considered what the public realm in the lower hill is compared to anywhere else in the city or any other city. And I'll just say that when I look at the renderings of the project, I don't see a lot of African-American presence. I don't see it in language. I don't see it in the people that you've used from entourage. I don't see it in the activities that I know belong to the hill. I don't see the performance there. There's no rendering of the performance. There's no rendering of a play. There's no rendering of those kiosks in a way that I understand that somebody who is looking at this from the Hale District's perspective feels comfortable being there. And I think that you, you, you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware that, that presence on a site is more than a kind of symbol. I, I love the Freedom Corner because it's about motion. It's about standing on the outside and being on the outside in those tough times moving in to the circle and then moving into the inner circle. And that's the kind of meaning and kind of presence that I think this sequence of public spaces has the power to, to infuse the presence of the Hill District in that way. And I would highly encourage you to up the game on future applications because it, it's, it, it can be so much better. So I, commissioners, I had those are my three things is accountability and conditioning some sort of um, report card, if you will, dashboard, however you want to call it. Um, my other points about striving and creativity, presence, opportunity, agency, and protection are just giving the teams a heads up that that's what I'm looking for. And my last one is much more tactical. is just talking about the nature of the public realm and making sure that, that, um, that the meaning and the, the excellence is, is, is in future, um, future applications. Chair, may, may I just say one thing, and it's, it's duly noted about that space. It's, it's sacred space. And one of the things that we didn't want to do is to do some kind of token renderings. We, that has to be a very extensive process. It's going to be coordinated with Walter Hood. Um, you know, we started to show respectfully some, some, some ideas. So it's actually, in some ways, we understood that was going to be a comment, but we also went right to the community from the beginning and said, look, we don't have the time in G1 and G4 to give the true credit, the true time and the true input in this space that we know it needs. So it's, it's well taken. We're, we're well aware of it. It wasn't an oversight. It wasn't lazy. It wasn't, it was actually, it's actually the opposite. We cannot do that in in this time frame. Right. Like, I absolutely appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that the whole Walter Hood thing has come back around. What I what I really don't want to have are kind of token gestures to, and I'm not saying that this is this is what the team is doing. I just want the presence of the hill to be more than tokens. I want it to never be seen that being in a temporary kiosk is somehow not grounding you in the ability to have permanent presence on the site. And so this is a philosophical thing as much as it is a kind of design thing. And I think that these teams, these design teams and these other folks on the team are good enough to kind of show Pittsburgh, show other developers, show the country what this looks like. And we need to work, you know, I am gonna hold you to that standard in future applications. This, you know, this one here, we're gonna, I'm, you know, inclined to say that we've reached a certain level of, of, of accomplishment, but I know we can do better the next time and that we have the ability to come back together again and have this conversation, which I think is a, is a very fortunate and powerful moment for the lower hill. This is the first time we're coming together to have this, but we will have future conversations about it. The only thing I would add, Chair Mondor, is what is the value of the DRP if a project is scored to not meet the metric? I mean, we need some clarity as to what, what that means to us as far as when we're hearing it didn't meet the score. What did that mean? What's the response? What is the, the mechanism to, to move it along to meet those metrics and support the scoring process? Yeah. Thank, thank you. 
Thank you for that question. I want to bring some clarity to the process that we've gone, gone through um, with the DRP, the Development Review Panel. We were tasked, we were, as I stated in our presentation, we were short 12 points when we measured against the Community Collaborative Implementation Plan, just 12 points in January. Two points shy from the Hill District Master Plan. We went through what you saw today, the MBE plans, the really in-depth process to bring MBE firms into the project. All of that was washed away from what I believe was an attempt to get more out of the deal. If we had passed in January, the leverage of the DRP would have been gone. And so new ideas were introduced after the presentation and it did not introduce ideas that were economically feasible. Great ideas in theory, great ideas, some of them which I support. But I think that there, there is some strategic maneuvering in the DRP process that is actually degrading the process that we are hoping to be something that will be a true measure for projects like this. And so we've tried to avoid the, the very public um, uh, bashing of the process because I respect all of the development review panel members. But what we presented was, was most certainly worth the 12 points that we were shy of and the two points that we were shy of. And so when the goalpost was moved, we were given a lesser score, but we're not given a very, we were given a lesser score, but it was not a very accurate score that really judged and measured the plan that we were putting forth. And so I think that while we have some work to do, I appreciate all of the comments and the feedback, the constructive criticism, we take it very seriously. I think we also as a community have some work to do with regard to how we report and maintain the integrity of our community processes. I will also say that the Lower Hill um, RCO is one voice of many community voices. There is another RCO in our community as well. There are other organizations that have weighed in and gave us information on their ideas around our plan. And so when we went from the DRP to the Equal Opportunity, Equal Opportunity Review Commission to have them evaluate the exact same plan that we were just two points shy of, 12 points shy of. They gave us a unanimous approval. And so I think you all too, I think we all, we all have to respect the ERC that is in place. We were just as we respected the DRP process and we will continue to respect that process, but we have to dive deep into the, to the, to the metrics that were used and have a very serious conversation about the integrity of that process. Commissioner Brown, do you wanna respond or? Oh, certainly I do. I think, uh, first of all, I said when I started my comment that the approach to human-centered design and the commitment to a regenerative framework was phenomenal. And I'll restate that again. I am a longtime resident of the city of Pittsburgh, 57 years. And so I will also reiterate that the Hill was devastated by Urban Renewal. The Full of Loves wrote about that. I met with them years ago. And so I'm quite sensitive to any development that takes place in the city, in particular that part of the city. I find the project to be very comprehensive, supportive, 
thought-provoking and engaging. I also am equally concerned when other professionals raise questions of concerns of qualitative and quantitative analysis on a project. And for us as commissioners, we're hearing from multiple stakeholders, Pumani, like you just mentioned, who are saying X over here and Y over here. And so as commissioners, we're trying to weave through all of that, and have a sense of what's the equilibrium. And for me, I'm also trying to figure out, and I heard it clearly, so I don't have this question again, is what's the sticking point? And so if, if now that I'm clear about the sticking point, I'm clear about how I need to proceed, but also I need in due diligence to be transparent about when I'm hearing this, these concerns raised up, I wouldn't be responsible as a commissioner if I didn't ask the question, period. Because each, as you stated, each one of these professionals bring a certain gift, skill, and talent to the table that we all respect. We don't always agree with each other, but we respect. And so when that gets posed, I want to make a decision in good standing based upon having heard all of the information and understanding what its value is against the metric and how should I make my decision. Fully understood that. Thank you. That was pretty much it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Monitor. I appreciate. Um, I hope I didn't monopolize our time too bad. Not Thank you, Commissioner Brown. And uh, Bamani, I, I, I do want to mention that I, I do believe your interests at heart are, are sincere and that when you say that there are things that you heard that were asked of you that you were unable to provide, but you thought even might be a good idea, I do believe that in future conversations, you will continue to have that conversation. And that's the nature of the process that I'm proposing is that we're, we're going to kind of have a benchmark at this point we're gonna recognize that it's not everything to everybody, but we're gonna to continue to keep moving in directions to explore those things. It would be impossible for any of us to know in advance all these things and to have asked and laid those negotiations on the table from the start. So of course things come up as we go and that's part of the learning process that we're on through future applications, so. Um, Commissioner? Um, so I just I just want to add a few more details that I think are really important, and that is that it's just a reminder to the commission that the Greater Hill District Master Plan is 13 years old. I literally worked on it, <laughs> and yes, our, our community is definitely very involved and engaged, and so I think that it's important to respect every aspect of the community. It's not just people who are on the DRP panel and not just the subgroup of the DRP panel. Um, I think that it's really important to recognize that the CSIP is seven years old. It is an aspirational document um, and, and set against, you know, quite frankly, a very difficult situation and a difficult history. And, um, and, and with the pens being less, you know, great community partners, I have to, you know, admit there, right? The last time I came before you all, I was protesting, you know? Um, so it's not, it's not that uh, we don't have standards um, or that there isn't information. It is that we are acknowledging what has happened in our neighborhood. I have to second what Bomani said about the integrity of, the, of these different processes and quite frankly, these different people. Um, you're not hearing, partly because we don't want to bash them publicly, you're just not hearing um, a, a, a slate of negativity. But I will say that I did speak publicly at the last community meeting, it was recorded. And I did say there has been a lot of misinformation that has been shared with the community. I believe that the community is being manipulated in many different ways. And I believe that it's unfair. One of the reasons why I um, addressed in my comments that I went to school in Atlanta and I benefited from Mayor Maynard Jackson's work is because there's a philosophical divide. So this is also to Commissioner Brown's question. The question is, should Hill residents and or the Hill CDC have ownership 
in every development project that occurs in the Hill District that uses public subsidy? That's a real question. And that is something that Hill residents need to answer for themselves and not just one or two people or one or you know one organization. Do, do Hill residents, do they have to have ownership in any development project that receives public subsidy? That is the question. And I believe that if we explore that and we have these different conversations in our neighborhood, we're gonna find a bit of a divide. And I use the Maynard Jackson example because they didn't have ownership, <laughs> but it trans transformed all of Atlanta. It literally transformed the entire city of Atlanta because of the focus on affirmative action policy, breaking down contracts, not just giving the big contracts to the white developers, but to actually break them down and allow the white contractor to work with the smaller black contractor and pull them along. That is what's happening here. So I just, I just wanted to address those things because, because you all need to know that these are the types of conversations that we're having in the neighborhood. And you already heard one of our elders literally call us out, Bomani and Kim, you know what I mean? And to say that, that she loves us and she trusts us, right? I didn't even know that she was gonna testify today, but it matters. It matters that we're here and it matters that we're having this conversation and we're working from the inside. I'll definitely tell you that working from the inside, I've seen so much more than I did when I was on the outside. And so um, I just wanted to address that. I hope that I answered your question, Commissioner Brown, and I hope that I at least partially answered you know, some of your questions, Commissioner Mondor, thank you. Chair Mondor, our um, court reporter is asking for a quick break. I don't know if there are other questions and we could get through this item, um, but it has been a while since we've taken a break. I do agree. Um, uh, uh, commissioners, are, are we ready to make a motion or should we take a five minute break? I'm okay with making a motion, uh, Chair Mondor. I think we uh, should make a motion and I just would hope that in the future, the residents are made aware of the planning commission's role. I say this a lot. Before the community lines up here, there's a step before the actual hearing and presentation. There's a misconnect somewhere because before the developer and owner of the project signs up to be heard. They are believing that the community is in agreement. Then we get here and it's almost quarter to eight. I'm not comfortable this evening voting just to be transparent when we have so many people that are saying that their requests still aren't met. And while the commission has to focus on technicalities in development, we still have a moral and ethical commitment to the community to hear them. And it's kind of hard to just forget about everything we've heard. If I guess we can vote with conditions and then what are they? You know, what exactly after all these hours, I, I need a quick review on what we're actually voting on this evening. Okay, commissioners, um, you, thank you for that, Commissioner Blackwell. Um, assuming we do bring forward a motion to uh, approve the following five conditions are already um, stated in our reports. The first three are standard about stormwater management plans, transportation impact study, and final construction plans. The last one is um, dealing with a right-of-way dedication is another technical requirement. The fifth one seeks to remedy the fact that the PLDP um, still uh, has Wiley in it and that that uh, amendment to the PLDP will address the removal of Wiley um, 
whenever the next FLDP plan comes forward or and is required within two years for commencement of the open space on block F. So that is in our report. I would propose we add a following condition that um, each application be accompanied by a um, dashboard um, reporting back on the uh, terms that have been agreed to to date and also reporting on any additional betterment of their or progress or betterments all relative progress on terms uh, on on other terms that have been discussed between the community and the um, development team um, are there other are there other conditions um, Commissioner Mingo oh, Commissioner Dick yeah I, I would just want to put, put uh, in your last uh, statement there, uh, in the last, uh, I'd put a, a progress towards a consensus among the um, developers and the mem and the residents of the Hill District. I think we need to be working toward, they need to be working towards a consensus. You're never going to get everybody to approve everything, as it has been, so, has been said so many times tonight, but we can work at, 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 evolve into a working consensus. And I think that's a key word there. Okay, thank you. Chair Wander, I'm prepared to, to make a motion, but I uh, will make a statement based on um, Commissioner Dick's uh, consensus, which is what makes me feel uh, really good about um, knowing that um, Councilman Lavelle, this is home for him. Um, he's invested and one of his parting uh, parts of the statement was you know, hold me to it, you know, hold me to the fire. So you know, I think that we have to be careful about the word consensus. I'm, you know, not going to argue it, but I am simply going to say we need to be careful with that. Um, and if there, if there is nothing else, I'd like to make a motion, uh, which is that the um, commission approve the final land development plan and with the conditions as stated and with the addition of Chair Mondor's uh, condition. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Let me do a um, roll call. I have since lost my list, so let me, let me create this. Um, goodness, I have too many people in my screen. Oh. You define my list, so just give me a minute here. You've got this. <laughs> I don't trust my brain at this point. Okay, Commissioner Askey. Aye. Commissioner Blackwell. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Commissioner Dietrich had to leave the meeting. Uh, Commissioner Dick. Aye. Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Mondor, I, Commissioner O'Neill, uh, had to leave the meeting. Okay, thank you. This ends this part of the meeting. We still have plan of lots. Commissioners, can we take a five minute break and come back and hit it? Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming out and testifying in. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. And all of us left the meeting.
All right, commissioners, come on back in. Let's put this evening to bed here. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Shepke, can we batch these? We have three major applications, which are at the end of the agenda. So you can batch the first 12 and then batch the last three. Let me get my agenda back. Uh, commissioners, I will read through the first 12, I believe it'll 12. Uh, I'm going to do this really quickly to the court reporter. This is all listed on the agenda. So please uh, don't try to do it from my text. Uh, plan of lots, we're on item D. Thank you. Number one is DCP lot 2021 00658153 Carver, minor consolidation, Larmer. Item two is DCP lot 2021 00659, address 144 Meadow, minor consolidation, Larmer. Uh, number three, DCP lot 2021 00595, address 1926 Jane Street, minor consolidation, Southside Flats. Item four is DCP lot 2021 00601. 4526 Parnell Street, Minor Consolidation, Hazelwood. Item five is DCP lot 2021 00478, Louder Street, Minor Consolidation, Lincoln Place. Item six is DCP lot 2021 00655, address 3107 Brereton Street, Minor Subdivision, Polish Hill. Item seven is DCP lot 2021 00654, Dagmar Avenue, Minor Consolidation, Beachview. Item eight is DCP lot 2021-00528, address 4750 Liberty Avenue, minor consolidation Bloomfield. Item nine is DCP lot 2021-00613, address 1101 Shady Avenue, minor consolidation Point Breeze. Item 10 is DCP lot 2021-00530, address 414 Jacksonia, minor consolidation Central North Side. Item 11, is DCP lot 2021-00481, Boggs Avenue lot line revision, Mount Washington. And item 12 is DCP lot 2021-00630, Atlantic Avenue, minor consolidation. Okay, let's take it, Mr. Shepke. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the 153 Carver Street consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 49 feet of frontage on Carver Street and would be 4,900 4, square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 153 Carver Street consolidation. The next item is the 144 Meadow Street consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The proposed lot would have 50 feet of frontage on Meadow Street and would be 5,066 square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and the recommended motion is to approve the 144 Meadow Street consolidation. The next item is the 1926 Jane Street consolidation. This is a consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 20 feet of frontage on Jane Street and would be 2,400 square feet in area. One house is located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 1926 Jane Street oh, uh, consolidation. The next item is the Parnell Street consolidation. This is the consolidation of eight parcels into five parcels. The proposed lot A would have 50 feet of frontage on Parnell Street, it would be 3,625 square feet in area. The proposed lot B would have 50 feet of frontage on Gladstone Street, it would be 3,625 square feet in area. The proposed lot C would have 48 feet of frontage on Parnell Street and 130 feet of frontage on Gladstone Street would be 13,550 square feet in area. The proposed lot D would have 82 feet of frontage on Parnell Street and would be 5,273 square feet in area. The proposed lot E would have 84 feet of frontage on Parnell Street and would be 12,150 square feet in area. Three houses are located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the Parnell Street consolidation. 
The next uh, item is the Lauder Street consolidation. This is the consolidation of 11 parcels into one parcel. The proposed lot would have 280 feet of frontage on Lauder Street. It would be 32,518 square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the Lauder Street consolidation. The next item is the 3107 Brereton uh, subdivision. The proposed lot one would have 18 feet of frontage on Brereton Street and would be 775 square feet in area. Lot two would have 20 feet of frontage on Brereton Street and would be 840 square feet in area. Lot three would have 20 feet of frontage on Brereton Street and would be 1,093 square feet in area. Lot four would have 18 feet of frontage on Brereton Street and would be 1,093 square feet in area. Lot five would have 21 feet of frontage on Dobson Street and would be 665 square feet in area. Lot six would have 23 feet of frontage on Dobson Street, would be 937 square feet in area. Lot seven would have 23 feet of frontage on Dobson Street, would be 932 square feet in area. Lot eight would have 20 feet of frontage on Dobson Street, would be 915 square feet in area. Two houses are located on the subject property, which are to be, to be demolished. And the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 3107 Brereton subdivision. The next item is the Dagmar Street Consolidation. This is the consolidation of three parcels into two parcels. Lot one would have 60 feet of frontage on Dagmar Avenue and would be 8,269 square feet in area. Lot two would have 90 feet of frontage on Dagmar Avenue and would be 28,942 square feet in area. Two houses are located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the Dagmar Avenue Consolidation. The next item is the 4750 Liberty Avenue consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The new lot would have 40 feet of frontage on Liberty Avenue. It would be 3,161 square feet in area. Two commercial structures are located on the subject property. And the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 4750 Liberty Avenue consolidation. The next item is the 1101 Shady Avenue consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The new lot would have 130 feet of frontage on Shady Avenue and would be 30,994 square feet in area. A house is located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 1101 Shady Avenue consolidation. The next uh, item is the 414 Jacksonia Street consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 42 feet of frontage on Jacksonia Street and would be 3,780 square feet in area. A house is located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 414 Jacksonia Street consolidation. The next item is the Boggs Avenue lot line revision. This is a lot line revision involving two parcels. The revised lot one would have 25 feet of frontage on Boggs Avenue and would be 1,850 square feet in area. The revised lot two would have 25 feet of frontage on Boggs Avenue and would be 7,741 square feet in area. No new parcels are created in this plan and a house is located on the subject property. Staff's recommended motion is to approve the Boggs Avenue lot line revision. And the next item is the Atlantic Avenue Consolidation, this is the consolidation of five parcels into one parcel. The proposed lot would have 110 feet of frontage on Atlantic Avenue, 225 feet of frontage on Rosetta Street, it would be 24,605 square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the Atlantic uh, Avenue consolidation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, as there are still attendees in the room, is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to projects or to items uh, one through 12? Oh, oh no, that one muted. No hands are raised at this time. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments from the commission? Yeah. Okay. I, I move that we approve all these uh, lot consolidations, et cetera. And I'll second. Second, thank you. Okay, roll call, Commissioner Askey. Aye. Blackwell. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Dick. Aye. Domingo. Aye. 
Mondor I. Okay, thank you. That takes us to item. So we'll do each of the last three separately. Item 13 is DCP lot 2021 00522 Railroad Street, Major Subdivision 1, Strip District. Mr. Shebke. Uh, this is the proposed subdivision of seven parcels into nine parcels. Lot 1A would have 37 feet of frontage on a private road. It would be 38,200 square feet in area. Uh, unit 1A would be 276 square feet in area. Lot 1B would have 287 feet of frontage on a private road. It would be 43,847 square feet in area. Proposed unit 1BC would be 641 square feet in area. Proposed lot 1C would have 167 feet of frontage on 29th Street. It would be 32,166 square feet in area. Lot 2 would have 218 feet of frontage on Railroad Street. It would be 55,243 square feet in area. Lot 3 would have 270 feet of frontage on Railroad Street, 254 feet of frontage on 29th Street, and would be 68,478 square feet in area. Lot four would have six feet of frontage on Railroad Street. It would be 1,591 square feet in area. Lot five would have 37 feet of frontage on Railroad Street, 37 feet of frontage on 29th Street. It would be 28,806 square feet in area. Uh, the subject property is currently vacant and the recommended motion is to uh, preliminarily approve uh, the Railroad Street subdivision and schedule final re review on May 18th, 2021. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to- All the audio now unmuted. Hearing none- All hands are raised at this time. Thank you. Hearing none, are there questions or comments from the commission? None. Thank you, Dr. A motion to approve with the terms as stated in our condition. Recommended approval, excuse me. Um, so moved. Okay, second. Thank you. Okay, roll call. Is Commissioner Askey? Aye. Blackwell? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Bert Falk? Aye. Dick? Aye. Domingo? Aye. Commander, aye. Okay, thank you. We go to tomorrow. Item 14, DCP lot 2021 00550 Almond Street, major mm -hmm. lot line revision, one strip. We're going to have to um, get the, uh, the um, hex wrench mm -hmm. and loosen that up so it can fit on there. Yeah, make sure that's the right one. Commissioner Brown, you might want to mute yourself there. Okay, Mr. Shepke, sure. no problem. Uh, this is the 1615 Smallman Street lot line revision. It's a lot line revision involving one parcel. The lot would have 804 feet of frontage on Smallman Street and would be 320,740 square feet in area. Uh, this is the location of the produce terminal. The staff's recommended motion is to uh, preliminarily approve the 1615 Smallman Street lot line revision and schedule final review on May 18th, 2021. Hey, thank you. Are there any, is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to this application? Oh, the audio now unmuted. No hands are raised at this time. Thank you. Hearing none, do I have a motion or are there any questions or comments from the commission? Move that we approve. Second. <laughs> Second. Okay, I go through. Commissioner Askey. Aye. Blackwell. Aye. Brown. Aye. Aye. Dick. Aye. Domingo. Aye. Commodore, aye. Last one, guys, on item 15, DCP lot 2021-00660, Matthews Avenue, major, major consolidation, Knoxville, Mr. Shepke. This is the last item on plan of lots. It's for the Matthews Avenue consolidation. This is the consolidation of five parcels into two parcels. Lot one would have 325 feet of frontage on Bossman Street would be 25,200 square feet in area. Lot two would have 252 feet of frontage on Matthews Avenue and would be 32,500 square feet in area. A house is located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to preliminarily approve the Matthews Avenue consolidation and schedule final review on May 18th, 2021. Thank you. At this time, is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to this project? 
No hands are raised at this time. Any questions or comments from the commission? None. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Okay, roll call, Commissioner Askey. Aye. Blackwell. Aye. Brown. Aye. Falk. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Holly. Mingo. Aye. Mondor, aye. Okay, that takes us through the end of Plan of Lots. Commissioners, I, I hope there isn't a director's report. Uh, and, no, a number of things to talk about. I think we'll have a director's report in two Thank weeks. Um, but, you know, just, yeah, I mean, through, I mean, we had, uh, you know, a large tough item today. I think, you know, we can close out here, uh, you know, thanks to all the direction that commissioners and commission leadership that you gave us both in the briefing and, and between, uh, you know, to, to be able to help us get all the information to you uh, to be able to make a decision. Okay. Commissioners, thank you so much for showing up with all of your heart and your mind because this was a hard one and there will be others in the future. And I really appreciate you all being here. Well, thank you for your leadership on it though too. We definitely appreciate your leadership, Chair Mondor and staff. You are yes, great. Staff. Thank you. All yes, right, you. guys, have a great evening. Go have dinner. Oh wait, wait, wait. do I have a motion to adjourn? Bye. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you, Commissioner. Has left the meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Christine Mockler has left the meeting. All cue camera at meeting.